Wow, that really wasn't long at that all. Was that okay. wasn't long. That was probably on. less than a minute, I think yeah. you did that in. Uh, we are out before you've got 15, got 15 16 people. people already watching. Oh, yeah. 11 thumbs up. It was that 60 before. Is... Keep Good. thumbing it up, by the way. If you get on here, thumb it up because it really helps the YouTube algorithm. Just to let you know, I know a lot of this will be people dipping in and out of the video, but in terms of playbacks, the number of time that our last stream was played was 3,675 times that video was clicked. That's insane. That is a lot of clicks. That is absolutely, uh, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's doing well, isn't it? It is I might have well. a look at how we're doing for, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Fantastic indeed. Right, we have a video here from Miss Lee. I am going to play that now, and then we'll watch Mr. Davis, uh, Mrs. Davis's, sorry, Mrs. Davis's video um, before I read a couple of stories as well. Uh, then we'll have a suspense lesson, which will culminate in Mr. Jordan taking you around the spooky dark school and Same. coming up with some descriptions. Be warned. Be warned. That is going to be a scary lesson designed mainly for year five and six. And there might be some jump scares. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Keeling and Mr. Jordan. You are doing a fantastic job in your teacher's arm. I'm so proud of you. And I hope, children, that you've had a lovely day following all the lessons and the activities. But now it's ready to calm down, get ready for bed, and I am going to read a bedtime story. So, Misha Makes Friends by Tom Percival. Are you ready? Are you cozy and comfy? Okay. Misha loved making things. She could make pictures out of numbers and pictures out of sounds. Sometimes she made pictures out of both. But there was one thing that Misha found hard to make. Friends. Everybody else seemed to find it easy, but not Misha. When she tried, she didn't know what to do what to say or when to say it. For Misha, making friends was so difficult that she wondered if she would ever be able to do it. Then, one evening, Misha had an idea. She got out her paints, her pencils and all of her other tools. Then she started to cut and stick and glue and sew. Soon, she had made a whole group of really funny friends. Friends that were easy to be around. Friends that she could take with her wherever she went. Admittedly, Misha's new friends weren't that very good at tennis, or football, or catch. But Misha felt comfortable with them, and that was what mattered. One day, Misha's mum said they were going to a party. She said there would be lots of nice people there. She said it would be fun. Misha wasn't sure. The party was noisy, chaotic and unpredictable. Everyone else was playing together and Misha just couldn't find a way to join in. She ran off to find a quiet corner where she could make her own friends. Misha sat happily for a while until she realised that something didn't feel right. A boy was watching her. Huh, um, I'm Josh. Can I see what you're making? For a while, Misha said nothing. But then she took a deep breath and showed him her friends. Wow, gasped Josh. They're amazing. Can you show me how to make one? Misha was worried. What if he got it wrong? What if he spoiled everything? But Josh didn't look like he would try to spoil things. So Misha showed him what to do. And do you know what? Josh didn't get it all wrong, and he didn't spoil anything either. In fact, now that she was making things with someone else, it was even better. Soon, Misha and Josh had built a whole time for their friends to live in together. Let's go and show the others, said Josh. Misha wasn't sure, but Josh, Josh's smile made her feel that it was all be okay. And it was. For the first time ever, Misha knew exactly what to say and exactly what to do. And that was how the friends that Misha made helped Misha make friends. 
I hope you liked that story. It's one of my favourites. So, it's time for bed now. I hope you've had a lovely day and we will see you all tomorrow. Good night, children. Good night, Mr. Keane. Good night, Mr. Jordan. And good night, Miss Lee. Oh, it's going on to beautiful piano music. One second. <clears throat> Let's stop that. Not that I don't like beautiful piano music. Beautiful piano music is wonderful. In fact, it's my favourite instrument, the piano. Uh, we are going to have another story, this time from Mrs. Davis. Thank you again, Mrs. Lee. That was a lovely story uh, for the children. Um, Mrs. Davis, and then I will read a story, and then we will get into that suspense lesson. So let's get up Mrs. Davis's tale. Mrs. Davis has a tale. No, Mr. Jordan. Oh, by the way, yes. just before I do, just yes. before I do, I'll get the just whoa, I do. The brightness goes all weird. Whoa, whoa, just before I do. Yeah, go on. We're over halfway, sir. No way, it's the halfway. I actually have something to celebrate the halfway point. You have something to celebrate the halfway point. <laughs> you can tell it's halfway. I've got to to celebrate. Right, are you ready? Uh, Three, two. Wait, it's not going to work, but this is it. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Now we can see the light. Right. Three, two, two one. Ah, oh, did it? <laughs> there it is. There it is. Ah, oh, look at that. It went all over you. Look at that. There we go. Celebrating. Woo! It's not that. Halfway! <laughs> Halfway! Halfway, yes. Wow. Quite. Okay. All right. Well, All right. So do you think it's time for our karaoke session then, sir? Oh, is that what we're doing? Is that the halfway point? Is that the halfway point? Crack it up. Oh, well, we can't really do that because of copyright issues. No. But we could sing it without the music. Yeah, so. we could sing it without the music. But I don't, what, what are we going to sing? I don't know. What do you want to sing? Uh, oh, is it Britney Spears? A bit of Britney Spears? No, I don't think I want that. What's the... You know what? I just don't think we're ready for it. I don't yet. think we're ready. I don't we'll, think we're ready. We'll prepare it and do that later. later. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Beatles song. Yeah, a Beatles song. What about good. that Oasis song you like? Oh, I do like that Oasis song. Yeah. yeah. I'm a bit worried about copyright stuff, and I think we should be a little bit careful with that, unfortunately. Yes. Hey, I can see 43 of you are on. Uh, it'd be really nice if we could have 43 thumbs up, uh, not because I need them for my gratification, but just because it helps with the YouTube algorithm. So if you can see where the thumbs up button is down at the bottom and you haven't pressed it, please do press it. It just helps to push the, the video up the list, um, YouTube statistics and all of that stuff being Plus you boring. really like them for your gratification. Oh you? gosh, I mean, I need thumbs up. <laughs> Who doesn't want thumbs up? What are we getting now then? Mrs. Davis is doing a story. Yes, I'm Mrs. very Davis excited about this. I'm just going to hold next. this over here because it gets really dark unless I do that. Um, do you know what Mrs. Davis is going to be doing a story about? I think it's something about crayons, sir. I love crayons. Very exciting. Although that is brand product placement, but <laughs> all right, here we go. Oh yes. Hello children, it's Mrs. Davies. I've just popped along to wish Mr. Jordan and Mr. Keeling the best of luck today in this fantastic event that they're running. And I'm just gonna read a little story to you guys whilst they probably nip for a cup of tea or something. Okay, so here we go. It's the day the crayons quit. And I'm sure a few of you have been looking at this lately with some writing that we've been doing online. Okay, here we go. One day in class, Duncan went to take out his crayons and found a stack of letters with his name on them. Here's the letter. Hey Duncan, it's me, Red Crayon. We need to talk. You made me work harder than any of the other crayons. All year long I wear myself out, colouring fire engines, apples, strawberries, and everything else that's red. I even have to work on holidays. I have to colour all the Santas at Christmas and all the hearts on Valentine's Day. I need a rest. Your overworked friend, Red Crane. Another letter. Dear Duncan, 
All right, listen. I love that I'm your favourite crayon for grapes, dragons and wizards' hats, but it makes me crazy that so much of my gorgeous colour goes outside the lines. If you don't start colouring inside the lines soon, I'm going to completely lose it. Your very neat friend, Purple Crayon. Oh dear, that's not going well. Oh, another letter. Dear Duncan, I'm tired of being called light brown or dark tan because I am neither. I am beige and I am proud. I'm also tired of being second place to Mr. Brown Crayon. It's not fair that Brown gets all the bears, ponies, and puppies, while the only other things I get are turkey dinners if I'm lucky, and wheat. And uh, let's be honest, when was the last time you saw a kid excited about colouring wheat? Your beige friend, beige crayon. It's oh, another letter. Duncan, grey crayon here. You're killing me. I know you love elephants. And I know that elephants are grey, but that's a lot of space to colour them on myself. And don't even get me started on your rhinos, hippos and humpback whales. You know how tired I am after having one of those things. Such big animals. Baby penguins are grey, you know. So are very tiny grey rocks. Pebbles. How about one of those once in a while to give me a break? Your very tired friend, Grey Crayon. And another letter. <gasps> Dear, what can you see? There's the picture, white cat in the snow. Oh, not a very exciting picture. Dear Duncan, you colour with me, but why? Most of the time, I'm the same colour as the page you are using me on, white. If I didn't have a black outline, you wouldn't even know I was there. I'm not even in the rainbow. I'm only used to colour in snow or to fill in empty space between other things. And it leaves me feeling, well, empty. We need to talk. Your empty friend, white crayon. Here's our next one. Hi Duncan. I hate being used to draw the outline of things. Things that are coloured in by other colours. All of which they think they're brighter than me. It's not fair. When you like me to draw a nice beach ball and then fill in all the colours of the ball with all the other crayons. How about a black beach ball sometime? Is that too much to ask? Your friend, Black Crayon. Oh, I wonder which colour this is. Dear Duncan, as Green Crayon, I am writing for two reasons. One is to say that I like my work. Loads of crocodiles, trees, dinosaurs and frogs. I have no problems and wish to congratulate you on a very successful colouring for things green career so far. The second reason I write is for my friends Yellow Crayon and Orange Crayon, who are no longer speaking to each other. Both crayons feel they should be the colour of the sun. Please settle this soon because they're driving the rest of us crazy. Your happy friend, Green Crayon. Ooh, well, at least it's one happy crayon. Well, here we go. Next one. Dear Duncan, Yellow Crayon here. I need you to tell Orange Crayon that I am the colour of the sun. I would tell him, but we are no longer speaking, and I can prove I'm the colour of the sun too. Last Tuesday, you used me to colour in the sun in your Happy Farm colouring book. In case you've forgotten, it's on page seven. You can't miss me. I'm shining down brilliantly on a field of yellow corn. Your pal, and the true colour of the sun, yellow crayon. Next one. Dear Duncan, 
I see yellow crayon already talked to you, the big whiner. Anyway, could you please tell Mr. Tittle Tattle that he is not the colour of the sun? I would, but we're no longer speaking. We both know I am clearly the colour of the sun because on Thursday you used me to colour the sun in on both the Monkey Island and Meet the Zookeeper pages in your Day at the Zoo colouring book. Orange, you glad I'm here, ha! Your pal and the real colour of the sun, orange crayon. Is our next colour? Wonder what it is. Dear Duncan, it has been great being your favourite colour this past year and the year before. And the year before that, I have really enjoyed all those oceans, lakes, rivers, raindrops, rain clouds and clear skies. But the bad news is that I am so short and stubby I can't even see over the railing in the crayon box anymore. I need a break. Your very stubby friend, Blue Crayon. Here's pink. Duncan. Okay. Listen here, kid. You have not used me once in the past year. It's because you think I'm a girl's colour, isn't it? Speaking of which, please tell your little sister I said thank you for using me to colour in her pretty princess colouring book. I think she did a fabulous job of staying inside the lines. Now, back to us. Could you please use me sometime to colour the occasional pink dinosaur or monster or cowboy? Goodness knows they could use a splash of colour. Your unused friend, Pink Crayon. There's another one. Hey Duncan, it's me, Peach Crayon. What did you peel off my paper wrapping for? Now I'm naked and too embarrassed to leave the crayon box. I don't even have any underwear. How would you like to go to school naked? I need some clothes. Help. Your naked friend, Peach Crayon. Wow, poor Duncan just wanted to colour. And of course, he wanted his friends to be happy. And that gave him an idea. Look at that, beautifully colourful. When Duncan showed his teacher his new picture, she gave him a good work sticker for colouring. And a gold star for creativity. Well done, Duncan. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that little story. And I will hand you back now to Mr. Jordan and Mr. Keenan. Bye. Well, hey. That's oh, us. That's that us. us. Mr. Sean and Mr. Keenan. We're famous. <laughs> we okay. are. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Right. Well, I'm going to go on to reading you a story now. So I'm going to take you I'm with me. Uh, I think we have. You might want to just double check the I'm folder, check. make sure there's nobody else. But I am going to go into my reading now. Um, I've chosen a couple of little, little short, nice stories. Ones that I enjoyed reading to year two. And actually, one of these stories, one of these stories was around when I was a kid. Um, I think I'm going to read this one first. You'll know, you'll probably know some of this person's work. It's Julia Donaldson, uh, responsible for writing things like The Gruffalo, uh, Room on the Broom, and this one, uh, Tyrannosaurus Drip. So let's have a little read. <clears throat> In a swamp beside a river where the land was thick with veg lived a herd of duckbill dinosaurs who roamed around the water's edge. Now you'll notice just from those first two lines, they rhyme. So this is like one big poem. In fact, all of nearly all of Julia Donaldson's books have rhymes in them. So if you are working on poetry, if you are working to send in some poetry, especially around rhymes, it might be good whilst listening to this story to collect a word bank 
of rhymes. There we had veg and we had edge. Let's keep going. And they hooted up with rivers and they hooted up with reeds and they hooted up with bellyfuls of juicy water weeds. Now across, across the rushy river, on a hill the other side, lived a mean Tyrannosaurus with his grim and grisly bride. And they shouted, up with hunting! And they shouted, up with war! And they shouted, up with bellyfuls of duck-bill dinosaurs! But the two Tyrannosauruses, so grisly, mean, and grim, couldn't catch the duckbill dinosaurs because they couldn't swim. And they muttered, down with water. And they muttered, down with wet. And they muttered, what a shame that bridges aren't invented yet. Now, a little compsognathus, if I pronounce that right. Wow, that is a hard word for a children's book. But for short, we'll call her comp. <laughs> Found a duckbill egg and stole it from a nest beside the swamp. And she swam with it and ran with it and murmured, clever me. And won't the baby comps be thrilled with duckbill egg for? Uh oh. Oh no. Tee! She dropped the egg in terror and went running for her life from the mean Tyrannosaurus and his grim and grisly wife. And the duck bill egg went rolling, and at last it came to rest. In, of all unlikely places, the Tyrannosaurus nest. Now the mother T had great big jaws and great enormous legs, but her brain was rather little and she couldn't count her eggs. And she sang, hatch out my terrors with your scaly little tails and your spiky little toothies and your scary Little nails. Out hatched babies one and two, as perfect as can be. But Mother T was horrified by baby number three. As she grumbled, he looks weedy. And she grumbled, he looks weak. And she grumbled, what long arms? And look, his mouth's a beak. He just needs feeding up, said Dad, and gave the babe some meat. The first two gulped and guzzled, but the third refused to eat. And he said, I'm really sorry. And he said, I simply can't. And he said, this meat looks horrible. I'd rather eat a plant. A plant, yelled mum in horror. And dad said, get a grip. His sisters found a name for him. Tyrannosaurus Drip. And they shouted, up with hunting! And they shouted, up with war! And they shouted, up with bellyfuls of duckbill dinosaur! Poor Tyrannosaurus Drip tried hard to sing along. But the others yelled, you silly Drip, you've got the words all wrong! For he hooted, down with hunting! 
and he hooted, down with war, and he hooted, down with bellyfuls of duckbill dinosaur. Drip's sisters soon grew big enough to hunt with dad and mum. But they turned on Drip and told him, you're not fierce enough to come. And he cried, they've gone without me. And he cried, a lack a day. And he cried, this doesn't feel like home. I'm going to run away. So off he ran to the river where he saw a lovely sight, a herd of duckbill dinosaurs all hooting with delight. And they hooted up with rivers and they hooted up with reeds and they hooted up with bellyfuls of juicy water weeds. As he stood there on the bank, a sudden urge took hold of him. And he jumped into the water and discovered he could swim. And the duckbills came to greet him by the rushy river's edge. And they hooted, nice to see you. And they hooted, have some veg. And Drip, who was delighted that they hadn't run away, ate bellyfuls of water weeds and played with them all day. Then he gazed into the river and he asked them, who, oh, who is that creature in the water? And they laughed and said, it's you. That night, the lightning crackled and a storm blew down a tree and it fell across the river. And the T's cried out, yippee, and they shouted, up with hunting, and they shouted, up with war, and they shouted, up with bellyfuls of duckbill dinosaur. Drip's sisters stepped onto the bridge, but then began to frown. For there in front of them stood Drip, who yelled, Look out! Look down! And they looked into the water, and they each let out a yelp. And one cried, Water monsters! And the other one cried, Help! Their mother scolded, Nonsense! And she joined them on a tree. Then she looked into the water and exclaimed, goodness gracious me. The three of them stood trembling and dad said, get a grip. You're all of you as drippy as Tyrannosaurus drip. He strode onto the bridge and scoffed. I bet there's nothing there. Then he looked into the water and he jumped into the air. And how the duckbells hooted when he landed with a crash and the tree bridge broke and four Tyrannosauruses went splash. And spluttering and clinging to the branches of the tree they went whooshing down a waterfall and all the way to sea. And the duckbills hooted happily. They hooted hip, hip, hip. Hooray for the heroic one and only duckbill drip. The end. Now this next one, this next one, only a short one, 
But this is one that was read to me by one of my teachers when I was a kid. It's about, um, it's about sharing and kindness and how that might bring you happiness. It's called, you may have heard of it before, the rainbow fish. Let's have a look. A long way out in the deep blue sea, there lived a fish. Not just an ordinary fish, but the most beautiful fish in the entire ocean. His scales were every shade of blue and green, and purple with sparkling silver scales among them. There we can see the silver scales shining. We can see some more there of the rainbow fish. The other fish were amazed at his beauty. They called him Rainbow Fish. Come on, Rainbow Fish, they would call. Come on and play with us. But the Rainbow Fish would just glide past, proud and silent, letting his scales shimmer. One day, a little blue fish followed him after, and followed after him, sorry. Rainbow fish, he called. Wait for me. Please give me one of your shiny scales. They are so wonderful, and you have so many. You want me to give you one of my special scales? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Cried the rainbow fish. Get away from me! Shocked, the little blue fish swam away. He was so upset. He told all his friends what had happened. From then on, no one would have anything to do with the rainbow fish. They turned away when he swam by. What good were the dazzling, shimmering scales with no one to admire them? Now he was the loneliest fish in the entire ocean. One day, he poured out his troubles to the starfish. I really am beautiful. Why doesn't anybody like me? Hmm. I can't answer that for you, said the starfish. But if you go beyond the coral reef to a deep cave, you will find the wise octopus. Maybe she can help you. The rainbow fish found the cave. It was very dark inside and he couldn't see anything. Then suddenly two eyes caught him in their glare and the octopus emerged from the darkness. A great word, emerged. I've been waiting for you said the octopus with a deep voice. The waves have told me your story. This is my advice. Give a glittering scale to each of the other fish. You will no longer be the most beautiful fish in the sea, but you will discover how to be happy. Can't, the rainbow fish started to say, but the octopus had already disappeared into a dark cloud of ink. Give away my scales, my beautiful shining scales. Never. 
How could I ever be happy without them? Suddenly, he felt the light touch of a fin. The little blue fish was back. Rainbow fish, please don't be angry. I just want one little scale. The rainbow fish wavered. Hmm. Only one very small shimmery scale, he thought. Well, maybe I won't miss just one. Carefully, the rainbow fish pulled out the smallest scale and gave it to the little fish. Thank you, thank you very much. The little blue fish bubbled playfully as he took the shiny scale in amongst his blue one. A rather peculiar feeling came over the rainbow fish. For a long time, he watched the little blue fish swim back and forth with his new scale glittering in the water. The little blue fish whizzed through the ocean with his scale flashing. So it didn't take long before the rainbow fish was surrounded by the other fish. Everyone wanted a glittering scale. The rainbow fish shared his scales left and right. And the more he gave away, the more delighted he became. When the water around him filled with glimmering scales, he at last felt at home among the other fish. Finally, the rainbow fish had only one shining scale. His most prized possessions had been given away. Yet, he was very happy. Come on, rainbow fish! They called. Come and play with us. Here I come, said the rainbow fish, and happy as a splash, he swam off to join his friends. The end. Hope you enjoyed those story, children. Mr. I Jordan, know. hello. I feel like you've been there for ages, and I need, I'm going to give you a break. What do you reckon? I don't know. What do you want to do, sir? I don't know. I just don't know, but I'm going to, I'm going to fill some time. Oh, okay. I've, I've spent all of that time on my phone looking at game reviews, so I haven't decided. Uh, we'll think of something. Go on. Fabulous. You have a break. Well, you have a break. Why don't I take over again at 10, sir, and we'll go across the spend last time. I love it. I love it. I feel you need a rest. I feel he needs a rest. But that means I'm going to have to think of something to do. And we're going to do, I'm going to jumble the old, uh, what are we going to do a Tron in the old brain box. We're going to do, should we do some history? We didn't quite get around to finishing World War I earlier on, although I think I, I think I pushed that for long enough, a whole hour and a half talking about the build-up to World War I, and then we only got to trenches, didn't we? I know what we can do. Bit of geography, what do you reckon? Let's do some geography. We haven't done geography. Well, we did do some geography earlier on. We looked at um, building islands, didn't we? We looked at the, uh, what else did we look at? I can't, I can't remember. We looked at continents. We looked at plates. We looked at how islands are formed. We looked at how mountains were formed. Well, I tell you what, let's do a little bit of art here. We can do a little bit of drawing with this. And, um, what we need for this is a piece of paper. Don't worry if you can't do it along with me now. Um, and we are going to track the route of a river, I think. Why not? That seems like it'll be that's something in it. Right. So we're going to, I'm going to, in my background, do you know what? Get a nice piece of paper for this. I need a pen. It's actually going to work for this. That would be quite a nice little idea, wouldn't it? What about this green pen over here? That looks nice. I've lost, I've lost a pen already, sir. I had another black pen somewhere I've here. Pen. I've lost a pen. We had oh, a... I love the only ones I brought, sir. I do believe I have two more in my pocket. We there we go. One of these can work nicely. So, this is going to be a bit of geography. I'm going to pop it up here. Geography. 
and for geography, we are going to be looking at rivers. And we're going to track the course of a river. Do you know what? I might intersect with some videos from the BBC. The BBC has so many fantastic resources. We are so lucky in this country to have an institution like the BBC, which provides not only fantastic radio and the OK television, but amazing online resources uh, and news all across the world. So rivers, geography. Where does the river begin? Well, this is a drawing that we can make. Do you know what? I'm even going to turn this into an A4 piece of paper so that I can so that you could replicate this at home and draw along. So there is my A4 piece of paper. And obviously, well, they begin, well, you know what? I often think they begin in the sky and, and some rivers obviously are benefiting from rainfall, but um, a lot of the source is not always all, all from rain. A lot of it, of course, is from rain. There are other sources. Oh gosh, the live chat's gone. I can't ask you, it doesn't matter. Um, the other sources are in fact the ground. Water is underneath us. If you were to dig down and down and down and keep going, eventually you would get to something called a water table. So this is why you'll have seen uh, around the place, just, you know, around the place, you'll probably have seen little wells uh, that have been built. Well, this was built by people a long time. And here they might have a little, uh, uh, a little top to the well like this. And in here they have a little pulley system with a rope and a bucket that goes down underground. And here's my person here holding onto the rope because it's dropping it down and underground, deep down, the well would go down, down, down to a point where there is actually water. So um, it's different points at different sort of heights, uh, depending on where you are, but there is water deep under the ground. And sometimes this water bubbles up to the ground. Where this bubble bubble, where this water bubbles up to the ground, it's called a spring. And these springs provide fresh water. The water down there is so clean, it's been filtered through uh, so much rock and it's wonderful and it's fresh. In fact, often when you buy bottled water, and by the way, buying bottled water is a really bad thing to do on the environment. We'll talk about that a little bit later um, when we talk about when we're going to do our whole climate change thing. Um, but uh, buying bottled water is bad. Uh, that's not what I was talking about. What was I talking about? Groundwater. Great, drink it. Um, so, often comes from a spring. I'm going to draw myself. Do you know what I'm going to have? I'm going to have a kind of a mountain range in the back of my drawing. I don't mind having a little bit of rain, could use a bit of color for that, because obviously rain, the, um, the warm air uh, it evaporates water up from the seas and things, and uh, I guess off trees and fields and all over the place, and that uh, uh, rain condenses up in the sky, and eventually when those rain droplets become heavy, it precipitates, precipitation, that's the word, isn't it? Does it precipitate the water? The rain precipitates, yeah. it precipitates downwards, big words, I'm not going to write them, I haven't got a clue how that's about. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to label a few things. This is going to be my valley. And valleys are often formed uh, thousands of years ago when there were glaciers across. Did you know Britain, in fact, uh, tens, not even tens, of, even around 10,000 years ago, it wasn't as long ago as you think, was completely covered in ice during the Ice Age. Um, during the Ice Age, when Britain was completely covered in ice, so this is the this actually is covered in ice at the moment. You can't see it on this globe, but the ice came all the way down to Britain, which is down here. So it's a really a really long way down. Britain would have been an icy place. Huge glaciers, which are thick, solid walls of water, would have filled these things like this. Imagine that was all there. And slowly it carves through and cuts into the uh, rock around it. Do you know what? I'm saying all this stuff. And I think one of the best things to do is for us to go and have a little look at what it looks like, what a glacier, whoopsie daisy, looks like, and what you might see. So I tell you what, just hang there one second whilst I just see if I can go and quickly find us a little video of a glacier, um, glacier. Movement, time lapse, here we go. 
Let's see, movement, iron labs. Oh my goodness, one's been made by the BBC. Absolutely ready for us. One question, yeah, skip. Although well, glacial ice is a solid, it actually flows like a river. It's incredible to think that this much ice is constantly on the move. I've been climbing up to see what drives the glacier. And it's the phenomenal weight of this enormous ice pack over nine kilometers long and up to 500 wow. meters deep. Did you hear Millions that? Nine of tons of ice. kilometers long, 500 meters deep. This is how many tons did you say? Let me just rewind that part because I was talking over the top of it because that sounds really interesting. Uh, oopsie daisy, oopsie daisy. Mouse on here is straight. Deep. Millions of tons of ice. Millions of tons of ice. The weight of this water, the water has frozen over thousands of years. It has become solid, big pack of ice. And she, as the lady was saying, this ice is not just sitting there, it is moving. Of course, gravity is pulling things downwards. Ice, believe it or not, seems like a solid, but uh, water molecules that are within the ice do actually move. So this ice is slowly moving, the weight and the force of it can literally crush rocks, can tear the sides of cliffs apart. Let's find out some more. Crammed into this valley. 270 meters a year, I mean, that's not a far. You walk way more than that uh, in a, just a small part of a day, 270 meters, but it is going slowly. And just think of the weight of it. Um, it just carves through anything, that kind of force. Absolutely amazing. When you're here, the only clues you see of the glacier's movement are crevasses, deep gashes that split open the surface of the ice. Ooh, deep gashes. These open up at the top of the ice. And one of the reasons is that at the top, the ice is brittle and tough. Further down where it's been squeezed, it's more plastic and soft. But as the glacier moves, the brittle part- Now when she says plastic, she doesn't mean it's actually made of plastic. Plastic, of course, is a material that we make from oil, uh, from the ground. So I'm actually gonna stop playing this video now because um, YouTube has given me a heads up. That, that is BBC content, and you can go and watch that at home, which would be really, really good. Um, but I'm gonna stop playing that. We'll get the gist of it now. So this ice, the heavy weight of it, it tears through the rocks, it rips things, part and that is what often forms these valleys that you'll see so i'm going to start with a valley um, and here we have got uh this is kind of our source i think up in the mountain we might have some small streams that start to um, trickle and form into one so i'm going to call these on my i can label this as we go along streams we may have at some point um, what did I call it? You might have a spring, which is where water is welling up from the ground. That could really be at any point along uh, the journey. Um, and just one second, I should run over here to grab this. Um, that could be happening at any point uh, along the journey. I need to make sure, because I don't have the live chat going, that um, the video wasn't destroyed by that. Um, no, it's still going, good. It's a bit naughty of me to use that copyright material. So. Um, what we need to do is, yeah, spring, and this top part here is also known as the source. Wow, look at all these S's, spring stream source. That alliteration poem that you did earlier on today was absolutely fantastic. So this is, of course, uh, the source of our river. I <laughs> don't know if this is a good piece of work, but we're doing it anyway. So, as the water comes together, we get these things up at the top, and you know what? They're wild up at the top. Now, I'm not going to use BBC now, but I'm going to try and use just some generic uh, material. And we're going to have a look at what it's like, the wild, because at the top of the river, we have these things called the rapids. And let me see if I can find some generic, uh, non-copyrighted uh, video of rapids, uh, river rapids, I'm going to put it, river Rapids, and we can have a look. Yeah, oh, I don't want that. Ah, sound of raging river. You know what, this is all right. We've got people going down some rapids here. I'm gonna turn, yeah, here we go. This looks pretty cool. 
So, Living in life, bitch. I'm going to turn the music off, if that's okay, because again, I don't want to be done for copyright. We can see that the, uh, the river is wild up at the top, okay? This is because often it's going to be shallower. Yeah, it's not started meandering. Now, this is not a, a great example of it, but let's have a look as we go into these parts of the river that are known as rapids. And we can see that at this point at the start of the river, we've got water that is smashing, that is crashing. I can see all around the outside here, these little bits of rock that have been smashed up and swirled up by the water eroding away at the rock underneath. And you can see that it's carved out. This is actually a valley that's not probably been, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm guessing it hasn't been carved by a glacier, but it's actually been carved by this river. It looks a bit like the Grand Canyon or something in America. Um, so this is the sort of early stages when the river is kind of quite wild and it is rapid, and those are the sort of things we get. We also have something else that turns early on, which are, of course, waterfalls. And because the water has come from a great height, there are suddenly drops. And should we have a look at some um, waterfalls? Oh, we don't want these clips. The world's most beautiful waterfalls. What about this? And we'll have a little look at some of these. We'll wait for this advert to pass. Three, two, one. I mean, look at how epic some of these waterfalls are. You can hear the raging sound. Um, now, not all waterfalls are amazing and beautiful. This looks potentially like uh, a waterfall in Africa. Is it Angel Falls? I think it's about No, Victoria Falls. It looks a bit to me like Victoria Falls. But you can see this is the point where water is at a higher level and it drops down. Now these waterfalls are actually massively eroding the ground. If you can imagine that force of water, we're gonna go and have a little look at what that looks like. I'm gonna pause this video. So as the water is rushing down through the upper part of the valleys, we've got these rapids and things. We also see these things look a bit like waterfalls as it sort of falls down to another level. So I'm gonna pop down here uh, waterfall, I might just squeeze in here, rapids, I'm labelling a lot of stuff here, I don't even know where these words are coming from my brain, I, last time I did geography like this, I can't remember. So we've got waterfalls gushing down over here. Now, the river in its later stages, well, it begins to spread out a bit and it does this funny thing here, doing a funny thing where it's bending around and this is known as a meander. So the river is beginning to meander. Think of it like a snake that is uh, bending <laughs> around. A yeah, snake, I don't know. It's meandering. Um, and it goes around like that. And then occasionally, um, the meander, I'm going to show you. Do you know what? We'll find a, an example of this as well. Um, just do some stuff. That's all I'm doing. There we go. We get these little things here. They are called oxbow lakes. What these are from is you can imagine that the water is being meandering, meandering, meandering. But if you're water, you always want to take the shortest route possible. And occasionally, this is going to cut away under there. And you see it cuts away and goes over there. And it cuts away a little bit more. And look, this meanders coming. And now when the water is coming through, let's draw this like this, you can see the water is pushing through and it keeps cutting away like this. And eventually it cuts all the way and it goes for the quickest route and it finds a new route through here. And then obviously over time, this bit is not getting the water and this bit becomes part of uh, the river like this. And this bit slowly kind of dries away and you're left with this little side bit known as the um, Oxbow Lake. I think it's called an Oxbow Lake. Anyway, should we go and see if we can find an example of an Oxbow Lake formation? Let's have a little look on YouTube if we can see an example of an Oxbow Lake formation. So, what have we got? Let's go and have a little look on here. Um, Oxbow Lake formation. Let's have a little look at that one. I wonder if we've got a video, and I'm not gonna, yeah, I can use, Watch an Oxbow Lake form. Oh my goodness, this is exactly what I want. 
I want to show you how. Oh, we're not going to listen to Jamie doing his lovely curry. curry. Oh, so much, Jamie, that's great. Okay, the meandering Yukani River. I'm going to turn the sound off again. So, this is in South America. Um, I can see from the map, you can't see it very well. It looks like it might be something in the Amazon River. And we can see it's meandering around now. Oh, look, the water whoosh, seems to be cutting through over here. And, oh, actually, over here is where it happened. And can you see that this is the place? You know what, let me go back because I was looking at the wrong part of the river. And my mouse is not, oh, we're going to see it now. There we go. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? That was fantastic. So it's cutting through here, it's trying to find the quickest route for it to go that is possible. Isn't this absolutely fantastic? And then look, eventually it's found the quickest route. It's sediment, it drops sediment just on the side over here. And then we're kind of left with this lake that has formed over here known as the Oxford Lake. And I guess eventually over time, that's gonna dry up. I can see this one here seems to be slowly drying up. But that's amazing. Have you ever seen the formation of an oxbow lake? Whoa! Wow. Had a transformation, guys. Okay, that was amazing. Just a little warning. We had a, a, a copyright infringement warning. Oh, did we? We were about to get taken off, but luckily uh, we stopped stuff in time. Naughty me. <laughs> right. Um, back to this. So, yeah, meandering as it slows down. You think of someone in their old age. In fact, it's pretty much like uh, age of a person, yeah? It starts small, it's excitable, it's fresh. And um, it then goes through this really rocky patch, which is the teenage years, okay? And it's ah, angst and blah, 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 and really annoying. And then <laughs> we get to, I mean, that's what they're like, isn't it? Then we get to this waterfall bit, that's the leaving home, the drop into something completely new, yeah? That can cause problems or it can go well. And then life goes on and there's sways and dances and it slows down, it meanders. Uh, you know, there might be a little breakup and you lose people, you know, Oxbow Lakes form and stuff. And then you get into your later years. And we get into this part down here called the Delta. Yeah? Right, I'm going to go for it anyway. We call this the Delta, I think. Who knows? Um, and this is where the water begins to kind of spread out. Um, and for go into the sea, I know that bit's called the sea. Um, and do you know what? There's a really good example of a delta. I'm going to bring us all the way back over here again because I've just thought about one a fantastic delta. It is uh, at the end of the longest. I'm going to turn this off. Is at the end of one of the longest. No, not one off. It is the end of the longest river in the world. The longest river in the world, of course, is the Nile. So let's go here to maps. We'll get Google Maps up. Oh, can't be breaking copyright infringement with this, can I? I think. I don't even know. We're going to go to satellite mode. Satellite. And I'm going to zoom out and out and out. There we are in Birmingham. Let's keep zooming out. We're going to get ourselves all the way out. There we are. There's Britain. Lovely, wonderful Britain. Moving. There is Europe. And I'm going to take us down to here. The end of the Nile. And you can see along the Nile's journey, it has meandered all over the place. Look at this. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Yeah, you can. This meandering of the river as it slows down. This river is a serious river. You can also see, because this is all desert, but just around the edge of the River Nile, the Nile offers so much fresh water that there is fantastic opportunities for farming and the land becomes green. And just down here at the very end, this is where the Nile enters the Mediterranean Sea. And look at the way that this river has just splayed out. It splays out at the bottom and it just spreads itself going out into the sea. And I tell you, this land here is so fertile. It's such fertile, rich, wonderful land for growing because that water on its whole journey has like knocked little bits of sediment and taken minerals from rocks and is, as it's wandered down and down and down to the end point that I'm calling the delta for now, or the mouth. Mouth sounds good as well, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm, Mr. Keeling's nodding away enthusiastically. He's very excited by all of this. Um, um, that great, that's great. That area, that area there is great. 
That's what I was saying. So there is a piece of art that you could do uh, where you want to. It's geography, it's rivers, it's got stuff in it. Starts from the source, rapids, waterfall. Use my age metaphor. I don't know what's happening here at the end as it spreads out. Oh, I guess that's your sort of late middle age spread, isn't it? You sort of balloon a little bit. And then off into the sea, I guess once you're in the sea, um, other great things are happening in your life. Um, right, that's a little bit of geography. And I have, uh, I was going to say, I was going to show you what happens as a waterfall goes. And as I can see, Mr. Keeling's still doing some stuff. Let's have a little look. I'm going to keep that one over here. I said to you, the waterfall, always moving, slowly moving backwards. And I wonder what that's all about. So we've got this kind of situation here. I'm just going to draw this, right? River is at the top. Here it is. Here is my river, and it is flowing. This is our early stage rapids, and here is my waterfall. And off, it's going to go towards its meandering. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that. As the water hits the ground down here, it swirls around and it cuts down like this. Okay, and you can imagine. But it's knocking little bits of rocks and things and it's smashing and it's hitting away at this and it knocks and it smashes and look it sort of goes underneath like that and eventually this erosion it smashes down another layer of rock and eventually all of this falls and it crumbles down and the waterfall falls back to a new position and it's ever so slowly as it smashes away and it crashes and it works its way back. It keeps knocking further and further back. So you can see there it's gone. And then suddenly my waterfall has moved even further back. So these waterfalls you see, they're not stuck in one spot. They're actually sort of slowly, much like the rest of the river, always changing the environment that they're in. Niagara Falls, of course, is really a famous waterfall on the Mississippi. Well, you can go and Google it. It is constantly moving. The force of that water smashing down and crashing into the rocks below is undermining uh, the ground that it is on. And slowly but surely, it keeps moving back. There you go. I'll do another one. It's knocking away. There it is, cracking away at it. And eventually, you can imagine that becomes too heavy. Boom, falls down. There we go. The waterfall keeps moving back, keeps moving back. Woo, 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 like that. There we go. Fantastic. All right, sir. How are we doing? All right, sir. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, yeah I'm ready. Now, Mr. Keeling has gone through somewhat of a transformation. Um, he's gone from a, uh, well, what looks 90s. like a, a what? 90s jumper. 90s jumper. What looked like a sensible teacher to what looks like a rather groovy disco man. Yeah, pretty groovy. I'm very excited to reveal this to all of you. So, shall I move? Are you going to just come and take over here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There he is. Look at Hello. that. Wow. It's like the groovy teacher. Whoa, that is, look that at all is that. groovy, isn't that it? That is amazing. That is what you call groovy. All right. Hello, everyone. Wow, we've still got 22 viewers. That is amazing. It's quite something. 10 o'clock at night. Right, we are going to be looking at suspense now, ready for Mr. Jordan's horror tour of the school. And to be honest, I have walked through that corridor now a few times without anyone in the school, with all the lights off. It's actually pretty terrifying, even as an adult. Right. <laughs> oh. Seems to be a chicken around. Uh, okay, we are looking at suspense. Uh, and I'm gonna take you over to the whiteboard for a moment um, because I wanna show you a resource that is really, really good for PowerPoints. Now, obviously, uh, PowerPoint itself is really good for making PowerPoints, uh, but this resource, is, is really good and you can get really creative with it. It's called Prezi. Um, it's free to access online and you can create your own PowerPoints. Really great for teachers, but also for students who want to present their work back 
It's a very good tool for creating different PowerPoints. This is one of the PowerPoints on Prezi. I didn't make this. I'm gonna take parts of this and go through parts of this and use it in my suspense lesson. But there are lots and lots of different presentations that you can access on Prezi uh, that have been made by teachers, regular people, uh, by uh, experts in their fields. Lots and lots of different people have made presentations. So if you want to learn about a certain topic, go to Prezi, type it in, see if you can find a PowerPoint about it. Uh, I've used this a couple of times before because I think it's a really good PowerPoint. It's not all going to work, though, today because the chat's gone. So I can't talk to, to, to you. Um, and some of it requires kind of feedback. So we'll go through. I'll talk about it a little bit. I might set you little tasks and just give you a minute or two or tell you to pause the video if you're going to watch later. Uh, but we'll just have a look at how it works. We'll use the Prezi tool. Then we're going to have a little look at a story that I have written. It's a Spence story. I'll read it out to you. But then I want you to look through it and see if you can spot some of the features of Suspense that I've used. We'll collect them together on the board over there. And then, Mr. Jordan, we'll take you around the school and we'll see if we can use some of those features in the different rooms, okay? So, let's have a look. Prezi, 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 fantastic. Writing a suspense story. I really like that about Prezi. It kind of goes zoom, 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 zooms all over the place. What is suspense? It's asking you to talk to your partner. Now here we would have the chat. But I'm just going to give you a quick 30 seconds. Just have a think. What is suspense? Have a little think. What is suspense? Maybe tell somebody who's in the room with you. Maybe tell your parents if you are watching this later. Or maybe just do jot it down. What do you think suspense is? Off you go, 20 seconds. Okay, let's take a look then. I don't know why I'm pressing the button on there, it's over here. Suspense is a technique that a writer uses to make the reader feel scared, anxious, excited, or desperate to know what happens next. It's fun to feel scared when you know it's all a story. That's why horror films exists. that uh, exist. That is why scary books exist. That's why scary games exist. Because it's fun. It's fun to be scared when you know you are safe. Yeah? A scary movie isn't really going to hurt you. I mean, you shouldn't be watching certain films if you're too young, but it's not going to hurt you. Nothing in a movie really can hurt you or a game or a scary book. It's not real. So it's fun to be scared by these things. And that is what suspense does. But it does it in a very specific way by building up. It doesn't immediately say, oh, there was a big scary monster. No. Suspense is more subtle. Suspense takes its time. It takes its time to scare you. Let's look a bit more. So, how do we create suspense in a piece of writing? I'm going to tell you a few things now, uh, and then I'm going to show you my story, and we're going to have a look to see if the features are in there. So here's the things that you need to create suspense. How to create suspense. You need to use short sentences to build up the tension. Why do you think short sentences build tension? Have a think about it. I'm going to tell you in 10 seconds, so have a think. What do you think? Why short sentences? Why do they build tension? Why do they build suspense? Well, if you have more short sentences, you have more full stops. And what do full stops do? Prizes. Full stops, what? No, that's pets win prizes. Is that Dale Winton? No, what do pets do? Prizes. Pets win prizes. No? no? Okay, never mind. What do full stops do? Prizes. <laughs> so it is 10 past 10 at night. <laughs> <laughs> what do full stops do? Well, not prizes. 
they make the reader stop. They make the reader pause. And if you can make a reader pause more, you slow them down. And if you slow them down, you are not revealing what the scary thing is. Therefore, you are building up the suspense. You are building up the tension. Okay. Number two. Use an ellipsis. This is the same thing. Just like using lots of full stops, an ellipsis comes at the end of an unfinished idea. You make the reader wait. And that's what tension is. It's all about making the reader wait, scaring them by making them wait. It's not about big, scary monsters. It's not about describing it as much as you can, the creature saying what it is. It's not about scary actions. That comes later. Suspense is where the real fear, the real terror, the real scares come. You take your time, you craft it, and you make the reader wait. Number three. Use a simile and metaphor to describe. Yes, I mean, that's good description. I wouldn't necessarily say that that is key. I wouldn't say that's key to the description. Uh, I would say something else, but we'll look at what I say later when we look at my story. But yes, metaphors, similes are always good. What's the difference between a metaphor and a simile? Do you remember? What is the difference between a metaphor? And a simile. A simile, you compare something. A metaphor, you say something is something. So, for example, if I was a really mean teacher, if I was really mean, you might use a simile for me. You might say, oh, he's as, he's as mean as a monster. He's as mean as a dragon. Yeah? You're using a metaphor, you would say he is a monster, he is a dragon. It does the same thing, basically. You're saying I'm mean, but you're just presenting it in a different way. So let's have a look at a little description using those features. Yes, 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 we've looked at that. Thank you, Prezi. The floorboards groaned like a menacing beast. His heart pounded, his hands shook, sweat poured. He could feel the eyes watching him from dark corners. Hoo -hoo -hoo. Spooky stuff. Let's see what's going on in there, shall we? One, simile. I kind of disagree. I don't think it needs a simile, but similes are great for description. Like a menacing beast. I mean, it certainly paints a picture, doesn't it, in the reader's head? And that's what you want to do. I think you can do it with adjectives and subtle description, though. Short sentences. His heart pounded, full stop. His hands shook, full stop. Sweat poured, full stop. Three words, three words, two words. Fantastic. Can you think of a two-word sentence? Right now, can you think of a two-word sentence? that you could put in a spooky story. Something like, he waited. Something moved. He looked. Nothing there. Yes, 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 gone over that. And let's see what we've got. What happens next? The ellipsis creates excitement. It also creates frustration. Excitement and frustration leading the person reading to want more, want to read more of your story. That is why we would use it. Okay. We're going to take a moment to consider this scene. Now you can do this at home. Uh, you can pause the video if you're not watching live. If you are watching live, just try and stay with the video for now. But if you're not watching live, you can pause the video here and you can have a go at this task. We're not gonna do this task. We're gonna look at my story and we're gonna do something else. But if you have got the time, if you are at home and you do want to do this, you can have a go at this task. So let's have a look. Take a moment to consider this scene. There's gonna be a scene, there's gonna be a picture. 
Uh, create a suspenseful, so, uh, you know, what we're looking at, tension, building that tension, and you've learned two to three features for that already, short sentences, uh, ellipsis to make the reader wait, and simile metaphor. Uh, use those uh, features to create a suspenseful paragraph with your table group. You don't have a table group because you're at home, but you can work with your family, you can work with brothers, sisters, parents, etc., or you can just try it on your own. Uh, using some of the techniques we have talked about so far. So there you are, short sentences, ellipses, simile, and metaphor. Okay, moving along then. Ooh -hoo -hoo. So this is your task. Look at that scene, spooky dark tree, and think, how can you create suspense for that? Now, you might not want to describe that tree per se, you could you could use those similes like we saw to say that you know the the uh, the, uh, the the branches were like claws reaching out at anybody who dared enter the forest. But I might think about what is hiding, what is hiding in those bushes, what is hiding behind those trees, what is in that thick fog in the distance. That is what I would describe. But it's up to you. It's up to you. You can do whatever you decide to do. But if you aren't watching live, you can pause the video and you can give that a go. If you are live, carry on. Follow along with me and let's see what's next. I don't really want to do that bit, so we will skip that one. Okay. Listen to... No, I don't want to do that either. But it's all good and you can access all of this stuff. Okay, you are going to listen to a piece of music. We will do this. You are going to listen to a piece of music. Try and create a suspenseful tale in your mind using everything you have learned. Uh, so we did skip over a few things, which I will go through now. I will talk about these skills that are on here, and then I will play you a short piece of music. Let me just check that the sound is all on. Yeah. No, sound is on, that's good. Okay, so let's go over a few things though. You're gonna to listen to this piece of music and just in your head, you don't have to write anything here. In fact, you can do it along if you are listening live. You are going to create a short suspenseful piece. What is going on? What scary thing is going on? Use short sentences like we've said. Um, use ellipsis, similes and metaphors if you like. Dark shadows, what is lurking, what is hidden, what strange sound was that? So that was a little bit like what I was saying about that tree picture. Don't talk about the tree, talk about what is hidden, what can't be seen, what is moving behind, that's scarier, yeah? If a monster jumped out and said, boo, I mean, in real life that would be terrifying, I would be running, mm -hmm. uh, but in a story, it wouldn't... <laughs> What is with the chicken? What is with the chicken? A monster? A monster? Yeah, that is a good film. You've got a point. You've got me there. <laughs> but in a story, if it just if it just said there was a monster, boo. That's scary. No one is it. So describe what is unseen, what is behind, what is in the shadows. Powerful verbs. I would say save the verbs. Save the verbs for the end. Because we want to change from slow build up to fast action right at the very end. So I'd say save those. Use all of your senses. Always, always a good thing. But again, senses can be used to describe so many things, not just, not just. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, let's let's have a pause. We'll pause. Mr. Jordan is just going to step in. We're going to say how much we are at so far in the donations. It's unbelievable. It's coming in thick and fast. We've literally just in the past, within the past hour, we've had over £130 extra being donated to us. One person very kindly giving £100. Wazim Safar, I know the local council has given more money as well. And it brings us up to... 3,000. 
That is amazing. Is where we are. We are so closing far. in on four thousand. Closing in on four thousand. I mean, I'm not putting my hopes. No, up for that. we won't get our hopes up. But that is just thought we'd give it up. That is amazing. That is amazing. Right, back to suspense, back to suspense. Did that back. add to the suspense? That did, yeah. You paused me. Well done. I wanted to know what's coming next. So we, uh, we can use all of our sensors, but we use that in, you know, a setting description. You use that in regular stories. It doesn't just have to be about tension. So yes, you can use your sensors. It could slow the reader down by saying what you smell, what you hear, by describing. Describing slows a reader down anyway. Action speeds them up. That's why when you watch action films, your heart's pumping, yeah? Because lots of things are happening at once. Same with the story, an action book. Lots of things happen, lots of very long action sentences. It makes the reader read quicker, gets that heart pounding. But we want to do it in a different way. We want to slow it down. So describing is important. Right, that's enough talking for me. Uh, from me for the moment. I'm going to play this piece of music. I want you to close your eyes if you're watching. Um, uh, later, you can maybe write something. I'd say no, maybe just make it in your head. But I am going to play the music, listen to it, and imagine what is happening in this scene. All right, let's have a listen. Truly terrifying stuff. But you can use stimuluses like that, like music, like pictures, things to get those creative ideas flowing. Uh, in fact, a name you might know, R.L. Stein, writer of the Goosebumps books. I once read uh, a piece that he created about teaching children, teaching children how to write horror stories because he's wrote hundreds of horror stories for children. And what he suggests is there are three places you get your high ideas for a horror story. One, you get it from the imagination. You completely make it up. So right at the back of your imagination, you just try and make things up. That's one. Two is you steal it. You take it from somebody else's book. You change it a bit, put your own ideas on it, but you steal it from another book. And, you know, we're, we all do that. All our ideas are kind of changed versions or metamorphosized versions of other people's ideas. That's fine, you know, as long as we build on those ideas, as long as we change them and make them our own, what's the, what's the problem with borrowing something that is good, you know, and, and making it better, or in some cases making it worse? Depends. Uh, so that's two. One, complete imagination. Two, you steal some. Or borrow, let's say borrow. You borrow it from another idea. The third place is you take it from your own experiences. So with horror, you would take something that scares yourself and you would flip it. You would use that to scare somebody else. Now for me, when I was a child, I, I lived with my grandparents and I used to sleep up in the I liked it. Cool. I just thought that was great. It is great. I'm sorry. It's all right. When I was a kid, uh, I lived with my grandparents and I used to sleep up in the attic bedroom. Now, um, at night, if I ever needed the bathroom, I would have to go down the stairs and along this shadowy, dark corridor. And at the end of the corridor was a cupboard. And in that cupboard was a mirror. 
in front of the mirror, there was a set of porcelain dolls. Oh, no. oh yeah? They are scary. They are scary. Yeah. And so every night when I would have to go to the bathroom, I would walk down the stairs, I would get onto the dark, shadowy hallway, I would hold my breath, and I would run past. I would run past the mirror, and I would run past the dolls. I would close the door of the bathroom, I would pull on the light, and I would be okay again. Then I would go back to the door, I would hold the light string, and I would walk out of the bathroom as far as I could get with that light still on. Then I would pull it, and then I would run back to the attic bedroom. Now, you scare me when I was a kid, but I can take that fear of my own, and I can flip it. I can take the fear of the mirror, and I can use it in a story, talking about a haunted or a spooky mirror where something moves in the mirror. Or I could take those dolls and make those spooky too, okay? So you are taking your fear and you are making it scary. So have a think about what you're afraid of. Some people are scared of spiders, great. You can take those, you can put eight legs crawling up somebody's arm, yeah? What else do you fear? Roller coasters, <laughs> maybe a haunted roller coaster. Uh, lots of things that people fear. Some people fear very strange things and you could put those strange fears into a story and show other people how scary they can be. Let's see what else is on this PowerPoint. Is there anything else? That was the music again. I think we're getting towards the end. Yeah, we are back to the beginning, writing a suspense story. Okay, we will move on then to my suspense story. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to show it to you. And I want you to think about what features have I used in my story. Okay. She knew there was something with her. The realization dawned that should she need it, help was very far away. Closing her useless eyes, she relied on her other senses. It was behind her. Beads of petrified sweat began to gather atop her brow and her body broke into an uncontrollable tremble. Catching the scent of putrid breath on the air, she struggled to maintain her composure. She didn't know what to do. Should she stand there silently and hope it wouldn't notice? Or should she run as fast as she could for the door? It moved. It was getting closer. Painfully, she bit down on her lip to prevent a scream from forcing its way out. The room was dark, too dark to see anything clearly, but the smell gave it away as old, rotten and fusty. She took a slow step forward. Creak! The floorboard betrayed her, squealing loudly to alert what lay in the darkness. Nothing happened. Just as she began to breathe a sigh of relief, there was a flash of bright light and a clicking noise. Surprise! Everyone shouted. Happy birthday! Little twist at the end there, but up until that point where I did deliver a little bit of action, um, it was, it was quite spooky. I mean, it could have been made spooky at the end if I'd done different noises and said, she was never seen again. Uh, so I could have made it a little bit more creepy at the end by doing that. But I thought, you know, lighten the mood, have a little surprise, have a little twist. Right, I'm going to read that again. This time, really listen out to features that I'm using. One, the features that I, use, uh, that I mentioned on this PowerPoint. But two, two, <laughs> Features that I've added that weren't on here. Second time, listen carefully. And then I will show it to you slowly. 
so you can have a look for yourself. She knew there was something with her. Think of my choice of language in that sentence. She knew there was something with her. The realization dawned that should she need it, help was very far away. Think about what I've done there. Closing her useless eyes, she relied on her other senses. It was behind her. What's that? It was behind her. Beads of petrified sweat began to gather atop her brow and her body broke into an uncontrollable tremble. Catching the scent of putrid breath on the air, she struggled to maintain her composure. She didn't know what to do. Should she stand there silently and hope it wouldn't notice? Or should she run as fast as she could for the door? What are those? Right there, what were those? It moved. It was getting closer. Painfully, she... Bit... That's creepy, isn't it? That is creepy. There's somebody knocking at the window. Wow, that is very creepy. <laughs> I'm gonna go around here. Okay, <laughs> that's terrifying. Uh, where were we? Catching the scent. No, 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 that wasn't it. Or should she run as fast as she could for the door? It moved. It was getting closer. Painfully, she bit down on her lip. Who was the terrifying visitor? That was terrifying. I am doing a lesson on suspense and I was reading a scary story. And then there was a knock at the window. <sighs> oh, oh, oh. It's Mr. Come and say hello. <laughs> After terrifying us, come and say hello. We will pick up this suspense lesson in a second. Oh. Hello, everybody. It's very late at night, but I've just bought the boys some oranges and Ooh. some drinks to keep them awake. Fabulous. Yes. That is so well done, boys. Exciting. Keep going. Thank you. And we were absolutely terrified. I mean, my heart is still a little Yeah, bit. I am still scared. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that mystery solved. I'm glad you sent me to go and build it. Though. Well, I was, I was live, sir. Tip for building suspense. If you really want to scare people, read a scary story, turn up in the middle of the night, knock on the window. Right, <laughs> let's, woo, let's carry on. Or should she run as fast as she could for the door? It moved. It was getting closer painfully. She bit down on her lip to prevent a scream from forcing its way out. The room was dark, too dark to see anything clearly, but the smell gave it away as old, rotten and fusty. She took a slow step forward. Creak! What's that? The floorboard betrayed her, squealing loudly to alert what lay in the darkness. Nothing happened. What's that? Just as she began to breathe a sigh of relief, there was a bright flash of light action. Oh, giving it away. And a clicking noise. Surprise, everyone shouted. Happy birthday. Let's go over here. Right. I'm going to give you a chance first to spot the features that I've used in this story. Let me just wipe. Oh, well, it's just suspense on the board. I'm going to quickly show you this. I'm going to give you a chance to read it, and I'm going to give you a little chance to kind of spot the things that I've done. I'm slowly going to lift it up. You just read, have a look, see if you spot any features in my story. Now, you can't chat to me right now. But just see if you can guess, before I say 
what the features are and then I'll go through it sentence by sentence and I'll talk about the features that I've used for building up the suspense. Okay, first sentence, she knew there was something with her. Now this is one thing that I think is key that wasn't necessarily on that PowerPoint. If you really want to scare somebody, don't say it was a spider. Don't say it was a spooky clown. Don't say it was a monster. Don't say what it was. In this story, right until the very end where I revealed the twist, I never said exactly what it was. I didn't even describe the creature that much. All I said was it was there. Something, someone, a shadow, a movement, a thing, a creature. Never, ever, ever tell the reader what it is if you're building suspense. You can give them clues. You can give them clues, and we'll look at that when we use suspense in our adventure story. You can give them clues, but never tell them. Let's carry on. The realization dawned that should she need it, help was very far away. I haven't said how, but I have done this. You'll see this in a lot of scary stories, in a lot of scary movies, in a lot of scary TV shows. The writer will remove help. So the person will be stranded somewhere, their mobile phone will lose signal, their car won't work, they have no escape. So what you need to do to make it scary is to make it claustrophobic. The main character is trapped. They can't ring for help, they don't have help. Spooky. Closing her useless eyes, she relied on her other senses. The word gives it away there. I have used senses. Now, like I said in the PowerPoint, I would not necessarily class senses as a skill just for suspense. But as it is a description, you would use them. Beads of petrified sweat began to gather. Oh, sorry, there was I missed the sentence. It was behind her. What's that? What do you think that is? It was behind her. Full stop, four words. That is a short sentence. Using short sentences to slow down the reader. That's what I did there. Okay, uh, do, 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 do. beads of petrified sweat began to gather atop her brow and her body sh broke into a controllable, uncontrollable tremble. Over here, this isn't really one of the key ones, but you would describe feelings, yeah? You'd have a powerful bank of vocabulary and you would try and find a hundred words for the word scared and a hundred words for the word screamed. And you would use all of them, change them around uh, while you're writing your stories. You wouldn't use them all in one story, but you would have a bank of them so that you could keep changing it when you write. Okay, moving on, let's see. Catching the scent of putrid breath on the air, she struggled to maintain her composure. Can you guess what that is? We're catching the scent, that's our senses again, and struggling to maintain composure. Composure, of course, being, you know, very calm, very collected. That would be feelings in that sentence. So we've already got those features up there. She didn't know what to do. These next two, listen. Should she stand there silently and hope it wouldn't notice? Or should she run as fast as she could for the door? 
These are questions. Two questions. You might want to use three. But there's two reasons for using questions. First reason is it slows the reader down because they think about the question. And that's point two. Questions put the reader in the place of the character. It makes the reader think, yeah, if I was in that situation, what would I do? Would I run for, for the door? And then if they're thinking about that, they think about what would happen if they ran for the door. Hence, scaring themselves with their own imagination. Then they would think, oh yeah, or should, should I stay? What would happen if I stayed silently and didn't move? Again, thinking about what would happen, thinking about the worst thing that could happen, scaring themselves with their own imagination. And that's kind of what tension is about. It's about the reader scaring themselves with their own imagination. Most description is about putting a picture into the reader's head, but this is different. This isn't about putting a picture of the thing into the reader's head. It's about the reader coming up with something scary because the reader knows their own fears. The reader knows what they are scared of and they can create in their own mind something much scarier to them personally than you as a writer can put in there. I mean, not always the case. Some writers have written some very scary books about very scary things, but a lot of them would use tension and the reader's own imagination. Let's continue. It moved, two words. That's obviously got to be our short sentence, slowing the reader down. It was getting closer. Again, four words, short sentence, slowing the reader down. Painfully. She bit down on her lip to prevent a scream from forcing its way out. That's a little bit of a mixture of feeling, but also a little bit of physical pain um, and pain that the reader again can imagine. So it's a little, you can use a little bit of spooky little pain, character being in pain, a little bit to scare your reader. The room was dark too dark to see anything clearly, but the smell gave it away as old, rotten, and fusty. Now, this is where I would disagree a little bit with the PowerPoint, because that said, you should use powerful verbs. Now, I would think of verbs as being more the action part. I wouldn't use powerful verbs. I would use powerful adjectives. I would use powerful adjectives. And right there in that sentence, I'm using the words um, rotten, fusty to describe the smell. Smell being a sense again, too dark to see, blocking out a sense and you can remove senses from the character and then the reader again would imagine what it's like to have that sense removed if it's too dark you can't see anything we all know what that's like yeah loud scream loud startling noises we all know that what that's like and we are relating to the reader who's had those experiences but not quite not quite in such a scary manner let's keep going she took a step forward. Again, quite a short sentence, six words. Creak! What's that? Can you remember what that is? I'll give you a second. Okay. Onomatopoeia. Mr. Jordan had a go at spelling it earlier. Didn't quite get it, I'm afraid. Can you? Give it a go before I write it. Say it out loud if you want. Write it down if you want. Try it and spell onomatopoeia. Maybe to spell it to your family. Spell it to your brother, sister, mum, dad, whoever. 
O, N, O, honor, N, A, T, O, matter, and then the Pia is the tricky bit, because it's P-O-E, like Poe, like Edgar Allan Poe, who, by the way, was amazing at creating suspense. I, A, honor, matter, Pia. And onomatopoeia are sound words like bang, crash, wallop, creak. The floorboard betrayed her, squealing loudly to alert what lay in the darkness. Again, I'm not saying what it is, because I never say what the scary thing is. And the thing happened. I'm doing two things there. One, I'm using a short sentence, but then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm going against what the reader thinks. The reader thinks, oh no, there's been a loud noise. Something bad is going to happen. And I say, no, nothing bad happened. In fact, Going back to Edgar Allan Poe, he does that too. Uh, see if I can remember it. The Raven. Uh, oh, oh, how's it start? Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over a many quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, whilst I nodded, nearly napping, <coughs> suddenly there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. <sighs> Tis a visitor, oh, I muttered, entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak November, December, one of them. And each dying ember wrote its ghost upon the floor. Vainly I sought the morrow, for my dreams had ceased to sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maidens whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'Tis some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'This it is, and nothing more." Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' yeah. says I, or madam, Truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came tapping, and so faintly you came rapping, rapping at my chamber door. The scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Hundreds of years old, and still using the same tricks. You make the reader think something is going to be there, and then it's not. Perfect for building tension. Well done, Edgar Allan Poe. Fantastic. Love, 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 I love, love that Poe. poem. And my favourite bit is actually the very ending because it's so intense. It's so intense. It goes, um, oh, a raven comes in. He, he goes on to the bust above the door and he keeps quoting the word nevermore, gets to the end where the, the main character has lost all hope and he, he just tried to get rid of this raven. The raven will not leave him alone. And, and he says right at the end, and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the palace, bust of palace just above my chamber door, and its eyes have all the gleaming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming casts his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted. Nevermore. Love that ending. So intense. Anyway, let's get through the last few sentences. We did onomatopoeia, that's what got me onto Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, nothing happened, that's what got me, uh, got me onto Edgar Allan Poe as well. And then, right at the end, I use this. Switch to action. Especially with a short story, I would switch the ending. I've built up, I've built up, I've built up. It's been slow. It's been short sentences. It's been a lot of language, a lot of description. We are building up really, really, really slowly. And then at the end, fast, change of pace. 
pace absolutely put that up there pace i will change the pace i will use without warning all of a sudden suddenly i will change the pace and then i will use lots of action a, a bright light switching on a clicking noise this happens everyone shouts this happens this happens this happens action done and if i really wanted to scare the person that was reading my story i would leave the ending open i would not tell the tell the reader what happened to the main character because again as i said before the scariest thing that you can do as a writer is to trust the reader's imagination and to trust that they know how to scare themselves much more <laughs> than you it's like that knock at the window it was a knock at a window but it was our imagination that scared us in the end i hope you enjoyed the suspense and just to give you a bit more over to mr george <laughs> oh that was suspenseful so i think the plan is now that i'm going to take you on a spooky tour around the school i'm not really sure what's going to happen i'm not really sure what exists out there we're going to go around and we're going to see if we can sort of make anything out of the darkness so it's not going to be structured lesson like what mr keeling has just delivered fantastically to you um it's going to be a, a wonder Let's uh, let's see what we can find. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I got no idea. Genuinely, let's go find out. So I'm going to take us out of the classroom. I thought we could. Well, you know what? We'll start by having a little look outside at what the outside world looks like at this time of night. And do you know what I think we need to do is let's turn off a few of these lights, don't we? Because get this one off. Oh, I'm starting to spot. Shadows. Shadows are creepy, aren't they? They make for really good stories, I think. Shadows. Because shadows are like extra people, aren't they? They're very unusual. What have we got? Where's the, I don't even know where the light switches in these corridors. I walk down these every morning. I never even turn the light. Never turn the light on. Who knows? Maybe if you can see a light switch, you can't let me know because you've not got the chat. Let's go and have a little look down here. So. As I wander around here, oh, I found another switch. Oh, let's turn that one off. Oh, turning one, another one on. Look at that. Isn't, that. isn't this a great shot for something spooky? Now, my camera is starting to use its kind of, the, the quality is going to go down a little bit because it's using its nighttime vision. This dark, empty corridor. I wonder what. I'm going to do. Hello! Whoa. That is also good, isn't it? For a jump scare, sudden sound, sudden things that are happening. Yeah, things out of the, uh, things from the unexpected. And it's quite hard for me to see with my glasses on. I have to take them off a little bit like this. Now, let's go and have a little, oh, look at this. That's spooky, isn't it? Should we go and have a little look down here? We're gonna have a little look outside because I always think outside is a spooky place. Uh, let's go and this. Let's go and have a look at the world outside. Now, look at the light, the color. We've got the gray, dark side. We've got the shadows that are being cast, almost like silhouettes. Some of these plants are. I don't want to go too far away from the building, so I'm going to lose the Wi-Fi. That sort of unknowing that I can see off into the distance. What's down there? What could appear? I love these are really nice things for spooky stories. I'm going to close it because it's actually freezing. It's really cold. Another thing that's interesting always are reflections, things that appear <gasps> out of nowhere. Jump scare! A ghostly silhouette wandering off. Where is it going to? Did you see that ghost wandering up over there? Who knows what it could have been? All right, let's go for a little journey down this corridor. Ah, exciting. I wonder what could be down here. Now, it's getting darker and darker around the school. Ooh, um, I'm going to open this door. Who 
knows what could be through here? It's going into the darkness now. I'm entering the hall. And the hall, of course, is a scary place to be. It is open. It is dark. Have a look into that void. There's nothing to be seen. A distant glimmer of light. Jump scare. Whoa. Where did that come from? As we go into this big... Now, another thing that's happening. My voice is echoing. I love the idea of voices echoing in dark places. It shows the places... Ooh, what is that? Flashing lights going off in the distance. Ooh, that is scary, isn't it? So many things we could write about all of this. What else is going on around here? I can hear footsteps. Wow, isn't it really effective? Just the sound of footsteps in your writing can add so much tension to what is going on. Scary. Let's have a little look. What can I see over there? Shadows. Did I see a shadow being cast? Was there a momentary shadow? Hold on. I've got something in my pocket here. This might help me. I've got... Uh-oh. Uh -oh. What is that? A single light. Look how much more effective. Look how much more scary that is. Wait, can I hear something? Jump scare. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Wow. I don't know what happened there, right? That was scary, wasn't it? Jump scare. <laughs> I will leave you to tour the night school by yourself. Yeah, Mr. that's Jordan. Look at that. I feel like that would be more scary. Okay. You. Thank you, sir. I don't really know where we're going to go with this, but we'll have a little wonder. He's gone. Let's go see what else we can find. I'm gonna go and explore a few more places. It's pretty dark in here. What have we got going on down here? So now, do you know what? This is quite good. Can you see down the end of the corridor? There is a kind of a glimmering light. I can hear a, a buzzing. I wonder what that could be. A single light being left on. I wonder who left it on. Should we go and see? Is there anything over here? There might be nothing. I don't know. Wandering around the place. What have we got? I'm not sure who left that on. I don't think anyone's down there. What else is going on? Have we got here's in the ICT room? What's this room like? I can see flickerings and glimmerings. Look how that fluorescent thing is. Anything down there? No. Okay, keep investigating the place. What have we got down here? Gosh, it's dark, isn't it? Ooh, look at that sparkly wall. I forgot outside. Anything over there? Do you know what? I tell you what, walking around with a massive lamp out at me, I'm going to probably drop this thing. I'm going to slowly walk our way back down these corridors. I love how shadows flicker, how they make it look like there's something that isn't there. I think a lot of our fear sometimes just comes, as Mr. Keeling was saying, is from the unknown, the things that we're not sure about. Anything in here? I'm wondering if this place is haunted, if there's anything we're going to find. How creepy is that? A single, lonely, dying Christmas tree. Look at it weeping. Look at that. Just up there, all on its own. One single little <laughs> Christmas decoration. Oh my gosh. Now that was creepy. Whoa. Whoa.
That is too creepy. <laughs> I'm actually now a little bit scared. I'm going to go and find Mr. Keeling. What is in there? Hello? Not sure. I'm hoping that's Mr. Keeling in that room because that is creepy. Mr. Keeling? Yeah. Oh, I'm getting lost. Are you really down here? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Did you see that on this camera? That was creepy. What? I was in the hall. I genuinely thought it was you. And then the door was just slowly opening in the, uh, the, the, the sports cupboard. I genuinely thought it was you. That wasn't you. I know that happened earlier when I was in there. Like, oh. I think it's just. What were you doing in the sports cupboard alone? No, no, no. The door was just opening and closing by itself. I'm guessing it's okay, it's obviously there's no such thing as ghosts, so I don't know what I'm getting all panicked about. I thought it was you. I thought it was all part of the spooky atmosphere. Uh, turns out it's not. Wow, we've gone up to 37 people somehow. Have you seen the latest uh, scores on the doors? Or no, what are the latest scores on the doors? Tell you me. Have raised. Drum roll. Drum roll. Brr, I tell you what, can I get it up so I can show the, the figure just after you say it? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Are you ready, sir? Drum roll. Raise 3,799 pounds. We've got more over here. It's 3,806. What? Or nine. Wow. We've got even higher. 3,809 pounds. How good is that? You're closing in on that. I don't want to jinx I genuinely thought screen. that was you in that room. That was freaky. Why don't you shine a light on it, sir? I did have a torch. What if I opened it and it was, I don't know, and then it sounded like something was scuttling around the hall as well. I hope that's been recorded. Well, I don't know. My imagination was running wild. I and that, that is the point of tension. It is about the person's imagination. The person's imagination if I had the live is challenge. much scarier. Yeah. And the mind plays tricks. I don't know what to do now. I've become all flustered. I didn't, I didn't want to stay in there. I didn't think you would actually be hiding in that room. Anyway, right. <laughs> What's the time to do? What's on? What's on the menu, sir? Come on. What are we gonna do? It's up to you, sir. I can go next if you'd like. No, 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 no. We do a whole new lesson. Why don't we do British values? British values. My goodness. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Let's do some British values. Let's think. What are the core core British values? I was gonna do something. I could do a religion one, ready, but let's um. No, let's British, British values. values. Let's Why talk not? about. Right, British values. I like it. Things that are important things that are significant to us British people and you can occasionally pop in um, and say a few things sir, because I sometimes forget them all. Uh, let's have a look. British values. Now when we talk about this we talk about the things that us in this country I guess widely what we're talking about is in Europe what we consider to be important something that is inalienable something that is our right that is uh, more important um, than most things, something that we find to be absolutely fundamental and there shouldn't really be other things that get in our way. Sometimes obviously we have other priorities in our life, we have priorities of family, we have priorities of earning money, we have maybe priorities of religion, but despite all of these things, these are some things that we count to be absolutely sacrament, uh, things that are so important to us in this country. And I think First and foremost, the key word here is freedom, okay? Freedom is a complicated concept. It's mostly a complicated concept because anyone who's lived here all their life uh, and experienced it only knows freedom and probably isn't aware of what it's like to live in a place without freedom. Um, in Britain, we are free to do so many things, so many things that we probably take for granted that actually other people are, I mean, this thing staring at me in the face is uh, something, I've got this, which we'll do a biology lesson maybe later on. Um, some things um, that we take for granted that, uh, you know, aren't things that other people in other countries have. So what sort of freedoms do we have? Well, I know the live chat has gone, but maybe I could come up with a few things for you. We have the freedom of speech, Okay, why is the freedom of speech so important? Well, 
being able to say what you think, what you feel, being able to go out there and speak freely is amazing. Okay, not feeling that you are going to get in trouble for basically having an opinion. That is something that we have all grown up to understand. But if you lived in other countries around the world, then that is not something you have. For example, if you were in China, then your freedoms to believe and to say things, to speak out against the government don't exist. The government could lock you down, could arrest you for not having the right, uh, for not having uh, the beliefs that they encourage. Uh, I know the Uyghur Muslims who live in China, um, in the west of the country, um, for their faith in Islam and their belief in their religion, they have been arrested en masse. They have been locked up and put into prisons, re-education camps. Those are people in China. China is a big country. If you came from somewhere like North Korea, you wouldn't have freedoms. There are many uh, countries across the world where people don't allow you to express yourself properly. In Russia right now, there are protests going around for someone who is trying to stand up against Putin. The guy's been arrested. There are people who get arrested for standing up uh, for these things. In Britain, if you want to go out and say Boris Johnson is an idiot, you can do it. You can go and stand and say it. No one will arrest you for it. You're welcome. You're free. It's an amazing freedom to be able to just say what you want about any political leader to have the freedom to go and do that. So I'm going to take that as an absolute big one. Freedom of speech. No one can restrict me. Now, this is a big one that comes with responsibility. And um, now, being free to speak your mind and to say what you want is um, important. <laughs> but yes, responsibility. That's why I was going to say, because just because you can say something, doesn't mean you always should say something. So we need to think to ourselves that sometimes just having the freedom of speech doesn't mean that you just go around and say whatever you want to anybody. Um, there are times when you need to think, well, look, okay, I could say this, but actually, is it going to make that person happy? So yes, we are free to say what we want, but that brings a responsibility with us to think, well, actually, probably best not to say that because that's going to offend that person or upset that person. And there may be words, there is language, there are things that we know that we don't say in public. There are certainly words that we would never say in school. There are words that you would never say to your grandma or your parents. And why is that? Well, it doesn't mean that we're not in a free country. It's just that as individuals, we are restrained. We are educated enough to understand that there are things we should and shouldn't say to certain people. Okay. I'm going to move up that. Freedom of speech. That's a big one. Freedom to, ooh, I like this one, wear what you want. Freedom to wear what you want. It is such an unimportant freedom that you people may take for granted. So in this country, um, if you wanted to go out and wear shorts, you could do, wear a dress, you can do. If you want to wear a hijab, you can do. If you want to wear a niqab, you can do. If you want to wear whatever you want, you're free to wear what you want. It's an absolutely fundamental freedom. This is not the case in all countries. There are countries, uh, I take uh, maybe Saudi Arabia or I take Iran, where you, it would be frowned upon for a woman to walk around the place with her hair out, flowing freely. That would be not allowed. There are countries closer to home, for example, France, across the border, France, where they ban women from covering their faces, should they so wish to, banning the, the niqab from being worn uh, in public. Imagine not being free to choose how you dress, to wear what you want. It's such a fundamental British value to make these free choices for yourself. Uh, and I think a really important one, much overlooked, Mr. Keating is actually allowed to wear the things he wears. Um, right, another freedom. Freedom, speech, responsibility. You can wear what you want. What are the freedoms do we have? Ah, uh, I like this one. And this is one which Mr. Keating is going, I know that we're going to be doing a little bit of a talk about later on, sir. Freedom to make money. Okay, and there are so many things that come with making money. So I'm talking about the freedom to choose your job, to buy a home, to do what you want with your cash, you know, spend how you want, yeah? 
If you go out there and you work and you earn your money, that money is yours after tax, but tax is only a small amount of your money. We'll talk about tax a little bit later. We're we going to be talking about tax a little bit later, Anta. We, well, you said you wanted to do I'm going to mention, we'll tax. talk about tax later. Um, but basically, the money that you earn is yours. You can go and do what you want with it. If you want to go and buy a property, you can do. If you want to buy a swimming pool, you can do. If you want to go and fly in a first class plane, uh, drinking the finest uh, Pepsi Max, I don't know what you might be drinking, that's your choice to do it. You want seven series access, it's your money, you make that choice. That is not a freedom that everybody in every country could have. There are places around the world where you are limited in the way that you can spend your money, where your money is not completely your freedom, where you're not necessarily able to own property or land en masse. There are also, we are free to have the job that we want. Uh, if I was born in North Korea, I may, for example, not have the right to any job that I so desired. The government might push me down a route. Um, uh, there might be countries I know, like in Eritrea or some other places, where I might be forced to join the army or do certain things. It is such um, an amazing freedom that we have that we don't always think about. We don't think about how lucky we are to choose the career we want, to go down the path that we are interested in, and to do with that wealth what we choose to do. Again, there are responsibilities. Um, you know, that we should maybe, if we do have a lot of money, be nice enough to give some to charity. You know, spending and sharing our money in charity with charity is a really important thing to do. So all of these freedoms, they come with responsibilities. Let's think of another freedom that comes down that we've got speech where what we want freedom to uh, to vote okay this is democracy and i'm not saying that democracy is the best thing in the world but it's the uh, it's probably the best thing that we've got so far um, and it's a system by which we uh, in britain and this is existent in the united states and across much of Europe, not all of Europe. I don't think it exists in Belarus. Um, I wouldn't say it probably ex properly exists in Russia, but a much most of Europe. Um, am I getting an amazing li live update? What are you going to show me? Oh, that's fantastic. Can I share that on the screen now? No. Oh, come on. Carry <laughs> okay. Um, you, uh, how am I, come on. You're not going to share that? No, no, no. All right, fine. Um, being able to vote is such uh, a. Oh, you're going to show me another one, and then you're going to say no to me. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Um, Mr. Gillings just showed me photos of him on the live stream, and he looks. He looks great. He looks great. Speech. I don't know what I was talking about. Vote. Democracy. Democracy is important, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? What You're saying that it's probably one of the fairest systems that we've got. Either. Fairest system that we've got. It's not the best system that we've got. Uh, well, it is the best system we've got. What I'm saying is there are probably ways to make it better. Um, for example, if you take the American system of democracy, um, in whatever year it was that the first time Trump got uh, elected, what would that be? Four, it's four years minus whatever we're in now. Is it five years they have an election in America or four years? I think it's every four Four years, four years, because you can have eight years. 2020, what would it have been? 2016, then? Yeah. So in 2016, in America, is when Donald Trump was elected. You think of America as being a fair and democratic place. Actually, Donald Trump did not get the most votes. More people voted back then for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. Yet, because of all sorts of weird, funny systems that they have in America called the Electoral College, and Donald Trump still won. This is actually quite similar in Britain where you could have a party that doesn't get loads and loads of votes, but still having a lot of power. So we haven't fully worked democracy out properly, but we're getting there. Um, best system so far. I don't know, I'm blabbing on. Right, freedom, speech, wear what you want, earn your money, vote. That's a good freedom. Let's think of another freedom. You think of another freedom for me, sir? Another freedom that we've got? Uh, 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 or another thing that's an inalienable British value. What do we got? What do we got? Uh, ah, who knows? Who knows? There are other ones, though, right? What else? Is, what else is a British value? Come on. <laughs> British value. I do. I do. I love them. They're great. Um, you know, being free. That's a big one. 
these are all really significant. What I was going to say is they fall into so many other categories. Having the freedom of speech um, and all of these things, they link to, I'll tell you what, I'll pop this another one in. Freedom of religion is quite significant. When you come to this country, anyone who is born here or moved here from all sorts of places, they're free to express their religion and believe what they want. That is not common uh, in all parts of the world. In many parts of the world, certain religions are deemed the most important, especially in the past. There have been lots of uh, religions that have been promoted by governments in this country. Even though there is still a link between uh, the church and the state, you are free to practice your religion as uh, you please. Um, you know, we, we are living in a rather Islamic community over here. Everyone's free to be um, Islamic, so should they so wish. Uh, there, it is one of the smaller religions in Britain, as we actually found out earlier on. There are far more Christians. Christians are free to be Christians. If you don't want to have a religion, you don't have to have a religion. No one forces you into this trap. It's a bit like with your career. Uh, just because your parents may be postmen, it doesn't mean that you're born to be a postman. You're a free individual. Just because your parents might have a religion doesn't mean you have to have that. You're free to make your own choices. You're free to go out there to learn about things, to find out information, to, to learn new stuff and make your own choices based on not what you've always been told as a child, but what you have gone on to study and find out. Freedom to education, okay? This is such an important thing in Britain that we believe in. We believe that every child deserves a good education. That is exactly what all of us teachers here at Anglesey Primary School strive to give to you every single day. We want to make sure that you have um, a fantastic education. This is why we're here teaching 24 seven. We're trying to raise money to make sure that you have got these devices. This is something that we thoroughly believe in. Yeah, we're not paid the earth to do this job, but we believe it is vitally important. And you should make sure that you protect that uh, support of education as you grow up in this country. Make sure that children are educated because you know what? Educated children help make a happy country. The more educated you are, the more happy you are likely to be because you will be able to get the job you want. You'll be able to go out and achieve the dreams that you wanted to achieve because you will be healthy, because you will be safe. Yeah, if you're more educated, you're less likely to get overweight and fat and useless because you are, it's okay, Mr. Feeling, I know you're educated. And um, because we are able, why, why did you look like that at me? Because you know about healthy eating, you know about how to exercise properly, you know about what's important, you know about keeping your body fit, making sure you flush out the fat from your veins, avoiding a heart attack. These are all things that come with education. You're going to keep yourself safer, aren't you, in your life? Because you're not going to be playing with fire and doing silly things that end up burning down a building. You're going to stay healthy. Hey, there's another one. Freedom to health. Okay. This is a lot of these. You might think, yeah, well, America does that. Yeah, well, France does that. Well, actually, we've already found out France does not have freedom to wear what you want. Um, America does have most of these, but here's one that America doesn't have. Freedom of health. You back in? What have I done? Spell it wrong. Edu. That is quite ironic if I misspell education, isn't it? So just a little pointer from Mrs. Hughes. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Um, freedom to healthcare. This is something that you do not, it's not an inalienable right in every single modern country. If, for example, in America, did you know they might come across as being one of the freest countries in the world? But if you're ill, you are poorly, if you don't have um, proper protections you uh, and you don't have enough money, you may not be able to get the health care. People have to pay for health care in America. Over here, and again, this is something we're going to talk about later with when we talk about our taxes, everybody shares a little bit of their money to make sure that everyone is protected. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how poor you are. It doesn't matter what point you are in your life, whether you're young, you're old, whether you've got a job, whether you don't have a job, we make sure in this country that you get the health care that you need. We know that in this country there might be times when you are suffering, there might be times when you've lost a job, there might be times where things aren't going quite right for you, you don't have the money. If you get poorly in America, you could end up, you might end up dying from it. You don't have the money to get yourself back up on the ground. Here in Britain, we make sure that you uh, get offered free healthcare 
and that you are secure. Right, what have I got, sir? Can we go through these? Can you think of any other things? I, I keep the rule of law. I love it. I'm not going to put that as a, 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 a is this separate to a freebie. Yeah, it's separate to a freebie. Here's a good one that Mr. Keeling has just said. I'm going to put it in a, a separate list. Okay, the rule of law. We talk about all these freedoms, and then suddenly we come to this kind of um, weird, uh, what's the word for it, when all of these, I'm saying it's so free, but the rule of law in a way limits our freedoms. Um, there's a word for it, I can't think right now. Uh, so the rule of law is another thing that we believe in this country. We believe in following the rules. I've spent so long banging on about how you're free to do what you want, but you are free to do what you want within the law. We have decided as a group of people that there are things that are not acceptable. We have decided that theft of property is not acceptable because anything that breaks our freedom should be banned by the rule of law. If it interferes with any of our freedoms, then that is when the rule of law comes in to protect our freedom. You say, well, what if I, I want to be free to go and steal stuff? Well, by stealing things, you're breaking people's freedom to have their own money and to do what they want with it. You're damaging them. Well, you say, well, I want to be free to go and hurt people whenever. Well, if you're hurting people, you're damaging their freedom of health, aren't you? And their freedom of happiness. I'm just going to pop happiness in there as uh, well. Okay. When anything happens that is damaging any of our freedoms, then the rule of law steps in to make sure that we are protected from it. The rule of law is that belief that no matter what uh, society has our back, if we have been wronged by theft, if we've wronged because we are hurt, if we've been wronged because people have treated badly, then there is a system in place to make sure that people are stopped, that people are punished. Um, how are we doing for this, sir? Can you think of any other things? What would it be nice now if we had the chat room with all 18 people is we could have had a debate about what would be the most important. Is one more important than another? Are there any of these that I would put ahead? I was obviously in this class, we'd have some sort of diamond shaped discussion uh, about which one of these is the most significant. What about the freedom to protect ourselves? That's an interesting thing. The freedom to protect ourselves because that is something that's quite important in America, isn't it? Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? I had this whole debate with um, my children uh, in my class on the you know, year three live stream. Um, in America, there is um, a big, uh, protect yourself. It's a tricky one because in Britain, who protects us? Well, we imagine the rule of law and that belief in it, the fact that people are educated and don't want to break the law and ultimately the police keep us safe. We are generally a very safe country. In America, they have quite a different understanding of what protecting yourself is. They don't necessarily fully believe it's the government's job to do that, but they believe it's each individual's job to make sure they're protected. In America, for example, they believe in the right to bear arms. And I'm not talking about having actual bear arms, but we are talking about being able to carry a gun or a weapon. In America, that's something that they believe is really important, that the freedom to have kind of weaponry to protect themselves is uh, important to them. In this country, we've decided, and I think I probably agree with this, that actually by introducing weapons, by having everybody have guns, we don't make the place safer. It's only a safe place if people all have guns, if everyone is educated. The trouble is not everyone has been educated as well as you guys. Not everyone has that um, amazing support network. Some people, when they grow up, They've not learned all the right things to do. They have not gone through school, got the right education. And I wouldn't really want to put a weapon in the hands of people like that. So a lot of these things are things that we could debate at a later time. Okay, I've gone through some British values there. That's taken up a little bit of time. Uh, so would you like me to carry on? I'm gonna, I can do my uh, some religious stuff now. I can do time, sir, for a bit. You can do a little bit of a rest. Do you want to do time? I, I can do time. Oh, okay, sure. You do some time. I'm going to come on after that. I'll tell you what we're going to do. After Mr. Keeling looks at time, what do you, are we going to talk about that? The dimensions of time. No, 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 no. Space and time. Space and time. No, actual time. Nine. The clock. Maths. Oh, it's maths. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, oh, brilliant. Who doesn't love maths? <laughs> maths is great. Maths is great. I love maths. Um, 
Okay, this is great. So we'll do some maths. If you're going to do time on a clock, should I do some maths afterwards? Maybe some fraction stuff? Sounds good. Either that or uh, I'm going to do some religion stuff. We're going to have a look at Islam. We're going to look at the five pillars of Islam later on. We're going to look at the story of Christianity. And we're going to have a little look at um, one of the religions that we looked at earlier, which is kind of called humanism. 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 Being a humanist. I've Being heard a human. of that. You've heard of that? I have heard of that. We're going to find out a little bit more about that later. Fab. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Right, over to you, Mr. Keeling. Well, thank you, Mr. Keeling. Uh, right, we are going to do time now. Time. Time is one of those things um, <laughs> that teachers, teachers dread teaching. Um, because time is such a complex thing. And it's such a complex thing because of these things. Analog clocks. Whoever invented the analog clock and the terminology around the analog clock, well, they did not like teachers. I can tell you that. I mean, if we think about it, 12, well, that's o'clock, but it's also 12, but it's also zero minutes. The one, well, that could mean one hour, but it can also be five. But it could also be 55 too. The number two, 10 past, or two o'clock, or 50 minutes too. This one, six, six o'clock, or half past, or 30 minutes past, or 30 minutes too. You know what, I think it should be 10 numbers on the clock. 10, why 10, sir? It's just a better number. It's a better number, yeah. Yeah, yeah I like 12. That's probably the thing that I like about the clock is 12. Also, you can use them like Frisbees. They're great Frisbees. They are great Frisbees. Anyway, back to it. So I always uh, teach and I always try and learn the clock uh, in a certain way. Um, I don't always teach. No, sometimes I sleep. Uh, not tonight. Uh, I always teach the time in a certain way. Or reading the clock in a certain way. The first thing I do is I establish the hands, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to establish the hands on a clock, and we're going to go over here. I'm going to get up the interactive clock, and we're going to have a little look at it together. Would you bring it over? I was, I was going to come and establish my hands on TV. That is fabulous. Okay, we are slowly bringing ourselves over to the interactive clock. Let's place some space. I guess it's a bit shiny, isn't it now? Okay, fantastic tool. It literally is just a clock that you can move around. If you've got an analog clock at home, fine. But this is quite a nice little tool just to work with children and change time on it. Also gives the digital time, which I am going to turn off, and I always turn off when I use this. Um, the first thing uh, I'm going to look at is the hands. We need to understand that the long hand points to how many minutes, and the small hand points to how many hours. But for the moment, we're going to ignore that. And we're just going to know that when the big hand points to 12, that means o'clock. That's the first thing we're going to learn. We're going to learn all of the o'clocks. So when the big hand, the longer hand, points to 12, that means o'clock. So that is 8, because the hour hand, the little one, is pointing to 8. That is 8 o'clock. Let's skip on an hour. Again, the big hand is pointing to 12 which means o'clock. It doesn't mean 12 o'clock. It is the minute hand. And whenever the minute hand is pointing to 12, it means o'clock. The little hand is pointing at the nine. So I take that o'clock and I put nine in front of it. Nine o'clock. Skip on an hour. Again, the long hand, the minute hand, and it's harder to see on the regular clock because the hands are not two different colours. You've got the long hand. You have to see if it is long or short. And then you've got the short hand here. This one points to the hours. This one counts the minutes. But if that one is at 12, it will always be o'clock. So that's the key first point. Whenever that long hand is on the 12, it is o'clock. That's important to learn first. The second thing that I would always look at with the clock is half past. 
I would do o'clock and I would do half past. I wouldn't bother at the minute with quarter past and quarter two. I, th I, would, I would leave that until after I've read to the minute. It would just confuse me a little bit more. I would learn o'clock and I would learn half past. When the big hand has gone half way around the clock, that is half past. When the big hand points to six, it is half past. When it points to 12 o'clock, we've learned two things. O'clock, when the big hand points to 12, and half past, when it points to six. But half past what hour, sir? I have children all the time when I'm doing this. I'll say, what time is that? They will say, it is half past. Fantastic. Half past what? Half past 11. That's because they are looking at where the hour hand is. They're getting that bit right but then they are looking at the next number across. And that is where the language of past and the language of two come in handy. Now, listen, it is half past, half past. The key word really there is past, past. I look at the hour hand. The hour hand travels clockwise around the clock, counting from 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It follows the numbers in order. So I take that word, past, and I look at that hour hand, and I follow the hour hand. It is going this way. What hour is it going to go to next? Well, it's going to go to 11. What hour has it just gone past? Well, it's just gone past 10. So if the word was two, I am looking at what hour that little hand is going to. If the word is past, I'm looking at what hour that little hand has gone past. And that is important for reading time to the minute. Once I've established that, I would move on to breaking the clock up into two halves. I've established the big hand on the 12 means o'clock. Easy, o'clock, what o'clock is it? It is 10 o'clock. O'clock, what o'clock is it? Then, no one. <laughs> it is one o'clock. Again, what time is it? It is four o'clock. Half past, a little bit harder, but we use that word past. It's down at the bottom. The minute hand, the longer hand, the green hand here, but the longer hand on your clock, analog clock, is at the bottom. It means it's half past. It's gone halfway around the clock. We use the word past to read the hour hand. That hour hand follows the numbers around. So it's going this way. Past. I follow it down and I look at the number it's gone past. It is going to go to seven. So it must have gone past six. Now at this point, some children might say, past five. They're right, it has gone past five, but I want the number that it has just gone past. And I would remind them that the number that it has just gone past and the number that it has just gone past is six. It is important to get that word past for the children to know what they're talking about. Let's go over to the whiteboard again. Huh? You can do it. Okay, back to the whiteboard over here. This is where I would split the clock into, and I would have this diagram up somewhere. I can see that Mr. Jordan has actually done it on his clock, which is fantastic. He's split the clock into two and passed. That is exactly what I would do. I would draw a diagram so that the children could see. That you can't really see, so I'm gonna go over it in black one second. Like that. I'd draw a diagram and I would split that in two. On this side, 
I would write pass. Because if the minute hand is anywhere on that side of the clock, it is past the hour. It has gone past the last hour. However, if the minute hand is on that side, it is counting to the next hour. It is counting to o'clock, the next hour. And I will use that diagram to help me build the time word by word. Let's go back to the clock. To read the clock, it helps to know your five times table. That won't be everything, but it helps. Each of these numbers in minutes are five minutes. That's because there are five minute lines between each number. If we look, start at 12, that's where we start from. We start counting from o'clock. One, two, three, four, five. Five minutes, we've got to number one. Let's check. From one to two, one, two, three, four, five. From two to three, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. There are five minutes between each number. So that means to count up, we can count in fives. But it's so complicated, the clock. But you need to know which side you're counting on to know whether you're counting forwards or backwards. If it's on the past side, you have to count this way. If it's on the two side, because you're going to the next hour, you have to count this way. I'm gonna show you how I would build the time using this method. And then I'm gonna give you a couple to try yourself. So, let's imagine. There is the minute hand. I'm gonna to count to it in fives to start off with. But I need to know, is that on the past side? Or is it on the two side? I check my diagram over here. That hand is over this side. It's on the past side. So whatever the time is, is going to be minutes past because I'm counting the minutes with the minutes hand. And because it's on that side, I'm going to count this way from 12. So I start at 12 and I'm going to count in fives. Five, 10. Uh oh, what's the problem? What's the problem? The problem is I've gone past where the hand is pointing. I need to be exact. I can't go past it. I'll try again. Five. I can't count another five, so I'm going to count individual minutes. Five, six, seven eight, nine, I've counted to the hand. Right, I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget it. It is nine minutes. I said it was on that side of the clock, so it is nine minutes past. Nine minutes past right now i can look at the hour and when i look at the hour i need to look at which hour it's just gone past back to my clock so this is nine minutes past i trace the line of my hour hand and i look at which hour it's just gone past now it's here the next hour it's going to is nine so the hour it has just passed is eight. Back to my sentence. The time is nine minutes past eight, the hour. And I've built the time. It'll be slow at first. If you're learning to read the time, it will be slow. You will need the diagram and you will need to follow the steps exactly, but you will get quicker. You will get quicker at that. You'll be able to count to the minutes quicker. You will be able to spot which hour it's gone past 
or which hour it's gone to. And we're going to look at a two one in a minute. And then you will be able to write down the time quicker. Given time, and once you understand time, you'll be able to look at the clock and instantly know what time it is. Or if you're not going to count the exact minute, you can say a pretty close time. Because adults don't necessarily always say the exact time. They say, oh, it's about nine, or it's about quarter past, or it's about 20 past. Yeah. About. But first, we need to know exactly so we can get to that point. Let's look at a two. Let's look at a two time. I'm going to move this around a little bit. Okay. That is clearly the minute hand there, the long hand, and it is on the two side. I'll just double check that. Over here, looking at the clock, it's on this side, this side of the clock. Checking my diagram is the two side. So let's go back. Because it's on that side, I'm going to count this way around to the minute hand. I'm going to count this way around. So let me go. Let me go. Five, 10, 15. What's the problem? Uh oh, I've gone past it again. Stop. I need to stop counting in fives when I can't go anymore. Five, 10. I'm going to stop. 11, 12, 13, exactly where the minute hand is pointing. So now I know that it is 13. 13 what? 13 what? 13 ice creams? 13 cookies? 13 dancers? 13 rubbers? It's minutes. It's the minute hand, so it's minutes. It is 13 minutes. So I'm going to go write that down. 13 minutes. I counted them. You can't count in fives. If you struggle counting in fives, you could count every minute line. It will take you ages, but you can do it that way as well. 13 minutes. Which side did I say it was on? It was on this side. So that is 13 minutes, two. Now I need to look at the hour that the hour hand is going to. So I'll trace the hour hand. It's about here. What is the next hour it's going to? I follow it around with the numbers. The next hour, well, it's just gone. Well, it's not just gone, but it has passed 10. I'm not going to write 10, though. That's past. We're not on the past side. We're on the two side. What's it going to? That hour hand is going to 11. So I write the hour. 13 minutes to 11. I use my diagram. I decided what side that minute hand was on. I counted that way. If it was on that side, I counted that way. If it was on that side, I counted that way. Then I used the correct word, to or past, and then I looked at the hour, either which hour it was going to or which hour it passed. And there are tricky times on the clock where you've got to look very carefully. Let me give you an example. If the minute hand was here, a lot of children in the past when I've showed them this have said that is half past. No, it's not. It's not half past, not quite half past. If you look very carefully, the minute hand has not quite gotten to half past. Wow. Wow. Indeed, sir. It's one minute away, but it is still on the past side. So I am going to have to count all the way around to that, and I'm going to do it with my fives. So I start at 12, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. I can't go to 30. I know it's not 30 because it's not half past. 25, 26, 27, 28, 20. Nine. 29 what? It's 29 minutes. It's on the past side, so it must be 29 minutes past. I look at the hour hand. I look at what it's gone past. It has gone past 11. It is 29 minutes past 11. Now, if it was just on the other side of that, it's now on the two side. I've got to count backwards to it. So I go backwards 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. 29, but this time it's 29 minutes to. So I look at the hour hand and I say which one it's going to. It's going to 12. So that is 29 minutes to 12. 
Right, your turn. I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to work it out. And then I will show you how I build the answer. So looking at the clock, you've got two minutes. There you go. Give it a go. Two minutes. See if you can write down the time. Okay, another minute. Remember, build it how I built it. Is it on the pass side? Is it on the two side? How many minutes? And then look at the hour. Okay, let's go through. We'll look at our diagram. Is it on the two side or is it on the pass side? There's the two side, there's the pass side. I'm gonna go past. It's on the pass side, so well done. Mm. Now I'm gonna count around to the minute hand. Five, 10, 15, can I go 20? No. No, 15, 16, 17, 18. 18 what, sir? 18 minutes. So I am going to write that down. I know it is 18. I know it is 18 minutes and I know it's on the past. I'm going to combine that. 18 in this order, minutes, past. Okay, that seems straightforward enough. Written that, got that. Now I look at the other hand. I ignore the minute hand. Now I've done, it's done its job. All I need to remember now is the word past. So I look at the hour it has gone past which number? If it's going this way, counting around the numbers, which number has it gone past, sir? Uh, is it the one? It has just gone past the one. And that's all we need to write for the hour, the one that it's gone past. So that time would be 18 minutes past one. So this seems really clear. It's like it? Lego. It's like Lego, sir. You just build it. A block on top of a block on top of a block. So where are the children going wrong? Where are the children going wrong, sir? Well, there are certain things that trip them out. Uh, for example, they can confuse the hour hand with the minute hand. Right. That confuses them sometimes. They can confuse the sides, past and to. Oh, I know. And it's the fact that this one's kind of going backwards, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. So count. Sometimes they will count all the way around Five, where you've got to kind of count either way. Yeah, yeah, that is quite confusing. It actually. is confusing, sir, but if you follow the past, the two, the count in the right direction, and then use the terminology for the hour, you will eventually get it, but it takes practice. Speaking of which, here's your next one. Couple of minutes, read the time. Hmm. It's tricky. Tricky one, that. Oh no. Okay, one more minute. Think about, is it on the two side? Is it on the pass side? How many minutes to or pass? Then look at the app. Okay, I think that's about enough time. Yay! Thanks for that. Uh, let's have a look. So I'm going to use my diagram as ever. To that side, past that side, right? Which side is it on? It is on the two side of the clock. So I'm going to count this way towards it. It's on that side, so I count backwards down the numbers. Uh, I'm going to show you counting in ones, you know? It's longer, but you can do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Each line is one. 
16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. It's 22 minutes, and I've said it's on the two side. So I'm going to write that down so I don't forget it. 22 minutes to... Then I look at my hour. My hour is pointing in between the four and five, but I'm interested in the hour that it is going to. It counts around this way, counting up the numbers. So the next number it is going to is going to be the five. That's the hour. It is 22 minutes to five. 22 minutes to five. Okay. I'm going to do a couple more. And then I, I'm going to show you the last step to reading time. A couple more. Now, let's go there. I'll give you two minutes. Then I'm going to do some division. Remember, ask yourself, what side is it on? Is it on the two side or is it on the past side? Ask yourself, which way am I counting? Count the minutes, add the words, find the hour. Okay, let's build it. First I ask, two or past? Check my diagram. It's on this side. That's the past side. Now I count to it, starting at 12. Five, 10. That was easy. I didn't have to count any ones because it's pointing exactly to one of the numbers. It's pointing here. If I can count in fives, five, 10. It is 10 minutes, and I know it's on the pass side. <laughs> so it is 10 minutes past. I look to my hour. This is tricky because it's only just gone past the hour. But if it is very close to o'clock, I have to think to myself, what was the last o'clock that it was? It's very close to seven, but it has slightly gone past seven. So the hour must be seven. It can't possibly be six. Look at the gap. We've only had 10 minutes since it was o'clock. It can't possibly be six. It must have just gone past seven. So I add my hour. And then I've got my time. 10 minutes past seven. Okay. Let's do one last one. Before a final thing. I'll give you two minutes again.
hang in there. Even working. Working, you reckon? If we've got 15 people desperately watching this. 30 seconds more, and then we'll build it together. It's the two sides trick, isn't it? It is, but if you count backwards and you follow the steps, you can get there. It just takes practice. Did this with the year fours. Yeah. Um, they didn't know how to read the time. Followed this method. The end of the day, then get it. Most of them. So it's just about perseverance, and it's just about going over and over. Okay, let's build it together. Which side is it on? It's on the two side. Check my diagram. That side is two. So I count this way. It's on this side. I count this way. 5, 10, 15, 20, can't go any further, or I'll go past 20, 21, 22. That's 22 minutes. I said it was on the two side. So I'm going to write that. 22 minutes. Oh, I'm matching. 22 minutes. Two. Then I look at my hour hand. My hour hand counts around, counting up the numbers. So it's going to go this way. The next number that it's going to go to is 10. So I write the hour, 22 minutes to 10. Okay. Last thing. And I wouldn't teach this until last because Children would be fine saying that that is 15 minutes to, and that is 15 minutes past. There is nothing wrong with that. And I don't see the point really in confusing before they've got a good grasp of the time. So I wouldn't say quarter to and quarter past until the very end. And that is the last step. I would turn around and I would say, we know that that is half a clock. What do we get if we split a circle into four parts? Well, we get quarters. If we do a quarter turn, we get quarter past. You know that's the past side by now. You know how to read the time. You know how to find the two and the past side. So when it points to three, it is quarter past. When it points to nine, it is quarter two. But you know what, children? It doesn't matter if you say 15 minutes to. It doesn't matter if you say 15 minutes past because you're still reading the time. And I would leave that till very last because really, just say 15 minutes. <laughs> but it is quarter two and it's quarter past and it's half past and it's o'clock and it's all those minutes in between. And it's really, really complicated. But if you stick to the method, if you practice at it, you will get it in the end. And if you try it for 18 years, you get into adulthood and you still cannot read that clock, well, buy yourself a digital watch. All right, and on that, I will hand you back over Books. to Mr. Jordan. Give me a second, I'm coming. Let me empty this. One second, should I time it on the clock? It's done. It's done, there that was about That was about a second. I'm all over this, right, we're back, oh my goodness, the numbers have gone up, it was 15 last time, I know we're at 23 people determined Sticking to it. Impressive. Right. What are we going to do now? Oh, I said we do a little bit of division. I need to do something, honestly, to keep me awake. Sitting there is no good. So I'm just going to clear all this up. And I guess the first question for any child who might be watching this the next day would be simply, what is division? Mr. Keeling has obviously been aiming this time stuff. Well, pretty much the time stuff is aimed at everybody. Because it doesn't matter what year you are in, people still struggle with time and time. That is true. Um, but this division stuff is squarely initially aimed at the low. Did we, what do you do with that black pen? So, did you? Did you... Uh, right here. Whoa! Whoa! We some, oh, we. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Good news. Is there something exciting? What is it? Children, we are edging ever closer. Ever. We're well, not children, not at this time. Hopefully not. Hey, so, oh, but we are edging time, closer. Yeah. Edging closer to our 4,000 pounds mark. We're not there yet. But we are not that far off. We have got up to three 
3,874 pounds. That is incredible. Might get the four pounds. Absolutely incredible. We're going to be back on BBC Radio tomorrow morning and we will try pushing it as well. We'll be on twice, half six and just before nine o'clock. We're going on twice in the morning. We're going on twice in the morning. They're checking how we are at six. (laughs) They're checking how we are at nine. Wow. You like us? I like that guy on BBC Radio. I liked him too, but I do have a feeling that they're ringing in more for our sanity rather than to see how we're doing. Well, so like I said, we're going to squarely aim this initially at, let's say, year two, year three. That's my level one. We're going to move up. We're going to level up to level two, which would be my kind of year three solid. And then by the end, we're going to move up. Well, I'm going to say this is my uh, year two, three. This could be my three, four. And then we'll get up to a sort of four, five by the end. I'm going to slowly tick off each level as we go up. So first of all, we need to understand what division is. Just in the same way as earlier on, we spoke about what multiplication is. We said that multiplication is a bit like repeated addition. So if I had three multiplied by four, I've got a three, 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 three. I am putting three in four times. So of course, I start at zero. I go to three, six, nine, twelve. Okay, it is kind of like a repeated addition um, in. Let me see what that actually looks like. I think I had a load of um, some more over here. Uh, looks a bit like this, doesn't it? I've got a three, and another three, and another three, and another three. Whew, that was multiplication. But, of course, I'm looking at the vision. And someone very wisely in the chat earlier on, they said it's like the opposite of uh, multiplication is the opposite of division, division is the opposite of multiplication. In fact, that word they use was inverse, which is a fantastic word to use. So let's have a look at this in a slightly different way. For example, I might have the question, and when I divide a number, obviously my result is going to be smaller. When I multiplied it, I jumped up in equal jumps. When I divide, I am splitting it into equal chunks. So for example, I might have a question like this, where I've got 12 and divided by three, what does it equal? I'm kind of thinking to myself, if I had my number line, I'm saying to myself, well, how many threes are in 12? And I could say, well, I'm going from zero, going up to 12, and I might think, oh, well, look, there's a three, and there's one three. Uh, Is there another three in 12? Oh, yeah, look, there's another three in 12. That gets me to six. Can I do another three in 12? (gasps) Yes, I can. Can I do another 3 and 12, getting me to 9? Can I do another 3 and 12? Ah, oh, yes, I can, getting me to 12. So you can see there is a real big link between multiplication and division. Now, let's have a look at that with another calculation. Let's say I have got 9 divided by 3. Well, again, I'm thinking to myself, how many 3s in 9? Well, about 3, 6, 9. It equals 3. There are 3 3s in 9. I can do this backwards. I can say 3 times 3 equals 9. There is the inverse right above it. Doesn't matter which order it is. Remember the equal sign just is like the same as it's showing that both sides are equal. Doesn't really matter what side my calculation is on. Uh, let's try another one. Let's have, oh, I don't know, let's say 56 divided by 7. So I could think to myself, right, how many 7s have they got? I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I can count up in sevens. The thing is, I don't know my seven times table off by heart. Well, I do. I know that seven times eight is 56. So it must be eight. There are eight sevens in 56. I can check that by turning it into a multiplication. Eight times seven equals 56. Yep, absolutely right. My mum always used to teach me when she was doing the multiplication. She would say it's easy because you say to yourself, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, seven, eight to 56. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I've got this idea in my head of what division is, but division starts to get a little bit tricky. That's nice and easy. I've got my idea of what division is. Now I'm going to move on to when division gets a little bit tricky. I can't always use my multiplication knowledge, okay? Yeah, sure, there are some simple ones. Yeah, I think to myself, 35 divided by 5, I think how many 5s make 35? Oh, that must equal seven. Simple, because I'm just using multiplication knowledge. 
Remember, by the end of year three, well, the end of year four, sorry, you need to make sure you know all your multiplications from zero up to 12. If you know your multiplication, these simple divisions become easy. You're just using your multiplication knowledge to answer it. But sometimes I can't use my multiplication knowledge because I don't know three times, I had three times what is 39. I've got no idea. I don't know. I don't know that. It's, it's not in my 12 times table. So what can I do? Well, I'm going to use a, a number line. I'm going to use a little trick. You could do two things for this. One thing I could do, instead of doing loads of jumps of three, so I'm going from three, zero to 39, and instead of doing loads of jumps of three to find out how many threes are in 39, I can do something I call chunking where I can take chunks that I know already. So for example, I know, well, I know that 10 three, so three multiplied by 10, I know that that is 30. And then, oh, how much more have I got? Well, I only need nine more. Oh, I know that three multiplied by three is nine. So I've had 10 jumps of three here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And I had one, two, three more jumps at the end. I chunked my numbers. Let's have a try with um, another number here, shall we? We'll have something in the four times table. Let's have 52 um, divided by four. Okay. I don't know. It's not naturally in my four times tables. I know that it's not going to be 12 times four. And maybe I don't even know my 12 times table yet, but it's not going to be hard because I definitely do know my 10 times table. So I'm going to use the knowledge that I know. Okay, do the things that I'm comfortable with. 10 times table is super easy. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, right, I'm starting at zero. I need to get to 52. I'm going to see how many fours are between here and here. How many equal jumps of four are between there and there. Now, if I just simply went up in fours, four, eight, 12, oh, it's going to take me so long to do it. So I'm going to take a handful of fours, which I know I'm going to have a handful of, well, I know that 10 fours, here they are, here's 10 fours. I know what they are, but that's 40. So let me do 10 fours, four times 10, that gets me to 40. It's like having 10 of these little things all squashed into that. Right? I'm at 40. How much more have I got to go? Well, I could count just on in fours if you wanted at this point. Should I just count on in fours? I could say, well, another four would get me to 44. Another four would get me to 48. Oh, another four gets me to 52. So I've got 10, 11, 12, 13, fours. Nice and easy. Okay. I like this system. It's really nice to be able to chunk things when I've got division. And actually, rather than making this really complicated, I just use calculations that I already know. This is why things like the 12 times table are really easy, because any, timesing anything by 12 is just timesing it by 10 and timesing it by 2. Nice and simple. Let's take a couple more of these then. Should we have another go? What have I got here? 96 divided by 6. Let's have a look. And I'll tell you what, I've done a lot of modeling, and it's time for you to have a little go at uh, um, children who are watching, to have a little go. So, I got 96, and I'm gonna divide by six. So, I'll start you off. I'm gonna put on my number line zero here. I'm gonna put 96 here. There is another way to do this, and that's kind of when we move over here to level three, we're gonna try it, but I like using this number line. It might not be the quickest way in the world, but I tell you what, it certainly makes me understand what is going on, okay? And it's really important as we're developing as mathematicians that we're not just using little tricks, that we are truly understanding the maths, the calculations that are happening. So what could I do here? I tell you what, I'll leave you. I'm gonna do what Mr. Keening does. I'm gonna do a full rotation around this table. I'm gonna give you time have a little go at this. You need to chunk this up. How are you going to chunk it? I always start chunking with the 10 times table. It's up to you. I'm going to do a rotation around this table. By the time I come back, I'm going to have done it. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10. That's quite handy. That works in just 10 steps. Okay. This is what I would do. I would say, right, I know what 10 jumps of 6 are. So 6 multiplied by 10 is 60. Can I do another 6 jumps of 10? Uh, no, that would get me to 120. So I can't do another jump of 10. I like to go through this little list of what's really easy in my head, actually. 10 jumps, then I do 5 jumps, 2 jumps, and then I'm just going 1 jump. So can I times it by 10? No, I can't do another lot of 10. Can I times it by 5? What 6 times 5 is 30? Ah, I can do that. So let's do 6 times 5 to get me to 30. 6 multiplied by 5. So 60 out of 30 is 90. Can I do another jump of 5? No, I can't. Can I do a jump of 2? No, I can't. Oh, I just need to do one more jump of 6. 1 times 6 is 96. Look how easy this was. I had 10 jumps of 6, then another 5 jumps of 6, and then one final jump of 6. To means altogether I've done 10, 15, 16 jumps of 6. I really like that method. I'm going to do a Mr. Keeling. I'm going to set you another one. I'm going to go for a walk around my table. Okay, here we go. Let's set another one up for you to have a go because this is starting to be really, really easy. I'm realizing that actually these calculations are not that hard after all. Let's have, here's a basic one for you, and a times table that everyone should be able to do. 75 divided by five. I'm gonna put the number line on for you. I'm gonna start at zero. I know I'm ending at 75. I'm gonna go for a little walk around the table. I'm gonna leave you to have a go. <laughs> It's nice little walk. Yes, we haven't done karaoke yet. So. We haven't done the karaoke. When are we going to do that? I don't know, so. I feel like we're, going to, we're building up to this karaoke. What are we going to say? I tell you what, why don't you spend a second thinking of a good song to sing? I think you were quite right with Beatles. Didn't you? Yeah, Beatles. What, yesterday? Are we going to go miserable or Blackbird singing in the dead of night? What are we going to go Gently weep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's the one that the what is the one that kids like? That octopus one. How does that go? Octopus is gone. And then octopus is gone. I can't remember. I like to be under the sea in an octopus is garden in the shade. It's like that one. Oh, they also like the in the town where I was born lived a man who sailed to sea. And he told us of his life on a yellow submarine. Bum, bum, bum. We all lived in a yellow submarine. He's left me there, hasn't he? That's what he's done. I was doing, right. I was doing the verses. Yeah, that's good. So, what have we got? I've given you enough time there, and you've had a little musical interlude. Um, okay, I'm going to do my system, my 10, my 5, my 2s. Can I do 10 jumps of 5? Let's have a look. 5 multiplied by 10 gets me to 50. Yes, I can. Can I do another 10 jumps of 5? That would get me to 100. Uh, uh, I can't do it. I'm going to go over the number line. So can I do 5 jumps of 5? Oh, actually, I can. That's quite easy, isn't it? 5 more jumps of 5. 50 add 25 to 75. The answer all along was 15. How easy is that? Do we do one more? Do you want to give me one? Sure. Right then. Uh, what times table would you like it in, sir? Oh, thank you. Make it tricky. Really? <laughs> Why not? Okay. Sure. Yeah. We'll go for, let's say, 98 divided by 7. Okay. I like it. 98 divided by 7. Do you know what we're going to start doing? This might have this already. I don't know. Has it got remainders? No. Right. Good. We're going to go for remainders in a second, and we're going to find out what on earth remainders are. I'm going to start with number Wait. zero. I'm going to end at 98. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. It's your turn to have a little go. So can you chunk this up for me? I'm going to go for a little wander around the table. By the time I am back, you should have an answer. Wonder, wondering. It's never going to be worth right time I'm back, realistically, is it? No. I mean, it pause it. Oops, I was about to stand on that. Not the same. Realistically, you might have to pause it because I'm going to get impatient. All right, let's have a little go at this then. 
98 divided by seven. So I'm gonna do jumps that I know. Can I do 10 jumps of 70? Yes, I can. Let's do seven multiplied by 10, which gets me to 70. Brilliant. Can I do another 10 jumps of seven? That will get me to 140. Ah, too far. Can I do five jumps of seven? Well, five jumps of seven is 35. Can I do 70 and 35? 70, 80, 90, 100. Ah, no, can't do it. Okay, what can I do next? Can I do two jumps of seven? Oh, I think I can. I think two jumps of seven, so seven multiplied by two is 14. That's going to get me to 84. 84. Can I do another two jumps of seven? Let me think. Two more jumps of seven, that's another 14. That would get me to. Oh, Right. So another seven times two, I add another 14, I get to 78, yeah? That means I've got 10, 12 equals 14. Bing, 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 bing. I love it. That worked really, really well. Okay, this is really, really easy. Sometimes, however, the numbers don't land so nicely. So for example, someone might come along to you, give you a question like this. And it says 11 divided by 5. How many 5s in 11? And you say, wait a second. There's, no, there's nothing in the 5 times table that equals 11. What are you on about? 11 is a prime number. It's not in any times table. Optimus. Optimus. Not Optimus Prime, sir, but close. It's robot car. Robot man. Robot lorry, sorry. Um, I think it's robo lorry. Uh, Autobots. Energize. Roll out. That's it. Well done. So 11 divided by 5. So I've got to think to myself, hmm, how many 5s in 11? Well, I'm going to grab myself my trusty 5s, and I'm going to have a little look at this. So let's have a look. I'm going from 0 to 11. I love number lines for maths. You know so what? can I just interrupt? Is it, an inter is it a good, valuable interruption? It is. I love it, it is. It is. It is. Today, this is called birthday. This is cool. Ooh. Ha. From year three. Happy birthday, Mrs. Cool. That is Should absolutely we sing? fantastic. Well, Happy for birthday. copyright reasons, we can't do the original one. There might be another version we, we could sing do. Happy day. Uh, happy, happy day. day. With a birthday for you. I think it's the tune, though, that is right. copywritten. Right. So if, could we change? How could we change the tune to Happy Birthday? Just sing it horribly out of key. All right, get up here. Right, Miss Core. After sing the first line horribly out of key. Okay, I think you need to, to you step need to away vary. while I sing. So okay, because it's to be safe. We need to vary stuff in here because it'll break copyright law. It's a very protected song. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Happy birthday to Mrs. Core. Happy birthday to Mrs. Cole. Happy birthday to Mrs. Cole. Happy birthday to Mrs. Cole. And many more. And many more. Lovely, that went well, didn't it? So, we need to find to ourselves how many fives are in 11. So I think, right, well, there's definitely one five in 11. That's gonna get me over to five. I can definitely pop another five to get into 11. That's gonna get me to 10. I can't have another five though, can I? I've got one left over. So look, I've got two fives and remainder Remainder one. I've got one left over. So when I have 11, imagine I have an extra finger. I would have a five, a five, and then there would be one little extra finger. There it is, left over. Yeah? There's a five there, a five there, and look, ooh, little finger left over. Okay. Sorry, sir, no interjection. It's another interjection. It right? is another interjection. I am so sorry. But no, I love I just it. had to because children, and and, well, not children, but maybe if children come back. We are at 4,026 pounds. Whoa! We have gone over 4,000 
pounds. That is incredible. That is incredible. I can't believe it. That is amazing. That is very good. I am so, so happy and tired. <laughs> I'm tired. And I'm happy. I'm happy. I will leave you to your lesson. I will not interject. Again. You're welcome to. Thank you so much, everyone. Wow, 4,000 pounds. Isn't that exciting? My goodness. That's a lot of devices. That's a lot of help to the community. Well done. It's you guys who have done it. Um, you know, it's easy for us to keep plugging to a camera, but it's, it's you guys who have done this. Right, 11 divided by 5, 2 remainder 1. Let's try that with another number, and um, we'll have a look at those remainders, and then we're going to have a look at remainders with much bigger numbers. So it's quite easy, really, these remainders. In fact, you can divide anything. We might look later on, well, we're going to look at fractions. So we're going to look at how that remainder is actually a fraction as well. We're going to do that in a bit. That's coming up. Oh, so many things to learn, sir. So much learning. So much learning. It's so much easier standing here teaching now than it is sitting over there. It really is. To start time, with. Time over here was so much slower yeah. than time over there. Can I say, this is what's happened as this thing has progressed. Earlier on, I was so grateful to sit down occasionally, and it was wonderful. You just have a bit of time out. Now it's horrible. Sitting over there is, is horrible. I mean, look. Look at what he looks like sitting over there. Look at that. Oh. Oh, it's not good. It's really much nicer over here. It's like there's a weird time vacuum. I don't understand it. Anyway, right, let's get back to this. Uh, let's pick a number. Let's have um, 14. 14 divided by 3. Okay, let's have a little look at this. So let's pick up Mithris. So. Let's have a look at what we can do with this. 14 divided by 3. Now, I could just immediately use my multiplication knowledge and think, what's the closest thing? Well, I know that four threes are 12. I'm just going to pop it on here so I know what that looks like. Three, 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 and three. I am very excited that we've gone over that number. That is fantastic, isn't it? Three, six, nine, 12. I can't squeeze another three on, okay? If I popped another three on, I'd be at 15, and that's no good, yeah? I'm stopped there. How much have I got left over? 12, 13, 14. Two little jumps, so it is four, remainder two. Four, remainder two. Okay, nice and simple, yeah? Let's look at this with some big numbers now, because if you get remainders in all sorts of numbers, let's go big. Go big or go home. That's right, isn't it, sir? Uh, yeah, and we have gone big, sir. We've I'm gone big. Very happy. And at some point, we're going to go home. Ah, uh, yes, that too. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> can't wait. Right, <laughs> what have we got? We've got forty-three. Oh, can you just imagine your bed? Oh, and, and the pillow. pillow. And you've you got a new Emma mattress, so do I. I, I am Emma not. No, we are, our room is in total disrepair. What's happened to Emma mattress? We have Emma some um, built-in cupboards removed right. from, the, uh, from the bedroom. Yeah. And we found out that the previous owners uh, didn't have a wall separating two of the bedrooms. Uh, and there was a big gap in between the roof. So we've your roof to, crumbled. We've had to have a new wall put in, and we've had to plaster everything. So you're not sleeping on an Emma mattress, no. no. <laughs> I am sleeping up in the attic on a really cheap pull-out uh, trundle bed. Well, look, if Emma mattress is listening and wants to donate me another Emma mattress, they are fantastic. Emma mattresses are fantastic. <laughs> they are great. I can't stop talking about Emma Simba slash Emma mattresses. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Focus, what's going on? Right, 43, uh, four, five, six, seven, divided uh, by, let's just go to three. Okay, let's have a look at this. Now we're gonna use the same system that we were doing earlier on. Zero to 43. I'm gonna chunk the things I know. I'm gonna do this one and then I'm gonna hand it over to you. No, there isn't, I thought there was a chunk down there. And then I'm gonna hand it over to you. So, here we go, 10. Did you think I was going to hand over to you? Because that, I'm just staying here as long as I can. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm pushing this. I'm good with that. Are you I'm, sure? I'm enjoying it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, three, I hate it over there. Three multiplied by 10 is 30. We are at 30 so far. What else can I do? I've done my 10s. I can't do another 10, not going to 60. Can I do a 5? No, that would get me to 45 too much. Can I do a 2? 
Yeah, I'm going to do a two. Two, uh, three multiplied by two. That gets me to 36. I'm doing the right thing here, aren't I? Yep, yeah, 36. Can I do another two? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, I can do. I'm going to do another two. Three multiplied by two would get me to 42. Uh oh. I can't do another three. I can't squeeze another three in. Those are the last two I could get in. If I put another three in there, I would be at 45, obviously. Um, so I've got remainders. How many remainders have got 42? Just one remainder. So there are 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. One, four, remainder one. 14, remainder one. Tell you what, I'm going to give you one to have a go at now that I modeled that. Well, we'll give you two. How about you have a go at two? See if you can now do it independently with remainders. And then we might start looking at fractions or the bus stop method. I don't know, something else. Um, can I have a number? Uh, what sort of number? Two digit, three digit, big, small? Surprise me. All right, 731. Whoa, I'm too surprised. Surprise me less than that. Okay, 730. No, wait, 731. 731. Come on, sir, you can do it. Right, seven, three, divided by one. <laughs> Let's so see nice. if we can do this. How many ones in 73? No? I'll change this then to a... Uh, Just keep the 73, yeah. A four, yeah? Yeah. All right. Right, I'm not going to big, we're, I told you, we're staying, we're down here, we're at level two, we're maybe moving a little bit into, and we're not quite into level three there. We might look at the bus up method and how we do big ones. In fact, I, remember that number, because I'm going to come back and I'm going to do it. I'm going to tackle it. What was the number you said to me? 731. Seven, we're going to tackle this number, because that was the challenge that Mr. G. Keeling, I was going to call Mr. Duncan, Mr. Keeling mm -hmm. set us. That was the challenge that Mr. Keeling set us, and that is the challenge that we will do, okay? But right now, we're going to have a go at this one. This is the one I'm leaving for you. Zero to 73. Chunk it up. I'm going to go for a wander around the table. Can you do it? You're at 5,000, though. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm back. Uh, if you've still not got it, pause the video now. Unpause. And let's have a look. So we have got, I'm going to do my chunks as I like to do. Right, let's see. We've got uh, four multiplied by 10. Gets me to 40. Okay, can I do another 10 lots of four? <gasps> no, I'd be at 80. I'd go just too far. Uh, okay, can I do... Five jumps of four. Yes, I certainly can. So let's have a look. We've got uh, four multiplied by five. That's 20. That gets me to 60. I'm at 60 now. Can I do another five jumps of four? That would get me to 80. No, I can't. Okay, can I do two jumps of four? I bet I can. Two jumps of four would be eight. Uh, oh, gosh. This is where I wish I'd learned my times tables better. Two jumps of four. Four multiplied by two gets me to 68. Can I do another two jumps of four? I don't think I can. I can only do one more jump of four. So let's do one more jump of four. One more jump of four. That's two jumps of four. One more jump of four gets me to 72. 72. One remainder to get to three. So I had 10, 15, 16, 17, 18. <laughs> 18 jumps, remainder one. 18, remainder one. Super. Are we giving them one more or are we done for that? I've noticed that you put on more voice at the time. Is <laughs> that what's happening? I'm, apparently I'm playing voices. You've been American. I've been American. A little bit of rolling the voice as well. Yeah. All right. Should we have a look at some fractions? I think it's about time that we took a look at some fractions. <laughs> well, that, John Snow. I'm leaving that one up there to have a look at later. Right, let's have a look at some fractions. Now, what are fractions? I hear you crying out. Well, maybe you don't cry this out if you're in year four, five, or six because you are 
traction masters. Actually, I've heard year well year four you you missed it didn't you because of lockdown. So let's say once again this basic stuff we're aiming at year three and four. Actually, I say that I've been teaching year five and six for the last two weeks, and uh, this is what we've been doing. So let's um, have a look at these. I'm going to have a few different chocolate bars. Um, it's happening, isn't it? Yeah. I'm going to have a few different chocolate bars now. Hmm. These chocolate bars have been divided into a, a chunk. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to make my chocolate bars up of similar size. These chocolate bars have been divided into chunks, okay? I could eat the whole chocolate bar, but think about your Kit Kat. Your Kit Kat you can snap up into individual pieces. So a fraction is an equal part of a whole. Okay, it is an equal part of a whole. In this chocolate, I have divided my chocolate into two pieces. Okay, I'm going to put a little line under each of these. And in this one, I've divided it into two pieces. In this particular chocolate bar, my chocolate bar has been divided into three pieces. In this particular chocolate bar, my chocolate has been divided into four pieces. This is the foundation of the fraction, is understanding how many pieces we can have to make a whole. Now, the second part of the fraction is what goes up at the top, and we're going to talk about what the names of these are. So I'm going to just shade in um, a part of each of these. Hmm. The number at the top, I'll tell you what it means in a second, is how many pieces of the whole I've got. Well, in this one, I have got one out of a possible two. Think of it like a test. How many did I get right? In this one, I've got one out of a possible three. In this one, I've got one out of a possible four. These are what the fractions are. What are these two numbers called? Well, we have at the top, we have the numerator. The numerator. And below, we have the denom denominator. Okay? I give these names. We, I like to have the nice numerator and the demon denominator. Nice numerator, why is it called a nice numerator? Well, the nice people sit up at the top in heaven, don't they? The nice numerator is always the top of the class, the person at the top. The demon denominator lives down below in the depths under the ground. Okay, down from hell comes the demon. So we have the demon denominator who lives deep down below. We have the nice numerator who lives up on the top. The denominator shows me how many pieces make my whole. The nice numerator is showing me how many pieces I've got. I'm just going to stick with that idea just now whilst we've got the shape. Obviously, when it comes to fractions of numbers, we'll talk about it in a slightly different way. So let's have a look. And I'm going to reshade. I'm going to rub out all of this. I'm just going to reshade this. Now, I've got a little bit of a different amount of this chocolate bar here in the middle. Hmm. How many pieces have I now got shaded? Well, the numerator is going to show me how many pieces I've got shaded. Has the denominator changed? Well, no. There was always three pieces to make the whole. Okay, that hasn't changed. The whole is three pieces. That's never going to change. It doesn't matter if I've got the whole thing, in which case I've got three out of three. And if you've got three out of three, you've got it all right. You've got the whole thing, yeah? Um, it doesn't matter if I've got, look, there we go. I've now got two out of three. That is two thirds. Or I've now got one third, yeah? The denominator isn't going to change. Tell you what, I'm going to do a little test for you. I'm going to put up some fractions. You're going to tell me what fraction I have got shaded. Remember, the nice numerator shows you what I've got shaded in this particular circumstance. The demon denominator is how many pieces I could have all together. We're going to change that as time goes on. So let's have a look. I'm going to do you four questions. I'm going to draw four shapes for you. And you are going to tell me what fractions I have got. So here is a shape. I'm going to have these ones like circles. I'm going to have these ones as uh, squares. And I'm going to shade in certain fractions of them. Uh, here we go. And that one there. And that one 
on there. And here we go. Shading in this much of this one. So this is A equals. I'm going to shade in this much of this one. That is B equals. I'm going to shade in that much of this one, which is C equals. And I'm going to shade in. Oh, I'm going to move this one nicely on to something else we'll talk about. I'm going to shade that much of that one. So what I'd like you to do, I'd like to tell me what fraction of each shape I have got. Easy. Two pizzas. Two pizzas. Three pieces of pizza. Three pieces. One piece of chocolate. Yes. Two pieces of chocolate. And I am done. Just like that. Get me the fraction written down. Go on. See if you can do it. You're great. Though. You're great. Have we got that karaoke sorted? Uh, no. <laughs> we'll just keep saying that. Right, here we go. A. Let's have a, a, a look at A. So, what have we got out of what? What out of what? So, let's have a look. We have got two out of three. The denominator shows me how many pieces I could have had to make the whole. The nice numerator showing me what I've actually got. Okay, that was nice and easy. Let's go for the next one. I would call that two thirds, by the way. This one, I have got one, two, three, out of four. Ah, three out of four, which we would call three quarters. This one is out of five. How many pieces out of five have I got? One out of five. I've got one out of five. One out of five. Excuse me. Uh, this last one here, how many pieces have I got? Two out of a possible four. I wonder if any of you know what fraction, what does it look like I've also got? I could call that two out of four. Actually, that's the same as a half. But I tell you what, I'm not going to go into equivalent fractions right now. This bit was quite easy, wasn't it? So what we're going to look at now is finding fractions of number. How are you doing over there, sir? Do you need a little bit of time in teaching? No, I'm good, sir. If you want to keep going, you can keep going. I will hop in, though, if you... I'm, no, I'm going to power on a little bit longer. I'm going to do some fractions of number, and then I will probably need to eat something. Yes, well, you just let me know, sir, and I will come on in. I'll go and have a, a Lucas aid, perhaps. Right, we're going to have a fraction of an amount. Right. Okay. I'd like to, but we're going to do, we're going to do some biology with that at some point. That'd be nice. Right. Uh, ah, simple. Let's have a look at a really basic one. Like I might say this, half of four. Well, I'm sure you know what half of four is straight away. You're screaming out to me, half of four is clearly two. But why is the question. Why is half of four two? Well, if I've got a half, let's picture what four looks like. Here it is. Okay, that's four. What have I done? Well, I have divided them into two equal pieces. So I have divided it into two equal pieces. Four divided by two is two. How many of those equal pieces do I have? I have one of those equal pieces. So one of these equal pieces, there it is, it equals two. Half of four is two. That's what it looks like. Let's try that again with another number, shall we? So let's try having, we're gonna stay easy for this, okay? We're gonna build it up. Let's try having a third of nine, a third of nine. Hmm, what is going on there? Interesting question. Well, let me draw nine so I can see what it looks like. Here we go. Nine beats. Nine, a third of it, I want to do nine divided by three. So I'm going to divide it into three equal chunks. We know that nine divided by three is three. Okay, we know that three, Mr. Keeling's going to the toilet. 
We know that nine divided by three is three. How many of those threes do I have? I've only got one of them. So there it is. So a third of nine equals three. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Let's level it up a little bit, shall we? What if I had, no, I'm gonna test you. That's what I'm gonna do. Let's see if you've got this first. You're gonna have a little go at doing this. So before I go a little bit more complicated, I'm gonna pop some questions down on the board for you to have a little go at at home. Okay, so let's have um, A, B, C, D, and for each of these, you're going to find some simple fractions of an amount. So we have got um, a quarter of 12, and a fifth of 10, uh, ooh, uh, a sixth of, uh, yeah, 60. It's not as hard, not that hard. And uh, let's have um, a tenth of 100. Okay, simple questions for you. I bet it won't take you long. I'm just going to walk all the way around the table. By the time I'm back, you are going to have the answers to each of those questions for me. Off I go wandering. Wonder, 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 wonder. Wandering around the table. Here I go. And I'm back. Hello, everybody. I'm back. So let's have a look and let's see how we did with these numbers. So a quarter of 12. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do 12. Well, I need to divide it into four equal chunks, yeah? Because a quarter is dividing into four equal chunks. How many of the quarters do I have? I've only got one. So I'm going to do 12 divided by four equals three. Simple. 10 divided by five, how many fives in 10 equals two. Uh, a sixth of 60, 60 divided by six is 10. A tenth of 100, 100 divided by 10 is a 10. I've got quite a lot of tens there, haven't I? Okay, that bit, nice and easy. Now, I said we're gonna level this up a little bit and that is exactly what we're going to do. Now, just slowly rub all of this out. Rub, rub, rub. There we go. There we go. So, third of nine is three. I want to stick with this one, but I'm going to ask a slightly different question. I'm going to say, what is two thirds of nine? What are two thirds of nine? Now, I worked out what one third of nine was because I took nine and I divided it into three equal chunks. I knew that one third was three. So if I've got two of those thirds, hmm, how much do I have? Well, let's have a little look at what it looks like. Here is my nine. There is a three, three, and three. I've divided it into three equal chunks. Now, one third is, well, each of these actually is a third, isn't it? I've got one third. No, I've got two thirds. Let me shade all these in. This is what I have got. Two thirds. And you can see I have, that means the answer is six. What I did was I did nine divided by three to get my thirds. Then I multiplied it by the denominator. Three times two equals six. And you can see quite clearly what that looks like. Should we try that again with a slightly different number? Let's do, what am I looking for? A rubber. Here we go. Let's clear these ones out of the way. Uh, let's rub some of this stuff off. How are we doing for time? We still have so, so much time left to go. It's not even one o'clock. We don't stop for another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours. Wowzers. Okay, right. What have we got now? Uh, we're going to try some other fractions, aren't we? What am I going to try? Uh, slowly gone out of my brain what we were doing. I know what we're doing. Right. Uh, let's take, for example, 
16. Uh, we're going to do uh, three quarters of 12. I'm going to make it nice and easy to start with so that we get the gist of it. Three quarters of 12. So first thing I need to do, oh, do you know what? That's quite, quite easy. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to do it. Right? It doesn't matter if we're doing easy ones. We're doing this to get the idea of it, aren't we? So we've got three quarters of 12. What do we need to do? Well, 12 divided by four is three. Let's have a look at what it looks like. I'm still using the threes here. I'm keeping these numbers nice and easy, aren't I? So three quarters of 12 is three. And let's just check what that looks like. Let me put it onto the board. Almost there. There we go. So here is um, my chocolate bar. You know, you see I've now divided it into quarters. There is one quarter, that's another quarter, that's another quarter, that is another one out of four pieces. Yeah? So one quarter equals three. If one quarter equals three, now I have how many quarters? I've got three of them. Let's just show you what I've got. I've got... this much of the chocolate bar, I have got three quarters of it. So you can quite easily see here, one quarter is three, I've got three lots of three. So I've multiplied that by three, one quarter is three, two quarters would be six, three quarters must be nine, okay? So what I did, if I was just to turn this into a, a basic calculation rather than properly understanding it, I did, Divide by the denominator, I did 12, divided by 4, which equals 3, and then I times that by the numerator, times by 3 equals 9. So I divided by the denominator, I times by the numerator, DDTN. I sometimes remind myself of DDTN, divide by denominator, times by numerator. It helps me sometimes with these. Let me do one more, and then I'm going to leave it for you to have a little go. Let's um, rub this out. Let's do uh, some fifths of something, shall we? Let's get rid of these numbers. Let's still keep it nice and simple. In fact, maybe you can, maybe you've got it at this point, and you could have a little go at this for me. So I'm going to do one fifth of 25. One fifth of 25. In fact, not one fifth, that's easy, isn't it? Three fifths of 25. Three fifths of 25. Could you have a little go at thinking about what three fifths of 25 is? So remember, the first thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to find out what one fifth is, and then how many one fifths do I have? Well, I've got three of them, okay? I'm going to do a little circuit of the table. Hello, Miss Keely, nice to have you back. How are you doing? Yes. Swell. Swell. Okay, you might have done it by now. If not, press the pause button and then you can have another go. So let's have a look. What have we got? 25. What is one fifth of 25? Well, I'm going to go 25 divided by 5. 25 divided by 5 equals 5. So one fifth equals five, but I don't have one fifth, I've got three fifths. So I need to multiply this by three, which gets me to 15, because if one fifth is five, two fifths will be 10, three fifths must be 15. Happy with that? He doesn't even know. I just said so, we had a little, I was just having a little uh, conversation. <laughs> So I'm having a little conversation with myself. I think, I think you need uh, maybe a coffee. Somewhere. I was having a conversation with myself, and I realised we've got eight hours left. Yes, we've almost done two thirds. Anyway, good. All right, I'll let you. I'll let you do some stuff now. Yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to carry on with my adventure story. Brilliant! Can't wait. Adventure time. Hello everyone, we are still here. It is quarter to one in the morning. Things are getting interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's keep going. 
Robert Frost. I always think of uh, I always think of Robert Frost, the poet. Whenever I'm doing something, whether it's a long piece of work uh, at uni, whether it's lots of admin work at school, I always think of Robert Frost. Um, stopping in a snowy woods one winter evening. I think that's the name of the poem. There's a line at the end um, where he says, and I have promises to keep. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and many miles before I sleep and many miles before I sleep. And that's, that's kind of how I approach everything that I do. Everything. everything I always think I always whenever something's hard whenever something's long whenever something is going to take a lot of work I always think of that poem uh, and for some reason even though you know we have miles to go it actually spears me on that oh, poem spears me on so anyway uh, poetry that's Mr Jordan's I will leave it there we are going to go into the adventure story and if you remember earlier buried under this mountain of paper work so seriously you need to clean your room uh <laughs> is my story prompts now we did earlier we did two paragraphs there's still four paragraphs to do but i think i think we can kind of get through them in the next hour or so so the first paragraph we did it was a character description we focused on the warrior princess today uh, and we talked about the appearance, we talked about the personality, and we talked about the character's likes and dislikes. So much more you could delve into within that, but that's what we focused on. We kind of did it surface level. You can spend more time really flushing out those ideas. That was paragraph one. Paragraph two was your setting description. In your setting description, you paired positional language with sentences, uh, sense, sentences, sorry, senses. You paired positional language with your senses to come up with really good sentences describing the scene. Then we are now gonna move on to paragraph three. We've established a character. We've established where the character is. But the problem is the character lives in a really beautiful castle. It's very safe, it's protected. We need to get that character out of there. And so we go on to the where next and why. We have to take our character away from the safe location and we need to move them to somewhere where something interesting or dangerous can happen. That's what this paragraph is for. And it's gonna use some features. The first one, we did it with the initial uh, paragraph. We did it as a start. We used this pathetic fallacy. I'm gonna pop that back on the board there. We are gonna use pathetic fallacy. We are also going to use, I don't know if I have the lens with me. I don't believe I do. In fact, I know I don't, but we are going to use, and I'll just write the word up, we are going to use We're going to use onomatopoeia, and we are going to use onomatopoeia in conjunction with the pathetic fallacy to create a soundscape for the change in mood. Um, okay, and we are going to use one Last feature, and I don't think I brought this one in as well. No, I did not, but I will write up the word again. We are going to use a list sentence. Now, the list sentence is going to be the final part of this paragraph, and it's going to make up the action that leads the character from one place to another. Lots of stories describe the journey. If you read uh, The Hobbit, um, or Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, he he was actually uh, he actually lived in Birmingham as a child. That'll come up a little bit later, actually, because um, we're going to have a quiz. 
uh, is kind of a family quiz. So you can do parents versus children or brothers versus sisters. I'm going to show you some questions. A lot of them we've actually covered today. So if you've been watching the live stream for a good amount of time, you should know quite a few of these answers. So you can use this live stream to help you with the quiz. And when we put the quiz up, what we'll do is I will introduce each round. We'll go over each question. And then I'll give you five minutes on each slide where I'm just silent, have a nice little five minute rest. Uh, and you can try and answer them. I'll go through the answers at the end. But back to this, you can describe the journey, like I said, like, like in Lord of the Rings, most of Lord of the Rings is actually describing the journey. Um, but we're not gonna we're not gonna dwell. We're not gonna dwell on the journey. We are gonna take them from point A to point B and put the character in danger. We only want this to be a short story, it's only gonna be a few paragraphs, so we don't have the luxury of describing the journey, which could be amazing. Lots of things could happen along the journey, but it's not gonna happen on our journey. Instead, we are gonna get them from point A to point B. And I have some prompts here to show us how the character gets from the kingdom to somewhere dangerous. What do you think might happen? Well, up here we have an envelope. Obviously, the character is going to receive a letter. What's the letter going to detail? Well, it's going to detail a treasure. Where is the treasure? The dangerous location, a dark, deep cavern in the center of the forest. We need to use our lenses to get the character there. Pathetic fallacy then, we've got to shift the mood. It was bright, it was nice, it was sunny. It's gonna change. It's not gonna be terrible because our character isn't in danger yet, but we are going to shift the mood. We're going to use that pathetic fallacy to shift the mood. And I'm going to start with that. So here we go. What weather? What weather? It could be stormy, stormy, rainy. Uh, it could be, oh, there could be dark clouds. A Aggressive and sorry, aggressive wind. Something is changing, but it's not disastrous. So I'm not going to go full on dark storm just yet. I'm going to say on the horizon, on the horizon, sometime later on the horizon. We need to move time on as well. That's what I'm going to say. Sometime later. Dark clouds gathered on the Horizon. Brilliant. Okay. From here, use my pathetic fallacy. I'm going to use my onomatopoeia. So I'm going to think of words that those clouds, those dark clouds on the horizon could be making, could be forewarning our character. Rumbling, grumbling, roaring. Rumbling, grumbling, and roaring, the storm waited. And there we've used the weather, we've used onomatopoeia to tell the reader that something bad is coming, something negative is going to happen in our story. 
It's a forewarning, it's an indication of something that is yet to come, and it will be coming as we move the story along. Now, we are going to use our photo prompts. Go back to the character. We haven't given her a name. Let's say Princess. We had Mandy earlier, didn't we? Princess Mandy. Was, what was she doing? What did she like? Let's think, what did she like earlier? Was playing chess. Was playing chess. In her palace. When a letter was posted beneath using beneath using our position uh, position beneath the door. Lovely. Okay. Posted beneath the door. Moving on to our second prompt here, we have the treasure, so we're gonna build a sentence around that. Gonna keep it simple. The letter detailed a treasure. I'm gonna say where, where was the treasure? The treasure was in a cave in the middle of the forest. Using position again. The letter detailed A treasure hidden in a large adjective cavern at the center of the forest. Okay, and then this is where we change pace. We go into action here. I didn't put action up, but maybe I should have, but it's part of the list sentence. We are gonna make a list sentence. It's just like a list, a normal list, like a shopping list or something like that, but we are gonna make a list sentence. The list sentence will be a list of actions. So, the princess is gonna get something. She's gonna get on something to travel and she's going to arrive at the cave. That is gonna be our journey. We're gonna do our entire journey in one sentence. And the way to do it is we are going to do a list of actions. Now you can come up with your own actions. It doesn't really matter what the actions are as long as it moves the story on. I'm gonna say that the princess grabbed her suit of armor. That's the first action, comma, after the first action in the list. Got on her mighty steed, second action, mode of transport, and between the second action and the last action, traveled to the cavern. Okay, so let's add that to our paragraph. The princess grabbed the action, her armor, got on a mighty steed and rode to the cave. Now, to finish this paragraph, I'm gonna add one little bit more. And it's going to be an indication of what comes next. The next paragraph is going to be the problem. And to do that, we're going to use what we looked at earlier, which was suspense. I'm going to introduce a little bit of suspense right at the very end of here. She entered. Two words, short sentence, slowing the reader down. 
So we've used pathetic fallacy. We've used onomatopoeia. We've detailed how the princess or the reason why, why, why the princess wanted to leave the safe castle. We've added a list sentence to move the story on. Lists of actions move the story on. It's the opposite of description, which slows the story down. A list of action pushes the story along, it's quicker. And then I finished with an indication right at the end of my paragraph what the next paragraph is going to be about. If you're writing your own, I want you to try a version of this. Pause the video right here if you're watching after this is live and try and draft your own paragraph. You can change these. It can be a different reason. Perhaps a stranger comes to the princess's door on a stormy, rainy night. She opens it and the stranger tells her of a prince that is trapped somewhere in a high tower or something like that. And then she goes off to save the prince. Different, but still following that same structure of using pathetic fallacy, the weather, to set the mood. Onomatopoeia, describing the sounds in the weather, telling me where she's going to go why she's going to go and then finishing the whole thing with a list of actions to move the journey along because we are doing a short story as i've said we do not want to describe the journey too much i've done it in one sentence and we are there i'm going to rub this off and then we are going to look at our next paragraph suspense my favorite my favorite kind of writing <laughs> wow you wrote a lot of stuff there thanks Ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing, sir? You're looking quite tired over there. Well, you seem to be doing better than me, I've got to say. Oh, I don't know about that. I think I've taken more steps today than I've taken in a day for a long <laughs> time, and my legs are absolutely <laughs> aching. You've been on the caffeine, too. I have had some caffeine, yes, that is correct. Mind mm -hmm. you, so have you, sir. I've only had it where you're look, this is still pretty much completely full. Oh, really? Yeah. You should drink a little bit more caffeine. I'm a bit worried. I don't know if, I don't know if it works with me. <laughs> okay. Right. Let's go on to suspense. And I'm going to give you a minute. Can you remember? Can you make your own list before I make mine? What skills can we use in suspense? I'll give you a minute. I'll do the kind of walk around the table and then I'll come back and I'll put the list on. Lovely. The walk. Here it goes. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. It's not time for a musical interlude, sir. This is karate. This is this is music this. Right. Okay. Suspense from earlier. We want some short sentences. We want an ellipsis. Just the one mind. We don't want to overload it with ellipsis. Short sentences. Ellipsis. We don't tell. Not straight away. We don't say what the thing is, but we give clues. I'm gonna keep it about to that, but I'm gonna do a switch in this. We're gonna change pace. And then we're gonna swap over to action. This is the problem. So far, we've met our princess, Princess Mandy. We've talked a little bit about her. We've established her home, her setting, her castle. We've taken her from that safety. We've moved her to the spooky, large cavern. And now she's entered. In this cavern, there is a treasure, but it's guarded by this.
That is what she is confronted by in the cave, in the cavern. But we're not going to say it right away. We're going to build up to that. The last paragraph, she entered. Let's describe that cavern. Description keeps the reader waiting. Putrid and thick, starting with adjectives, comma, putrid and thick, the air stung Mandy's throat. stop. Short sentence time. You can come up with your own. There was movement. More. A subtle movement. A little more. A movement at the back of the cavern. I'm not giving it all away straight away. I'm building up piece by piece and keeping the reader waiting. Putrid and thick, the air stung Mandy's throat. There was a movement, a subtle movement, a movement at the back of the cavern. And I've used a little bit of the repetition lens in those three sentences. Okay, I'm gonna do some don't tell. Something watched. It was waiting bravely she moved towards it it and something never what it is not yet not yet. In a moment, we're going to do this. We're going to change it. We're going to use pace and we're going to use action. But first, I'm going to give my reader some clues. One large. It's a better word than large, sir. Giant, enormous. Enormous. One enormous. Reptilian eye. Haven't said what it is, but we now know it's a reptile or like a reptile. One large reptilian eye. Harsh. Scaly. Skin. Ferocious. Breath of fire. Okay, we're giving it away now. It was a capital letters dragon. Whoa. Wow, we are now changing pace. It is dragon. We are going fast. We were slow. Now we are going to go fast. It lurched forward. We can do a list sentence again if we want to move it along. All these pens are running out, so do we have any more? I'm going to have to go for the red. If that go okay, so it lurched forward.
It grasped. Poor Mandy's leg and tossed her into the air. Right. Okay, so we changed pace. Slow, 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 slow. Not telling, not telling, not telling. I told you, now we change pace. We go into a list sentence, three actions all together, putting Mandy into extreme danger. And then what do we do? Right at the end, we make the reader wait. Thank you, sir. We make the reader wait using our ellipsis. It to and tossed, sorry, ED, tossed her into the air as she fell towards its jaws. She closed. her eyes and took a final breath. Dot, dot, dot. What a place to leave the reader. And we're gonna leave them there a little while. We're not gonna go straight into it in the next paragraph either. Let's quickly go through it, talk about the features, then I want you to pause. I want you to try your own. Putrid and thick. Good describing words. Comma, starting with the adjective. The air stung Mandy's throat. There was movement, short sentence. A subtle movement, short sentence. A movement at the back of the cavern. Repetition, positional language. Something watched. Short sentence, something not telling. It was waiting, short sentence, it not telling. Bravely, she moved, don't forget the past tense, sir. She moved towards it. Full stop. She's putting herself in further danger, building the tension. Clues. One enormous reptilian eye. Harsh, scaly skin, starting with adjectives. Ferocious breath of fire, full stop. It was a capital letter, scream it out, dragon. Change the pace, fast now. It lurched forward, it grasped. Poor Mandy's leg and tossed her into the air. Slow back down. As she fell towards its jaws, she closed her eyes and took a final breath. Dot, dot, dot. Leave the reader waiting. Pause the video. Give it a go yourself. Do different actions in the list sentence. Describe it in a different way. Give different clues. Come up with different adjectives. Or use the features. Short sentences, ellipsis, don't tell, but give clues. Pace, a change, a list sentence full of actions, and then a final sentence that leaves the reader waiting with that ellipsis that I mentioned earlier. And that will be your problem paragraph. Wow, we are zooming through. We have done four paragraphs of our six paragraph story. The next paragraph we are going to look at is the resolution paragraph. This is how 
problem got solved. But like I said, we don't want to dive straight back into where we left the other paragraph. We want to let the reader wait. So I'm going to use the word. Meanwhile, I'm going to use the word meanwhile. Meanwhile means what? You can remember? What does meanwhile mean? Have you got it? Meanwhile means that something is happening at the same time. So meanwhile, in the forest, beside the cave, position. Right, I am not going to give you any more pictures now. I want you to make up your own character at this point. Who do you want your hero to be? It can be anything. It can be a unicorn with magical powers. It can be a fairy. It could be a prince. It could be a king. It could be a queen. It could be a knight. It could be a soldier. It could be lots of different things. Who is going to be the hero of your story? It might be a chipmunk. Yeah? I'm going to go with fairy. Yeah. So meanwhile, in the forest, beside the cave, meanwhile, in the forest, beside the cave, a small yet powerful. I like it. Fear was out gathering berries. Okay, let's uh, tear down that sentence a little bit. We start with meanwhile. This is to introduce a character that is nearby. Meanwhile, where? In the forest beside the cave. I've given position, I've showed you where this fairy is. A small yet powerful, there's my description, adjectives. I need to describe the character, although I'm gonna do it far less than I described the main character. I'm just giving you a couple of adjectives. Small yet powerful fairy, that's who it is. And then I, give the, I gave them a reason for being there. It was out gathering berries. Now yours can change. You know, meanwhile, out in the woods, there was a powerful unicorn, there was a magical unicorn, there was a wonderful unicorn um, eating grass. Uh, meanwhile, out in the forest, there was a brave knight returning from war. Yeah. Meanwhile, out in the forest, there was a king who had become lost from the royal party. It, it's up to you. Yeah. But you've got to introduce a hero character. They've got to be near the cave. And you start with meanwhile. Pace. Suddenly, the fairy heard an almighty scream. There must be something now that grabs that fairy, that unicorn, that king, that queen, that knight's attention. I've done sound, yeah? Scream, could be a shout, could be something else. Pace word, I've used suddenly, you could use all of a sudden, without warning, in an instant, in the next moment, up to you. Suddenly, the fairy heard an almighty scream. Right, we're gonna do some more action. She rushed towards the cave, cavern, comma, drew her wand and pointed it. the dragon. This sentence gets a lot of action into one sentence. 
Next. Conjuring. So starting with a verb here, conjuring a conjuring her greatest magic. She banish. The dragon just in time. So there, that sentence adding on from the list of the actions saves the man, uh, saves the princess Mandy. And then we just add to finish this off a safety sentence saying that she's been saved. So we say Mandy, very simple, was saved and done let me just quickly go back through this the features that i've used then you can pause the video and you can give it a go let's have a look meanwhile in the forest beside the caves there i've used meanwhile i've used position and now i've introduced now i'm introducing the uh, hero character the person that saves our main protagonist a small yet powerful adjectives the fairy was out gathering berries. I need to say why they are there, explain it. Suddenly, changing the pace, the third fairy heard an almighty scream. That's the reason for going to the cavern. She needs a reason to go there. She rushed towards the cavern, drew her wand and pointed it at the dragon. A list of actions. Your actions don't have to be the same. If it's a knight, they're not going to draw their wand. Three actions together. Then we need the saviour sentence, the sentence that saves the princess, conjuring her greatest magic. She banished the dragon just in time. You could say something about the knight charging at the dragon, knocking him to the side, and the princess landing safely. Then I finished it off. Mandy was saved. Okay. If you aren't watching live, pause the video now. Give the resolution a go. Not too bad, sir. We are getting on to our last paragraph. I don't think it's going to be too long on that. All right, you just tell me how to step up. It's amazing, isn't it? 3,221 views. Is that how many we've had? Yeah, for the first part. That is amazing. In just one day. In just one day. Oh That's gosh, it doesn't have copyright claim in it. Huh? It does. It does. It did. That's it. Right, final paragraph. And this one I'm going to leave mainly to you. It's the ending. And there are four endings or four types of ending you can choose. There's the standard. You could go for that happy ending. But if you do go for the happy ending, I don't just want, they lived happily ever after. I want something good to happen. I want the fairy to magically transport them back to the palace. I want a party and I want it fully described. Like the same description, position, balloons, colors, shapes, everything described. I want a really good description at the end if you're going for this happy ending. Or you could choose the sad ending. Something between the cavern and getting home happens. Something bad to the fairy, something bad to Mandy, or something bad when they arrive back. And again, I want lots of description on that. She gets home to the castle, and oh no, it was a trick to get her away. The castle has been invaded. Yeah? Describe feelings. What does the castle look like now? Who's invaded? What is going to happen?
On that note, you could do a cliffhanger ending. Cliffhanger endings are where you do not tell the reader how it ends. You leave them guessing. You leave them imagining. So maybe she does go home. Maybe it was a trap. Maybe her kingdom was invaded. Maybe an arrow is fired towards the princess. And maybe at that point, you put an ellipsis. It's up to the reader. Leave it on a cliffhanger. Don't tell them what happens. Finally, and one of my favorite types of ending, twist. Something happens that you didn't expect to happen. For example, in my story, Mandy says to the fairy, thank you so much for saving me. There was a dark glimmer in the fairy's eye. Oh, my dear. I wasn't saving you. I just didn't want the dragon to have you all to himself. <laughs> Fairy was evil, that's the twist. Wasn't saving, was gonna eat the princess or attack the princess or turn the princess into a frog. Who knows? Twist ending, didn't expect it, it happens. Those are your four types of ending it is up to you to add it. That is the end of our story session. We haven't had, obviously, the feedback from the children in this because we haven't got the live chat because it is currently half past one in the morning. It is half past one in the morning, so we haven't had the feedback, but hopefully you can take some of my ideas, change them, add your own language, build them, make it into an interesting story. And then if you do, please, 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 please send that story to y3 at anglesey.behan.school.uk, the usual email address. You can send it to year two as well if you want. That, that's, that will come directly to me or just send it to year three. When you finish the story, we would love to read it. We would love to have loads of work from this teacher-thon that we can kind of show to everyone on future videos and future streams. Thank you. Try your best. Come up with a really good ending. The ending is the last thing that a reader reads, and it's the thing that sticks with them. If there isn't a good ending, you haven't got a good story. I loved it. I loved it. every moment of that. It was gripping, from beginning to end. I felt like I went on an emotional roller coaster throughout that journey. Spence, such a fantastic and important way of writing a story. Now, why on earth we have 12 viewers at 1.30 in the morning? I do not know, but lovely to see you all here. So the question is now, what's it going to be? Now, there's a few things I know we've got in the back burner that we're going to be doing at some point. Uh, I did say I was going to teach Mr. Keeling some art. Yay! Do you want to do that now? No. Okay, we're not doing that now. I'm not really an artist, so I don't know. We kind of need... Uh, an art teacher for that. Um, I did say we were going to do a little bit of biology. So I think that's actually the thing that we're going to look at next. We're going to look at the different organs in the body. And we're going to think about what the different organs do and um, what goes on in the body. Uh, I had a science teacher called Dr. Organ. Dr. Organ. He taught physics. I love it. Not biology. No, that's frustrating. Mm. Mm. Well, interesting. Dr. Organ. There we go. Um, what else have we got to do at some point? At some point, we're going to look at money and have a little debate about that and look at taxes. We've got our drama games. Okay. We've got our drama games. My goodness. Wowzers. Quiz coming up. Quiz coming up. What are, you, what are we going to leave for the kind of last hour? So what's the big, what's the biggie? What are we, what's that blowout? When the kids are back at eight o'clock. What are we going to do there? Yeah. What's the big, what's the big? That ba, 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 ba. is the ask me anything hour. I love Ask Me Anything Hour. Okay, so the last hour, hour, we are going to do an hour of Ask Us Anything. 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 Ask Us Anything.
anything. I've got to say, try to teach it. That space time when they were asking questions, what was the question we had? Do all black holes have a singularity? Yes. I mean, you guys come up with fantastic questions. Um, I'm really excited to hear them all. So what are we going to do now? It's going to be some biology. We're going to have a little look at the, I'm starting to see that when I close my eyes, I have a sort of like a layer of something going on. Right. Um, biology. We're going to start looking at the human body. Um, that's what we're going to have a little look at. I'm going to rub some of this stuff out. Biology is, of course, um, a science, and it is generally to do with kind of living things, I guess, understanding living things. Oh, I was going to do a whole thing on climate change later. That's coming up. How exciting. Whole thing on climate change, the greenhouse effect. Oh, so much to stay up for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't forget, sir. I am gonna, I am gonna read out, read out five mental maths tests in a row, <laughs> back to back, back to back. Five mental maths mental math tests. Wowzers! Can you get if you any more fun? If you were about to switch off and think this is time to go to sleep, hang on in there because five mental maths tests in a row are coming up from key stage one level right to year seven. To year seven. To year seven. Wow, pushing the boat out there. I like that, sir. Very exciting. Well, guess what? I'm going to do the whole human body. How about that? Okay. Right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is a human body. Um, these are all the different organs. Now, organs, interesting. This is one of the key words because this is going to be all about different organs. Oh, I'd love a cup of tea. I'd love a cup of tea. Oh, uh, yeah, great. Also, do you want to pop that can of that you gave me back into the fridge? Because I, I don't want it to get all kind of warm. Um, how would you like it to? I like it strong and milky without any sugar. Okay. Very exciting. I'm getting a cup of tea made for me. How adventurous. Organs! Right. Now, we are not talking about the things that you find in a church. We're going to talk about churches. We're going to learn a little bit about Christianity and Islam later on. I'm very excited about that. No, organs, they are mm, interesting groups of sort of cells that work together for a common cause. Now, what am I talking about with a cell? I'll tell you what, let's take a little step back. Your body is actually made up of loads of individual uh, cells. These little things that are all stuck uh, together, okay? And all of your cells kind of work together for uh, a common good. If you were to zoom in and in and in and in and in on your skin, you would see that it is not one smooth, solid sheet. It is actually made up of all these little individual cells. In fact, not just your skin, every single part of your body. But I'm just going to focus on the skin right now. Your skin is, I guess, technically the biggest organ. It's one large uh, mass of cells that do a function, the skin is all around your body and it's there. I guess the purpose of the skin is to keep everything in really, isn't it? It's this protective layer, this barrier that you have all around your body. If we were to zoom in, it's made of layer upon layer of these little cells. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically your body is made of these little things that work together and combine to do a function. You have so much going on inside your body. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much uh, depth, but we will have a look at some of the things. Can you believe it? You've got little fighting armies inside your body, things that do all sorts of incredible roles. We're going to have a look at those as we go on. But the skin is a kind of a barrier around your body. Out of your skin, you have hairs uh, that grow underneath your skin. Of course, you have your blood that is flowing all over the place. And this is, I'm sort of doing a cross section of skin here, not fantastically. Your skin acts as a barrier. Of course, what things might it want to protect? Well, it stops water from permeating through your body. Your skin does have little pores. They do let certain amounts of water in and out. Of course, you do sweat and stuff. But your skin is a barrier from water. It is a barrier, of course, from nasty uh, things, uh, viruses and bacteria that's floating all around the air. Your skin protects you quite well from that. Obviously, as we found out with COVID, one of the things that is not protecting us very well are the places where our skin uh, doesn't protect us so well. So for example, where there are holes that go into our body. So through my mouth, obviously, 
My skin doesn't protect over my mouth. And once inside my body, a virus can spread up my nose into my eye. Of course, there is a liquidy area that can swell around behind. I guess I kind of have a hole in my ear where I could get an infection. But as we learned earlier on, there is inside your ear uh, an eardrum and one of the smallest bones in your body. But we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So your skin generally is a, a big organ that stretches all around your body to protect you, okay? You need to look after your skin. Your skin is really important. If, like me, you have a light, fair colored skin, then it's very easy to burn under the sun. Um, it's very good at absorbing vitamin D, uh, but it does burn very quickly. If you have a darker pigmentation skin, well, you might not burn so easy, but you might not be absorbing as much vitamin D. You need to make sure you keep up on those vitamin D supplements, especially when you're in a country like Britain and the winter when we don't get lots of sun. Really important. Vitamin D is vital for your skin, healthy for your body. Um, you normally absorb it through the sun, but uh, depending on your skin pigmentation, you might have more or less uh, vitamin D absorption. So the skin is this outer barrier that keeps us protected. It's actually quite amazing because these cells are regenerative too. They are able to defend themselves. Here, I'm showing my skin. And you know what? I've had a, a nasty uh, cut in the outside of my skin. Here is my body and I've sliced it open. Okay, here, so I'm just gonna, this is like my, my arm, okay? And I've had a little cut in my skin. Well, you will notice when you get a little cut in your skin, so look, here's normally what my skin would look like on my arm. I've cut myself. I've got a little bit of a graze in my arm. Well, what happens? Well, you know one of the first things that happen is your blood starts to fill that little hole, doesn't it? You might bleed quite a lot, or you might end with a kind of globule of blood that fills that area. You might think to yourself, oh no, I'm losing blood, but this is all part of your body's natural defenses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a lot bigger so I can look at this. So your skin is, uh, and the blood, if you've had an injury, work to protect themselves. So let's have a look in a much bigger version of it. Here we go. I've got a little uh, cut into my skin. And as you know, this blood will come up and maybe floor, uh, form a blob. Well, inside your blood, you're seeing red because mostly, and we'll look at these again later on, we're looking at these little things which are known as your red uh, blood cells. That's it from the side, that's it from the top. And red blood cells, well, they're like the uh, trucks that channel around your body, transporting oxygen from one place to another. You also have things called white blood cells, which are quite amazing, and hopefully I'm going to show you a little video of some white blood cells, if you can remember, but don't forget. But you've also got something in there, these things which are little uh, platelets. Now, when you bleed, the platelets come along here and they form a solid over the top of this globule, really quite incredible. This is what we know as a scab. Scabs, you felt them, they are hard, they are amazing. Don't pick your scabs, let them naturally fall off because a scab is like a protective layer that comes over an injury. And what it does is it blocks off, making sure that no nasty little viruses or bacteria can come and fight into there. It stops bacteria from growing and escaping in. It's like a big dome that is covering the injury. And inside your body, those little things I was showing you uh, earlier, these little cells, they are able to regrow. And they do, they regrow, and they regrow from the bottom, and eventually they solve your problem. And the scab will naturally fall off. Now, if it was a bad, injury, you might notice for a little bit that the skin might not look as great as possible, okay? If you kept cut putting your scab off and you didn't let it heal properly, you might be left with a scar. But nevertheless, your skin is very good at fixing itself. So the skin, number one, a big protective layer around your body. It is able to rebuild, regenerate. Your skin is actually constantly falling off. It moves in these layers, your outer layer of skin, all little bits of dead skin fall off you. You often see it coming off your hair and all over the place.
but your skin is always reforming, regrowing. If you burn your finger, well, it'll hurt, but eventually it will grow out and your skin is absolutely amazing at regenerating. So, one of the first organs I think to talk about, and I think it'd be fair to call it an organ, is your skin. So, let's go in and have a look at another organ. And I think we shall, ooh, let's start from the top. Now, we've got a, a skeletal structure here. Now, the skeleton, I don't know, and I don't think the skeleton counts as um, an organ. Let me bring uh, Fred in to see you. Here he is. Your body has a full, I'm going to take this sweetie out of his mouth. He's very greedy, very greedy boy. Your body has this full skeleton all inside it. The skeleton is, thank you so much for that cup of tea, sir. The skeleton is the frame around which you are built. So if it wasn't for the skeleton, you would basically be this kind of jelly on the floor because your skin can't just hold itself up in one place. All of your organs would become mesh, mush, and the skeleton is this kind of cage around which you are built. Um, so if you think about like a, a, a bit of a tent that you put up, when you put up a tent, I don't know if many of you have been camping, but inside the tent, you often have a kind of frame uh, it probably goes both ways like this. And then over the frame, you have a sheet. But the frame is what keeps the shape and the sturdiness of the tent. Okay? Well, you, your skeleton is a lot like that. It is what keeps the shape and the sturdiness of a body. It's what allows you to stand up and to stay solid. Okay? You might be asking yourself, well, what is it that allows us to move about? Well, let's say... Here is my, I'm going to draw, uh, this is my, uh, I'm not very good at drawing these, but this is going to be my arm, okay? So here is my arm, up here are going to be all my fingers and things. Mm. What is it that allows my arm to move? Well, you have along your arm these other fantastic things in your body that are known as uh, muscles. Um, and here they are attached to different parts, got different muscles all over attached. These muscles are amazing. They can contract and release, and they are able to bring up different parts. In fact, your skeleton doesn't have any inherent power itself. All the power for the skeleton comes from the muscles that surround it. So this on its own wouldn't be able to do anything, but attached to it would be a muscle. The muscle squeezes in, releases, yeah, squeeze, squeeze. Every little bit of you is controlled by the flow of your muscles. It's quite amazing the things you can do down to the intricate kind of maneuvers in your finger, the moving of my mouth. Everything is being controlled by muscles. Muscles are really important. To grow your muscles, what you need is protein. Believe it or not, you've eaten muscles, not human muscles, but if you are assuming you're not a vegetarian, when you eat meat, when you're eating steak, you're eating an animal's muscle. That is what the muscle is like. It is dense and rich with protein. The way to build your muscle, of course, is to have a nice high protein diet and to exercise a lot. You don't need to eat meat to uh, increase your diet. Of course, the gladiators of Rome, the greatest fighters of all, they were all vegetarians. Uh, if you think about animals that are really big and muscly, such as cows and bison, all they do is they eat grass. So you can get plenty of proteins from all the plants around you. Not necessary to eat meat to get big and strong, but these muscles are what control the movement. You have fine, tiny little muscles that control every single little thing. So we've got the skeleton, which is the frame. We've got the muscles which layer on top of the skeleton, which help things to move. We've got the skin, which layers all over the top of all of that um, and keeps everything in one place, keeps it nice and protected. Okay, well, as a human body, I'm going to need a little bit more than that. So let's focus on what on earth is allowing me to do all of this. How am I controlling this? I'm not having to think about it. I'm not saying, right, move up, now move there, move out, out, out. I don't really have to think about it. It comes naturally to me. So how on earth am I controlling it? Well, 
It is inside this noggin up here, this skull, this very hard protective piece of bone over here, inside here. Oh, this guy has got nothing, no use. This skull here is built to protect your most vital of all organs. Yes, I'm sure many of you have guessed it. It is, oh, it's going to snap open. Oh, it's not your arm, sir. I'm going to okay. snap open. There we go. Inside here, it is the brain. I'm going to take half of the head. So I can imagine here is the skeleton inside here. I'm going to take this as the skin layer. Now, if we look inside here, this is half of the brain. And the brain is an amazing uh, organ. This is half of it. You have two halves to your brain. Uh, the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. The right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. Seems a little bit unusual that it does opposite sides, but that's what it does. Different parts of your brain control different things. You've got your personality, you've got your vision, you've got all sorts of different aspects of your brain that are being, uh, that are kind of controlling and functioning you. Wow. Sounds incredible, doesn't it? This little thing inside here is you. There it is, inside that little skull, and that is you. That's me. That is you. This here is you. Hi, Mr. Keenan, what are you doing Hello. over there? Well, I'm, I'm helping the children to learn. I don't know why me, I'm answering that. That's what it said to me. He's helping the children to learn. So this is you. It's like you've got a little alien inside you that is controlling your whole body. Your body is basically some big robot that is being controlled by this thing in here, okay? Everything that you are exists within this skull. All of the rest of this, this is just like a tool for this to do its job. Quite an amazing thing, really. So the brain, well, it's incredible. It is built of all of these, I'm gonna rub some of this stuff out inside the brain. We have these things called neurons. Um, and neurons, a bit, they look a little bit like the cells that I drew earlier for um, your skin. Uh, they have a little nucleus inside them. Neurons are amazing things. You actually fire electricity in your brain. Did you know your brain creates enough electricity to light a light bulb? There is so much electricity firing around your brain. This is how communication is sent. It is lightning fast. I don't have to think. There's no reaction time to me clicking. It just happens, okay? Your brain is absolutely incredible. When I feel something, I get the response from it. It's able to do so many things in one moment. Not only am I feeling this bald, I know that it's cold, I know that it's smooth, I'm able to talk, I'm able to see and hear. All of these different functions are being processed by the brain. It's like the most amazing supercomputer on earth. So what's going on inside the brain? Well, here I have all of these neurons. And neurons are uh, these amazing things. Now, every time you think about something, you make little links uh, between these neurons. And earlier on, I was listening to Mr. Keeling talking about pathetic fallacy. I heard that word, pathetic fallacy. In fact, every time I said pathetic fallacy, I was making a link between weather and words. The word pathetic fallacy. Now, I've said pathetic fallacy so many times, and I've thought about it so many times, that the word is very strong. I have a kind of link with the weather. Ah, I start to write it, I make a link with my hand, I use it in something else, I make these other links. And every time I start doing it, just like building some muscles when I go to the gym, I'm building these links between my brain and I'm forming formal memories, okay? Now I can be told something once, but if I don't work on it, well, these links, they don't become very strong. Here's me being called something once. Uh, well, before you know it, all those links have gone away because I didn't practice it. But here's me knowing about pathetic fallacy one day. Here's me writing about it the next. Here's me talking to my mum about it and using a different part of my brain. Here's me using it in a story. Here's me hearing it being spoken again. Here's me teaching it to somebody else. Before you know it, those little dirt paths, those little rugged uh, roots that were could have been blown away by the wind have become super highways, motorways, if you like, through which uh, vehicles can storm down. And there's no way of getting rid of how strong these roots have become. 
and you have now formed formal memories. Your brain is amazing for this. All through your life, your neurons are working together with different parts of your brain to form all sorts of memories. When you're born, you're unable to walk. You're unable to make sense of the world around you. But slowly but surely, you start to build links that help you to use the muscles in your body. You build links to start to understand what objects are around in your world. Your parents teach you words that start to make meaning. You start to be able to communicate. All this is done through practice, through work, through determination. This is the brain. So think of the brain. The brain is this little alien inside this big robot creature that you are controlling. That's basically what the rest of your body is. So the brain is you. Okay. <clears throat> We've looked at the skin. We've looked at the skeleton. We've looked at muscles. muscles. Um, and here is the head. Well, what else do we have up here in the head? Am I noticing? Oh, we've got this quite amazing thing in here, which is an eye. Now, the eye is quite an incredible thing. The eye is really, truly really quite an incredible thing. Here is uh, an eyeball. Let me kind of uh, draw that's got a sort of link back to the back of my brain. Um, here by a kind of lens. And what's happening with my eye, um, and I've got this kind of, this is my pupil hole, I've got my iris, which is the kind of color uh, around it. Um, my eye is amazing. It's able to focus in and out. Sometimes you see, if it's in a really dark room, you see a really big pupil. Well, what it's doing is opening the lens to allow more light in. If, an, if a torch gets shone on your pupil, it will become really small. It closes up. Your eye is able, without you thinking, to react to different light and stimulus. So there is my pupil. If I shine different light on it, it will change size. If I get the room darker, it will also change. I don't have to think about that. My eye is working on its own, reacting to light. When an image goes into my eye, uh, here is, let's say, a, a, a candle. It, the image is reflected into my eye. It's actually projected upside down. There is the candle at the back of my brain. There are these incredible photosensitivity, uh, photo, these cells, I don't even kind of know the word right now, but they are reacting to the light. They are able to calculate the color which is done by the reflection of light off of objects so color is kind of um, a wave of light your eye is able to well, it's not really your eye it's your brain that is uh sort of translating those um waves of light into color and the eye doesn't actually do any thinking there's no thinking going on in the eye but of course the eye is connected to the brain and obviously that's not quite to scale, but the connection to the eye, there's a thinker part at the back of your brain, somewhere like that, that goes and deals with all this information and turns the things that you see into the information that you are processing right now. As you're watching this video, your eye is, well, not really doing the work, it's your brain that's doing all the work, but the eye is taking in the light and it is being able to reflect that image onto the back, uh, this part back here, which is your um, retina, and then your brain is taking that information and electrically sending it into uh, your brain to be tr sort of processed into an image. Um, it's amazing because you actually have two eyes. I didn't know if you knew this. You have two eyes, which are really useful because having two eyes means that you are able to see objects from different, slightly different angles, and it allows you to see things in three dimensions. If you close one eye, for a long time, you would lose your depth perspective. You'd be okay at it, but you wouldn't be fantastic at it. Having two eyes allows you to realize one thing being closer than another. It helps you to get kind of three-dimensional depth on the world. In fact, you will notice now, have you got a, ca a camera, phone, I don't know where mine is gone. Yes, yeah, I've got one now. So you'll notice now on the back of lots of fancy cameras, they also use multiple cameras. This is obviously to increase the sense of depth when you're taking these photos. So 
in many circumstances, technology is copying the amazing things that we have evolved to do. Um, right, so what have we done? We've done the skin, we've done uh, like a skeleton, we've done some muscle, we had a little look at the brain, although we have to keep coming back to the brain, the brain's the most amazing thing. What else have we got up here in this old heady, heady, heady? Well, of course, you've got your nose, and your nose is able to pick up on smells, which is, again, done by these smell receptors. Your nose has a big sort of open cavernous area in the back. Again, it's just your brain working out signals. Um, we've also got the mouth. And the mouth, as you can see here, is full of these teeth. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Teeth for gnashing and crunching and destroying. So let's have a little look at the uh, teeth, shall we? Because the teeth, well, teeth say a lot about different animals. Uh, different animals have different type of teeth. I wonder if I draw some different types of teeth, you can guess what that animal might eat. So, for example, if I drew some teeth that looked like that, and then if I drew some teeth that looked um, a bit like that, and there's one mouth and there's another mouth, could you guess? What they eat. I wonder if you can guess now. What does A eat? What does B eat? Have a little think about it. Well, I'm sure you guessed it right. A would probably be a meat eater, or we call these a carnivore. B would probably be uh, a vegetarian. We might call these a herbivore. The teeth show you what the animals are good at doing. These teeth here, for example, they have two large incisors at the side. They have these sharp teeth at the front. They are fantastic for biting in to kill things. They're also amazing for ripping off flesh and slicing through flesh. This might be the mouth of a lion or a wild dog or of some kind of a reptile that eats meat, okay? Those sharp teeth are perfect for that. These, however, are best for grinding down on vegetables. I can imagine an animal that spends most of its life eating grass and things would have teeth like that to slowly grind it down and just eat that all day. They don't need to bite into any flesh or tear things off or attack, but that is their purpose, full of molars. Now, our teeth are rather interesting and they say a lot about us. They say a lot about how we evolved to be what we are today, gosh, look at that, we're at two o'clock in the morning, 2 a.m., that means seven hours left. Seven, seven hours left, sir! Seven hours left! Whew. 17 hours, we've been live for 17 hours. We've been live 17 hours. That's a long time. It is a long time to pretty much be non-stop talking or doing something, just, yeah. Doing well, sir. This is harder than I thought. It's harder because seven hours left seems like a very long period of time. It is a very long period of time. Although, one more hour and we're down to a standard day of teaching. Six hours. <gasps> I don't know how that does that make me feel better? I don't know, sir. Does it make you feel better? <laughs> well, well, anyway. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at our teeth because our teeth are quite um, interesting. We've kind of got, I'm going to do a sort of stylized version of our teeth. Obviously, they don't really look like this, and they're not in this kind of shape. But let's say I flatten out our teeth um, a bit. Our teeth have these interesting patterns that show a lot about how us as an animal, of course, we are an animal. It shows how we as an animal have evolved through the ages, okay? So amazing things have happened to us. At the front, these um, teeth, like incisors, they're very good at tearing and ripping into things, okay? They're quite sharp, quite good at biting stuff off. Now, I don't know, are they best at biting meat off, or could they be best at biting into hard nuts and berries? It's an interesting one, that. But we've definitely got these remaining kind of canine teeth, and these do seem to be the kind of teeth you sharper on here that you may likely see in something that does eat meat. Now, our mouth doesn't tell me that we are a top predator. Most top predators would have certainly sharp 
teeth, maybe big ones at the side, something that they would need to run and bite into an animal. Our jaws bite. Oh, now, biting on your finger might hurt a little bit, but it's not very strong. Okay, if we were going to attack an animal, I would not recommend going teeth first. Yeah, if you're a lion, you're going to go teeth first, aren't you? But if you're a human, don't go teeth first. You're probably going to break your jaw. It's very weak. We were not built as a major predator. Actually, early on, we would be mostly a scavenger. And what a scavenger is is someone who runs around looking. A food that's kind of left over the place. That would be what we were best at. And、uh, we then changed and became predators, not because of our power or our teeth, our muscles. Absolutely not. We're a rather weak animal.、Uh, it was because of our brain. The brain became oversized and became very useful, allowing us to create tools. And I know a lot of people have been learning about the Stone Age. But that early development of tools is what allowed us to become so dominant. We would have had spears, and we created bows and arrows, and it was that that gave us our strength, which is our brain, not our physical appearance or features. No, no, no. We are not a threatening animal physically.、Um, so we got these canines. But what is most telling about us are these molars at the back, these teeth, which most of the back of your mouth are made of. Which are for grinding, and this seems most likely for grinding vegetables. It's likely that for most of the time that we have been human, our diet would not have consisted of a lot of meat. Meat would be something we would be very lucky to get hold of. I'm going to have a little sip of tea, if you don't mind. Oh yes, good.、Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to just go for yes. Good. I think it tastes great to me. Good, glad.、Mm. Tea. Right. What was I saying? Yeah, these teeth would imply that we probably were not major meat eaters, and in fact, meat shouldn't be a dominant part of our diet. Most of our evolution, it would have been nuts and berries, roots and things. These teeth at the back, which make up most of our mouth, are absolutely ideal. For grinding down roots and getting the most out of them,、um, it's probably only in the latter kind of couple of thousand of years of our, you know, existence that we have become such a, a big meat eater. This is, of course, because of the advent of farming. So later on into the kind of Bronze Age, later on in the Stone Age, Bronze Age, we started to farm animals. It meant that we no longer went hunting for them. We were able to pacify certain creatures. And then we were able to farm them for our meat. So we have become big meat consumers. Although realistically, it's probably not naturally the best meat for、uh, best thing for us. But anyway, I love meat. I'm not going to get get rid of it. No chance.、Um, so teeth. What are they even for? Well, we've been talking about what they could have in purposes in animals. You know, for biting into things, for cutting off flesh. We know that some could be grinding down nuts and things, but yes, mostly in your body. What they're for is for mashing your food into the smallest pieces possible. This is first part in something known as your digestive system. Now, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove some organs for now that we don't need right now. I'm going to tear out the lungs. We're going to talk about those later. Lungs have gone. I'm going to tear out the heart. I'm going to talk about those later, and I'm going to focus on. Uh, let's say the digestive system. I'm actually going to take out the liver too. I'm not going to worry about that just right now. So the first part of this digestive system, which are the remaining parts, we've got the mouth. We then go down this food pipe into a big sac down here, known as the stomach. We'll talk about that a little bit. We've got these small intestines and the large intestines, and then we've got the rectum at the end of it. So what does this digestive system do? Let's rub this. Out. How are you doing over there, sir? I am flying over there. It's tricky when you sit down, isn't it? Yeah. When you're up here, you have a sort of a whoosh of energy. Joie de vivre. Joie de vivre. Absolutely. But when you're sitting, ah, <laughs> uh, uh, je suis. Oui. Une homme qui est très fatiguée, je pense. Merci beaucoup. C'est un problème, bien sûr. Right. Uh, oh, Ali or Macdor? Ali, Ali or Macdor? Ali or Macdor? Ali or Macdor? Je ne comprends pas. Ah, 
J'habite dans un grand petit pois. Oh, you live in a really big pea. Very nice. I love it, sir. Okay, let's look at this. So we've got a mouth, right? And the mouth is full of these. Oh, I don't know why I'm drawing teeth like that. It's full of teeth. I'm just going to draw teeth like this. Uh, I'm going to draw them even bigger. Teeth like this. Uh, and they're made for uh, the mashing. It's to mash the food up to get it as small as possible. You're going to see why we need food to be really small. Here are my lips that are going to be on this side. My lips are there to help me to get my food in. My teeth are there, mashing all the food out. Actually, there's another little thing that's going on in your mouth known as your saliva. Your saliva is pouring out. Your saliva actually has these amazing enzymes in them, which are able to break down your food and to get extract the sugars out of it. So already in your mouth, your body is attacking the food and it's trying to get as many good things out of it. If you, for example, take a piece of bread, take a little bit of white bread, leave it in your mouth for as long as you want, try and keep it in there for a long time, you'll notice that the bread that had a kind of, um, what's, you know, we have the sweet food and then what's it say? It has a kind of savory flavor to start with. Um, it begins to have a sweet flavor and you're thinking, Hold on, how is this savory thing going from savory to sweet? Well, the saliva, the enzymes in it are starting to break down the carbohydrates. They are turning them into sugars already in your mouth. The process has begun. So your then teeth mash it up even more, allowing for even greater surface area for the saliva to get doing its job. And I'm going to skip a, a little bit of distance here. It goes down into a large sac known as the stomach. Now, the stomach is a large sac that holds your food, okay? You could think of it as a food-holding sac, but no. It is the next part of the digestive system. Let's pop this word down here. The digestive system. Digestive system. No, I need to do like an individual YouTube video on this because I've been on for ages and this would be quite handy, wouldn't it? It would. Um, the digestive system. So this is the stomach. And in this stomach, you know that there's a little exit down there, the little sort of uh, a little muscle to hold it tight. In here, your food lands. So let's say I have taken my carrot. Uh, here it is. Um, and uh, it's gone in my mouth and I've broken it down into nice little lumps. So it comes down into my stomach in nice little lumps. Well, my stomach creates this um, acid. And an acid is fantastic at further breaking down the food. So I've already had the teeth attacking it. I've had the saliva attacking it. Well, now in the stomach, it crunches and mushes together. This acid pours out and it breaks it down even further. But that is not the end of the journey. Oh no, not even slightly. It now has a wild adventure to go on. So we have got ourselves into the stomach all the way down here. I'm going to remove this. So this is this nice bag, which is pouring acid onto your food. <coughs> Sometimes you might be really, really hungry and you see someone eating or you smell some food and then suddenly, oh, you get a pain down here. Well, it might be because your stomach is starting to produce some of that acid and it's burning away at the walls uh, of your stomach. So. Good to get some food in you at that point. Um, so where have we got to? Ah, yes, we're coming out of the stomach and we go into now this wiggly wobbly maze. And uh, my goodness, is it a long journey. We are gonna go into the in small intestines and the small intestines, well, they go all over the place. It wasn't a very good drawing of it. I'm gonna draw this around the top, which is going to be later on my large uh, intestine. So I've got this bigger one around the top, and eventually I've got a way out. Now, all this wiggly wobbly that's going all the way out around, known as the small intestines, <laughs> this long journey, what is this there? I'm sorry, I've just looked and have to not looking for a little while of being generally out of it. But that looks like you were trying to do some maths or something and you've just completely gone at yeah. that point and you were just scribbling a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, it did get, it did get, it did get like that. It did. How are there still 11 people watching? 11. How are there still 11 people watching? I don't know. 
They must really love the digestive system. Well, it's only getting going, sir. Is it? There's so much more digestive system. Fantastic. You're going to do two parts, so I oh, can do some mental math. It's getting between. big, sir. It's getting. You want me to split into two parts? I'll tell you what. I'll do the digestive system, and then I'll come back to do some of the other body stuff. Cool. Um, body. Who would have thought of it? I know, right? Right. I right. did not think right. of it. Right. This is great. <laughs> right. So we're going into these tubes, long tubes. Now I tell you what. If you took out your uh, intestines, it would stretch all the way across this classroom. If I went from my mouth all the way to my bum and I stretched out my whole digestive system, the route that the food has to take, it would go from one end to the other. If you want to investigate it, there's an interesting autopsy on YouTube that you can check out where you see that happen. So um, when it is going through this journey, it's quite a long route. Now I'm going to draw the sides of the wall. This is the tube that it's going through. Now on the side of this wall are all of these little things here. And what's starting to happen in the small intestine is your food. Here is my carrot mush that is going through is my small intestines are starting to absorb the goodness from it. I am sucking all the goodness from the food. Okay. I am a machine. I have told you that already. My brain is in control of this machine while my brain needs energy. How is it going to get the energy? It gets energy from the food. Rather like a computer needs to get energy from uh, the power. Uh, your phone has a battery in it. Well, all things need energy to run. We are an amazingly efficient energy machine and we can run off food. Isn't that incredible? And it is in the small intestine that the nutrients, the minerals, the goodness is starting to be absorbed. The small intestine absorbs this all and it sends the energy and the minerals and the vitamins and it allows it to flow through your blood and your blood will wrap around it, absorb these energies and minerals and then it will take it all around your body. So eating those carrots, nom, 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 nom. They go all the way down here. When they get into my intestines, it absorbs some of the amazing vitamins that are in there, vitamins in a carrot that might come back to my eye and help build the structure of my eye and the retina in there and make it super strong. So fantastic. It goes on this long journey to absorb as much of it as possible. At the very end, it goes into this long thing here called the large intestine, which wraps around the small intestine to get the very last bits out and it is squeezed out and eventually it comes out the other end as poop. Um, so you eventually you will create a brown smelly mess which is of complete waste material. It is all the stuff that your body does not need or want anymore. It needs to get rid of it somehow. The reason it looks like that and it is so horrible because it has had all of the goodness taken out of it. The reason it has that horrible smell is because, well, I guess your gut is actually full of bacteria. And you think to yourself, oh, oh no, well, thank goodness for the bacteria because the bacteria in your gut helps to break down the food. In fact, if it were not for other living creatures that live within us, we would not be alive. It is incredible. We actually have something called a symbiotic relationship with other creatures. What that means is we work together with another creature which lives inside us. Yes, that is your gut bacteria. It is something that is given to you from birth. It is passed on to you from your mother. And it is vital for keeping you alive. Believe it or not, you do not function as one single animal. Oh, no. There are other living things inside you that live off you, but also keep you alive. Doesn't that sound crazy, sir? Yeah! It's amazing. <clears throat> you need to look after your gut bacteria. Really important. One of the ways that we can do this is by eating yogurts, is by drinking uh, milk and all these kind of materials which have nice, healthy uh, gut bacteria in them. Uh, so yeah, really important. Uh, that's the journey of the food, I think. I think it's about time to pass on to the glorious Monsieur Killing. <laughs> Dos peritos calientes, por favor. Sí. Hola. We are going to do a little bit of phonics, I think. Oh, love it. Love it. So, very simple. I have our phonics sounds here behind me. I'm going to show you the sound. 
I want you to make the sound. Remember, they are pure sounds. I want you to make the sounds. In fact, I might ask Mr. Jordan to make some of these sounds as well. Oh. No. <laughs> going to make the sound. I'm going to ask you to do it. Then I will do it. Then I'll ask you to do it again. Ready. Make the sound. Well done, Mr. Jordan. This is phonics. Interesting. Try it again. Okay, next sound. Try the sound. Try it again. What's the difference between the first one and the second one, sir? Hmm? What's the difference between the first one and the second one? Oh, there's two S's. What? Yeah. What? Is that it? Uh -huh. Okay. Try making the sound. Ah. Ah. Try making the sound. Pure sound. Try making this. Next sound. This is a legitimate lesson you're laughing at, sir. <laughs> what lesson is this? <laughs> it's key stage one, sir. Right, sorry. <laughs> eh. Mr. Jordan, it's 20 past two in the morning. <laughs> eh. Pure sound. Making the same sound here.
Stop. A. E. I. O. I I O O O U U U O Okay, well done if you could read all of those sounds. We are now going to do some words, some funny, tricky words. I'm going to bring them up. I will show them for a little moment, for a moment. You can try it and then I will say the word. Let's give those a go as well. 
starting from phase two. Here we go. I know the go into. Well, if you got those, that's gone to phase three. He, read the word, she, we, me, be, you, are, her, was, all, they, my, onto our phase four words, said, have, like, so, do, some, come, little, one, were there what when at good on to phase five oh missus tricky one people there, called, Mr. Looked, could. Okay, common exception words year one. At, or at. Two, today, of, Says, is, his, has, your, go, by, here, where, look. Once, ask, friend, school, push, pull, full, foot, house, hour, to the year two common exception words door floor poor because kind mind uh, fine sorry mind Behind, child, while, children, climb, most, only, both, old, Cold, gold, hold, told, every, great, break, stake, 
pretty after beautiful fast last pass father class grass pass plant path bath well done there now just because i can't resist it and i actually really love really really love this song actually i probably can't play the song because of copyright issues but if you want to check it out the magic e song by alpha blocks is a fantastic song to check out um for phonics it's just got a really good tune really good to hear okay we're going to do something uh scientific now kind of scientific anyway uh we're going to do a little experiment and then we're going to maybe draft up a little experiment so let me just grab something out of my bag i'll be right back and then we'll talk about what we're going to do <laughs> Oh dear, I seem to have misplaced my bag. Where are you, sir? My bag, sir. Have you seen my bag? I haven't, but I can kill. I can, I can, I can talk to the children whilst we're waiting for you. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Hello. Hello. I don't know what you've been doing. Your phonics sounded fantastic. That was very exciting. I'm just blowing a balloon because it would be quite nice, wouldn't it? When we get to nine o'clock, we can have a little bit of a celebration. I like balloons. Now, um, what have we got? coming up still to come well we're going to carry on talking of course about the diet well i think we've done the digestive system we're gonna have a little look at the rest of the organs that are in the body um we are going to be looking at oh we've got a little bit of a dive on christianity we've got a little bit of a dive on islam we're going to be having a little look at some of the key features we have later on we are going to be looking at climate change as well and how it is affecting the world and so what is that you've got it's a sandwich bag sir <gasps> Regular old sandwich bag. We are going to do an experiment with a sandwich bag, and I'm going to need to move you back to the board over here. Oh, it's Stephen Bones. I haven't seen you in a while, Dr. Bones. Right. Oh, I think I've just dropped part of the body. Oh, dear me. Not going well, is it? What time is it? 25 to 3. Well, you wouldn't expect so, would you? Okay. Let's go then on to a science experiment. Um, the aim, the aim of which we are going to build a little mini scientific report. With a, uh, with a silly little experiment, it won't take us very long to do and you don't need much to do it. Here is what you're gonna need, equipment for this. So get it ready uh, if you have it. You'll need a plastic sandwich bag. Uh, so try and find one of those. Um, really, they're the kind of anything that will work for this, a plastic sandwich bag. You will also need a sharp pencil or a pen. You will need access to water and maybe a tray or you could probably just do this over the sink. Right, we're gonna start building our scientific report. After we've built a bit of our scientific report, we are going to go and do an experiment. The first part of a scientific report is the aim. The aim is the purpose, it's the reason that we are doing it, it's what we are testing. And what we are going to test today is what happens when I fill a plastic sandwich bag with water. I then take a sharp pencil. I stab it through the plastic bag, making a hole. It's going to explode everywhere, right? Well, that's what we're going to find out, sir. So the aim of the experiment today is we want to find out what happens when I stick a sharp pencil through a plastic bag 
full of water. I'm going to give you a minute to get that aim down on your sheet. I'll do the same. I'll write it down. We're all doing the same aim. So we'll get it down to test what happens when you pierce a sandwich bag full of water with a pencil. Very specific <laughs> aim. A very wow. specific aim there. So that is what we're doing. That's the aim of today's science experiment or tonight's science experiment. I don't even know anymore. Get your aim down. One minute. You can copy mine or you can write in your own words. This Up morning. Morning. This morning. This morning. This morning. This morning. Get it down. Aim written down on your sheet or on your word. Copy mine or write in your own words. I don't mind. We are down to six people, sir. People are finally going to sleep. I really struggled. You just done it? Yeah. I'm okay. You're okay. That's good. Okay. On from the aim, we're going to leave a space on our sheet and we are going to do a new subheading. The new subheading is this. Six people. Prediction. A prediction. Now, Mr. Jordan already made his prediction. Yep. He said, well, when you stick the pencil in the bag, the water's going to go everywhere. That's Mr. Jordan's prediction. Oh, yeah? What would you like to change it to, sir? Wait, but what if my prediction is too accurate because I've got such a big brain? Okay, we'll give it a go. Okay, right. This is what I'm thinking here, right? Full of water. Yep. Yeah. Now, initially, I was thinking it's going to go everywhere because I was thinking stick it in, but are you taking the pencil out again? No, I'm just going to stick the pencil straight through it. No, I think the pencil's going to act like a plug. Right. And... Maybe it doesn't all come. No, it's going to still leak. I think it's going to dribble a little bit. So you think it's going to dribble? I've changed my mind from <laughs> to kind of just like, it's not going to be bad, but there's going to be a little bit of water that just kind of leaks. kind just of leaking tiny either side. I think we're going to slowly. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, it's up to you. This is your prediction. It doesn't really matter at this stage whether you are right or wrong, because whether you're right or wrong, you're going to explain it in the results section later. So just make a prediction. You can say, I believe the water will go everywhere. I think a little bit of water will come out. I believe that no water will come out. I believe a few drips will come out. I'm going to give you a minute or two to make a prediction. What do you think is going to happen when I fill this sandwich bag with water and I poke the pencil through it? I'm going to leave the pencil in. What do you think is going to happen? Why is orange juice coming out? That would be amazing. So just make your prediction. You can start off with I predict or I think. I'd go with I predict uh, that when the pencil is pushed through the bag, Dot, 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 dot. What? What do you predict? I predict when the pencil is pushed push through the bag, what? What is going to occur? What is going to happen? Second win. Okay. We should now have an aim, what we're going to do, what we're testing, and a prediction, what we think is going to happen. We need below that, we need to leave another space. And just like earlier, when we did a list uh, for our recipe, we're going to do a list of the equipment that we are going to use for our science experiment. So below it, we are going to write the word equipment. Mm. 
Now, the reason that we write science reports and the reason that scientists write scientific reports is so that people can copy exactly what they did step by step to see if the same thing occurs. And if it does, that's scientific evidence that what they're saying is true. So we need a list of the exact equipment that we are going to use. Well, we have got our pencil, of course. We will have water. Now, if we were being very specific, we would say exactly how much water we are putting in, but we're not going to be too specific. We need our sandwich bag. And then we need either a tray or we'll just say sink. We'll use a sink. Get your equipment list. And then we are going to go and we are going to test the experiment. Get it down 30 seconds. Okay, let's go test it. Back into the staff room, leaving the room. Here we go. Okie dokie. Right, we are going to go over to the sink where I've left some watching up from the cooking earlier. Okay, we are at the sink. I am going to fill the bag with water and I am gonna hold it over the sink. Remember your prediction, that is what you said would happen. Let's see. I'm going to fill this bag with water. Okay, dokie. That is now full of water. Well, not completely full, but it's got enough in for us to test. I'm going to seal the bag and I'm going to pull it tight. Right, that bag is now tight, full of water and I am going to try pushing this pencil through. Okay, what did we think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Make sure you've got your prediction down, because here we go. Now, there is water coming out of the bag, but it is not. It's because I've been squeezing it. It was coming out of the top. Not a drop has spilt. There isn't any water coming out of this bag around the pencil. Almost like magic, look. There is a hole in that bag, but there is not a drop of water coming out. The pencil is completely through, and I'll prove it when I remove the pencil. Here we go. <laughs> And there goes the water. Okay, we're going to empty that bag. Okay, and let's go back to the class and talk about what just happened. Yes, we've done it, sir. Oh, wow, wow. Put it in. So, we've conducted the experiment. Hopefully, you conducted it at home alongside ours. Before, before we get into the results section where we write up exactly what happened, and we will talk about what happened. We're going to draw a diagram. All good scientific reports. Have a draw, diagram. Now, diagram, diagram. Now, diagrams don't have to be fancy. It's not a piece of art. In fact, they're quite basic. The shapes in a diagram are quite basic. You are just going to label so that people know what you have 
drawn. So let's have a look, see. Okay. There we go. Just a triangle. That is going to be our bag. All I have to do is label it bag or sandwich bag. Fantastic. The sandwich bag was over the sink or the tray, so I'm just going to draw the container below it to capture the water sink. The bag was full of water, so I'm just going to draw a line across and I'm going to label it water. And finally, the pencil was pushed through the bag, so I'm going to draw a line going all the way through the bag. And I'm just going to label that pencil. Just to show anybody who is reading the report exactly how we did it. So draw the bag. It can be a big square. It can be a triangle, as long as you've labeled it bag. Label the pencil that is going through the bag. Label the sink that is below the bag. And then label the water that is inside the bag. I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to walk around the table. Two minutes. Draw your diagram. One more minute. Okay, on to the results. Firstly, the first sentence, very easy. I'm not going to give it to you. I just want you to explain exactly what happened when we pushed that pencil through the bag. A minute. Write me a sentence, what happened when we pushed that pencil through the plastic sandwich bag? What happened? Was it good? Was it good? Yeah. Uh, yes, it was good. You didn't spill a drop of water. You just left it with the pencil back. Not a single drop. Well, I did spill a drop, but that's because I squeezed too tightly and it came out the top. Oh my goodness. I'd love to have seen it. Get that sentence down. Tell me exactly what happened when we pushed that pencil through. And stop. Okay. Here's the why then. The reason that that works is because the sandwich bag is made of something, it's composed of something, molecules called polymers. And polymers are very flexible things. And when you push that pencil through, it separates them. It pulls them apart, but then they pull back together. And like Mr. Jordan said, form a plug, a tight plug around that pencil. So not a drop of water spills until you remove that pencil. The gap is too wide for those polymers to grasp. And the water comes out of the sandwich bag. So, do you think you can explain that? The bag is made of polymers. 
they are flexible. They pull back together around the pencil. When the pencil is removed, the gap is too great, the water is expelled. Quite scientific there, but give it a go. See if you can explain and remember what I've just said. If you need to rewind the video and listen again, you can. Complete your results, two minutes, and then we will go on to the final part. Another minute. Okay. The final part is further steps. The science experiment I did is full of variables, things that can be changed, things that affect. I used, for example, a pencil. It has a certain thickness to it. What else could we have used? What if we were going to test again, could we push through that bag? Well, a pen, maybe a whiteboard pen, maybe a pin, maybe a knitting needle. These are all suggestions for further steps. Not just that though, we could try different types of bag. For example, would a paper bag work? Would a carrier bag work from the shop? These are variables. And what I want for the final part is at least four four changes, just small changes, using a different object, using a different liquid maybe, or using a different type of bag. Four changes we could do and retest with this same experiment. Give it a go. One, two, three, four. I will give you one, two, three, four minutes to do it. I'm gonna walk around the table, try and get some different variables. I'll write one up while you're writing, just as an example. There's one change. I could use a paper bag instead of a sandwich bag. Probably would not get the same results. Two, three, four. What further investigations, what further steps could we take to test this? Three more minutes. Two more minutes. Have a 
but look. Very exciting. What's the title? Got rid of that lovely learning objective you had. Love it. Got rid of that wonderful learning objective. Yeah. I love that. I'm sure you can rewind the video and see it again, sir. Rewind and re see. Very exciting. One more minute. Finish your further steps. One minute left. Fluctuating between seven and five viewers. It's dwindling off to sleep. Maybe picking up again three hours. Have you set up the neck in the video for seven between seven? No, I tell you what, while you're waiting for this, I'll just do that in the background. That's a very good idea. Very good idea. Let me click it on here. What did we say? Seven. Seven till nine. Yeah. Live. We're gonna call it. 24. 24 hour teach uh, on part three. Part three, the final part. Last two hours, the final push. Part three, brackets, we'll put 07 two. Oh nine. Public scheduled for seven o'clock. Chat on. Chat on. Wax on. Chat on. Chat on. More options. Advanced settings. Allow chat. Next. And we are good to go. Do you want a, a picture of both of us for the final live stream push here? Sure. Oh, I will get to retake them now. Is that the, is that the one we're going for, yeah? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> done. And done. There we go, and I'll bring you back. Right, to okay. Uh, I think we've had enough time. Well done completing a very quick science experiment and drafting of a scientific report. Well done in phonics as well. And like I said, I'm not going to play that Magic E song just because of copyright issues. Uh, but if you want to check it out, Alpha Blocks Magic E, it is a very good song. Sir, so are you ready to take over? Are you happy to take over? Hmm. I'm ready. I'm ready for this. I'm eating my grapes, which is my energy. I'm popping it in. Mm. Interesting. I shouldn't eat my mouth as well. My digestive, digestive system is already in action. Hmm. What's happening right now? Can you remember? You were telling a partner or somebody you're with. How has it already begun? Well, I'm going to do a little quick recap before we start looking at other parts of the body. What should I do with these? I'm going to pop these over here for a second. Yes. That is right. I'm sure you were saying it to the person next to you. We have started in, here's my lips, and I'm starting in the mouth, and I'm starting to, these look like some uh, teeth that need a little bit of work done on them. I'm starting to munch those grapes. Here they are, the grapes, and they're being munched up into little pieces. They are traveling down. I'm gonna take the whole journey. They're going to go into my stomach sac where acid is going to break them down. So we start with the teeth are going to break them down. We've got a saliva, which is going to start breaking it down and using those enzymes to get all the sugars out of it. We then go into the wiggly maze, which is which are the small intestines. And I don't know quite how I'm going to draw these. Always a bit confusing for me. It wiggles all over the place. And then it comes out into this one that wraps around here, which is the large intestine. And then it's going to come out of you as so. Uh, so that is the whole journey. And if we remember, uh, each of the parts are really, really important. Now, I wonder, why does it go on such a long journey? Why doesn't it just go in and drop and go out? 
hmm, could you think of any reasons that you could tell a partner or someone who is next to you why does it need to go on such a long journey? What is the purpose of that? What do we think might be the purpose of it being on such a long journey? It is to maximize, and you are absolutely right, those of you who guessed it correctly, it is to maximize the surface area, to maximize the time that the uh, food is being broken down, to maximize the amount of time that the energy, the goodness, the vitamins, the minerals can be absorbed from it. In fact, even within your intestines, these flaps and folds increase the surface area through which uh, your blood can absorb all of the goodness, your sort of blood wraps uh, all around uh, these things, and it takes the goodness away to all the parts of your body, which leads us rather neatly on to your blood and what your blood does and how your blood works. Um, so as I go back into the body, it is important that I start to rebuild parts. You know what? I'm gonna, whoa! Hold on a second here. That was a little bit freaky. What have we got? Not sure what that was, but there was some kind of knock at the door, a window, who knows. Um, so I'm going to go back into this circulatory system. I'm actually going to take out the digestive system now. <laughs> Taking this out, these are the intestines that has been gone. There was my stomach. I'm going to remove that. Is that you, sir? That was, that was nice of you. Yeah. Was it. Yeah. <laughs> We're going <laughs> to pop back in some certain parts. I'm going to pop back in this, which is the heart. We're going to have a look at that in a bit more detail in a second. I'm going to pop back in this, which is the lung. I'm going to pop back in this, which is the other lung. And we are going to look at the blood system around the body. Um, so you look very comfy. You look very comfy. So blood, why is it so important? Well, let's have a little look. Should we get rid of this? Because that was just a recap. If you want to look at karaoke, the karaoke, sir. Yeah. Well, karaoke. we've gone all the way up to eleven viewers, so it's about time, I think. Yeah, karaoke should be happening in some way. Lyrics on my screen. Brilliant! I can't wait for the karaoke. We, we are ready to go. What we want to do it now? To go. Turn around. Every now and then, I get a little bit lonely. lonely. And you're never coming around. And you're never coming around. I have to get the lyrics on here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What's the, I'll give you the first What's the song? Around. It's uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler. Total Eclipse of the Heart lyrics. Here we go. And where are you going to use to come so over I'll here? I'll give you the first turn you have to come around. over here. You can't sing together. You have to come over here. I'll sing it from I'll say. I'll sing this side. You sing over on that side. No, no, we're good, sir. You stand there. I don't think people can even hear I'll you. give you the first turn around. You give me the next turn around. We'll go like that. Right. Turn around. Every now and then I get a little bit lonely. And you're never coming round. Turn around. Every now and then I get a little bit tired of listening to the sound of my tears. Turn around. Every now and then I get a little bit nervous. The best of all the years have gone by. Turn around. Every now and then I get a little bit terrified. But then I see the look in your eyes. Turn around, bright eyes. Every now and then I fall apart. Turn around, bright eyes. Every now and then I pull apart. And I need you now, tonight. And I need you more than ever. And if you only hold me tight, we'll be holding on forever. And we'll always be making it all right. Cause we'll never be wrong together. We can take it to the end of the line. Your love is like a shadow on me all of the time. I don't know what to do when I'm always in the dark. We're living in a crowd of game, giving us sparks. I really need you tonight. Forever's gonna start tonight. Forever's gonna start tonight. Now I'm only falling apart. 
There's nothing I can do, a total eclipse of the heart. Once upon a time, I was lying in my bed. I don't you know, you know this song. On, this is, there's nothing I can do, but total eclipse of the heart. Try again. There's nothing I can do, a total eclipse of the heart. Fantastic. Once upon a time, there was light in my life. But now, now there's, there's only love in the dark. Nothing I can say. A total eclipse of the heart. Every now and then I fall apart. Turn around, bright eyes. Every now and then I fall apart. And I need you now tonight. And I need you now. And I need you now to never. And you only hold me tight. We'll be holding on forever, and we'll only be making it right. Cause we'll never be wrong together. We can take it to the end of the line. Your love is like a shadow on me all of the time. I don't think this is breaking copyright. Well, nothing's popping up, but it normally says at the top, copyright infringement, your video is about to be taken down. Stop. Nothing's happening. I don't know what to do when I'm always in the dark. We're living in a pie keg and giving up sparks. I really need you tonight. Forever's gonna start tonight. Forever's gonna start tonight. Once upon a time I was falling in love. But now I'm only falling apart. Nothing I can say but total eclipse of the heart. A total eclipse of the heart. A total eclipse of the heart. Turn around, bright eyes. Turn around. So the digestive system I've already removed from the board, and that's an important part of it. But we now need to know how does the energy that the digestive system takes from the food, how is that transported all around the body? And that is where your blood system comes into play. Now, blood is wrapping all around everywhere. There are veins, there are arteries. So that has really boosted us. We've got all the way up to 14 viewers. Um, there are veins, there are arteries that wrap all around your body that pump the blood. And there is one key thing inside here, one muscle that squeezes the blood all around your body, the mega pump. Let me tear out the first lung. <laughs> Oh, there it goes. Let me tear out the other lung. And we are left with, it's in here. It's your heart. Now your heart, if you take your right uh, hand and you put it together like a fist and place it across here, that is about where your heart is, ever so slightly to the left. It is about the size of your fist. So yes, if you're young, you would have a smaller one. As you grow older, you're going to get a bigger one. Um, and it... Boom, 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 boom. Boom. It is working all the time. In fact, it works all independent on its own. You don't have to think about it. It's interesting because when you walk, I guess a little bit of thought goes into the process of walking, but your heart, it goes for itself. It has these little electric signals in it called pace muscles, uh, and they send little electrical signals which, boom, 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 which keep the beat going. In fact, sometimes people can have heart conditions, and we can actually insert uh, something called a pacemaker, which gives the electrical signal to make your heart uh, pump in a regular fashion. People have what, the heart, what are they called? Heart tremors, murmurs, something like that. I'm not quite sure the word for it. So here is the heart. It is just one big muscle. You can actually eat heart. I wouldn't eat a human heart, but you can eat heart of like cow or uh, lamb or chicken. Chicken hearts really nice actually when you fry them all up. Um, they are just a muscle like any other. They're quite a tough one to eat, but it can be cooked nicely. I'm going to open up the heart. Inside the heart, it is um, an empty space because it is full of these sort of areas, these, um, I forgot what they're called, atriums or something like that. So let, let me have a little draw of uh, a, a heart. Um, it's going to look a bit like um, this, and it has another tube going up here, and a tube going up here, and it's kind of got this sort of shape. Um, it has a strong muscular uh, wall um, and it has these four uh, chambers there's another uh, chamber and there's another chamber 
And what happens? Now, I'm really sorry if I get it the wrong way around, so I do apologize for that. But it squeezes in. Do you know, I'm going to use some different colors here. We've got like a, a green or something. There used to be a green around here. I'm going to use this orange. It squeezes in, takes in uh, some blood. It then pumps it straight over there, and it's able to also squeeze in uh, blood here and then pump it out. Now, I might have got the arrows in the wrong order. Please do not quote me on the order of those arrows. That is not the priority here. But what I'm showing you is how this muscle, this amazing muscle here, is able to squeeze and pump blood all around your body. I recommend at this point to come find yourself a YouTube video and to go and have a look at how it is working. It does it all the same. It works like the pump. Maybe you would have in a pond for a fountain or something like that. It's a way of moving, squeezing uh, blood all over the place. And um, now, why does it need to do this? Why does blood need to be spread all around your body? Well, one thing I told you was that down in your gut, your blood is wrapping around and it is able to absorb sort of energy and minerals and things which your blood system transports around to different parts of your bodies. When I eat that yummy, yummy carrot and it goes down, or if I eat an orange and I take the vitamin C out of it, that vitamin C can then be spread around my body to make my cells nice and healthy. The heart helps in circulating that system. It keeps the fluids flowing all around. It's very good at getting blood up here to the brain. It's very good at getting it down to the leg. Quite amazing. I always think the journey, if you think about the blood that's down in your foot, the heart can squeeze the blood from your foot all the way back up your leg, back to the heart to be recirculated. The blood is constantly flowing in a direction around your body, absolutely amazing what your heart can do. But it's not all just about getting the energy from the food. There is one big thing that your red blood cells do. Now your red blood cells, if I was to look at it from the top, look like a disc. When I look at them from the side, they look a bit like this. Um, they are red when they are oxygenated because your red blood cells carry this vital thing. It is O2, yes, oxygen. You might know from Among Us, O2, when you are trying to reduce the amount of O2 in the ship. Um, the oxygen is carried around your body. You need to think of your red blood cells. They are like the worker trucks of your body. Here it is, transporting oxygen from place to place. It is able to take oxygen from place to place around your body. Oxygen is a little bit like um, the wood you throw on the fire. It helps to burn. Uh, and keep all of your cells going, all of your muscles healthy and moving. So how on earth, whew, pray do tell, how on earth does the uh, blood get oxygenated? Where does the oxygen come from? I may ask, I may wonder, uh, where does the oxygen come from? Do you know, could you think, could you potentially have a guess? Well, it definitely comes in through the mouth and nose. It goes down into some things, sacs that are here. Do you know what these things are? They are known as your lungs. Your lungs are very large things. There are two of them, much like most things in your body. There are two of them. And they sit here. They are protected. Your lungs and your heart are very well protected by a cage that your body has created. Here it is. This is the cage that protects your heart and lungs. Inside here would be the lungs like this, and they are protected inside this cage that your skeleton creates to keep them safe. These are absolutely vital. When I breathe in, they fill with air. When I breathe out, they, re they release the air. Every time I'm breathing in, I'm taking in oxygen and I'm breathing out um, carbon dioxide, although I'm not just breathing out carbon dioxide, I'm breathing out oxygen and all sorts of other gases as well. In fact, most of the air I breathe in is not oxygen. Most of the air that I'm breathing in is nitrogen and it's pretty useless to my body. I think only around 20% of the air is oxygen, something like that. Mr. Keeling says yes. Um, and a very small percentage is actually carbon dioxide, but you do breathe in carbon dioxide as well, but of course your body's not using it. So I'm taking in, let's say 20% oxygen, and then I'm giving out a slightly smaller percentage of oxygen 
and I'm obviously breathing in carbon dioxide, we're giving out a slightly larger percentage of carbon dioxide. It's not like all of my breath that comes out is carbon dioxide, but of course a lot of it is because carbon dioxide is the waste product in your body. When you have used up the oxygen, you produce the carbon dioxide. So what we have got is, uh, there are your huge lungs which are attached up to, do you know what, I'm going to just put it a little bit further down. I'm only going to draw one lung here. It's like a big uh, sack and uh, there'll be another one over there. And then I'm going to just miss a bit of this. I'm going to go back to my nose and my mouth situation. And both of these are attached to the air. So let's say in here, as I inhale in, I'm going to be breathing in the air. It goes down in here and it fills up now inside my lungs. It's not just one big empty sac, rather like your small intestines where there are folds and, and rips and curls and things to increase the surface area. Inside your lungs is a similar kind of thing. Uh, there are these little, uh, what are they called, Bronchi broncholi or something like that? Broncholi, something, I can't quite remember the name of them. But there are these tiny little sacs within the sacs and your blood vessels wrap all around them. And one side of your heart is sucking up the used oxygen from the rest of your body. It then sends that blood along around into the lungs. That blood then comes back into your heart and is then sent off into your body. It is known as the circulatory system because it is going constantly around and around and around. So the blood pumps, the uh, the heart, sorry, pumps the blood into the lungs. In the lungs, the blood circulates and picks up the oxygen. It then goes back into the heart and is sent all around the body. The blood, think of it like the little trucks, goes around the body, it carries the oxygen and it drops it off and then it picks up all the waste materials, comes back into the heart where it's pumped into the lungs, it releases any waste materials such as carbon dioxide and is able to pick up new materials such as oxygen. So why did the numbers pick up just as we did the song? What was that all about? I guess people just love the song. Love the song. Did you get people to come on or something? I know that uh, Mrs. Galloway woke up randomly to hear me knocking at the window and scare you. She saw that. Oh, that was nice. Good old Mrs. Galloway. What are the numbers now? Nine. It was just really weird because we started singing a song and it went all the way up to 14. Wow. And then... That's the, that's the magic of our voices. Well, you finished the song and it just went all the way back down to where we were before. It was very odd. I wonder if some sort of algorithm was pushing it to be attracting us. Very weird. Who knows? We'll have to start another song at some point uh, and see if it increases the number of people listening. It's very unusual. Sure thing. I, I, I'm interested in the YouTube algorithm. It's interesting. You know. We've been, I've been playing with it a lot. Uh, I, what? Right, back to the circulatory system. So, yeah, pumping around, getting the oxygen going. So your blood also on its journey, it's oxygenated, it might go down around your gut, it's gonna pick up all of these uh, minerals, vitamins, uh, energy and things, send it around to the rest of your body, um, which is really good. Now, what have we done? We've done the digestive system, we've had a look at the heart and the circulatory system, we're trying to understand about our breathing. We've looked a little bit at the skeleton, We've looked a little bit at the skin. We've had a little chat about the brain and how the brain functions. We've looked at the eye. We haven't looked at the ear, although Mr. Keely knows a lot about the ear. So we might come on to that. You know a lot about the ear? The ear. 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 Fascinating. Now, there's also something that's going on, and you know what, I'm going to pop it down to the back because it's affecting me right now. Inside your body, a liquid, of course, is being extracted constantly, and it goes into these little things that are at the back. These are known as the kidneys. You have two of them. Uh, like a lot of things in your body, you can actually lose one and you can still function. Do you know what? Most of the things in your body can be replaced. Uh, as crazy as it sounds, there is one thing that cannot be replaced in your body. That is, of course, you, which is the brain. You can't be replaced because you are the brain. If the brain goes, you don't exist anymore. That bit is you. That is the one bit that needs to stay the same. Most other parts of your body, yeah, switch, switch them around, pop them on. You can take someone else's kidney. You can 
take other bits of other people's heart and all sorts of things and you'll be fine. Yeah, not as long as the blood matches and, and your body doesn't reject it, then that's fine. The brain, however, not to be taken by anybody else. That is vital because that part is you. So these little things down here at the back are known as the kidneys. Now they work really hard. What they do is the liquids that go into your body, um, they kind of extract uh, any remaining bad things um, and any waste products are then sort of popped into the kidney. It goes down into um, a sac down here uh, known as your bladder. And then obviously your bladder over time fills up. Your bladder will fill up with the liquid, the liquid obviously being urine. And then at some point you will need to excrete that urine. And so I'm going to be honest, that's kind of what I'm feeling I need to do right now. Are you okay? Just take over for a second. Sure, whilst I just pop to the toilet. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Hello, me again, taking over from Mr. Jordan. What fascinating things you've been learning about the human body, excreting urine. That was that was an interesting one. The bones, the brain, fabulous, fabulous stuff that I know very, 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 very little about. So let's answer the question instead. Uh, <laughs> We get off flagging here at 3.24. Tell you what, let's go back to a little bit of poetry. Let's go back to a little bit of tongue twister fun. I'm going to write up my favorite tongue twister using alliteration. Marvelous. Magic, most mysterious, make, make me make a monster into. Magnificent mustard using the alliteration the letter M, we can compose tongue twisters, which is one of my favorite types of poetry. I think you did that with Mr. Jordan a little while ago. I've done it here with marvelous magic, most mysterious, make, make me make a monster into magnificent mustard using the letter M. I'm just gonna get rid of Mr. Jordan's picture here so we have a little bit more space. We're gonna try and build a little bit of an operation over here using Mr. Jordan's model. So we are gonna build nouns, we are gonna build verbs. We're gonna build adverbs. And we are going to build adjectives. Before we do, give that one a go. See how fast you can say it. I'll see how fast I can say it as well. Marvelous magic, most mysterious name, and me make a monster into magnificent mustard. And we are going to collect our own using the poetry frame that Sir gave us before. Sorry, Sir, I didn't know much about the human body, certainly not as much as you. You do uh, some alliteration. So I was going to do some alliteration, yeah. Uh, since you're here, why don't you play along? See if we can build one together. I'd love to do that. Let's what give us a letter. Give us a letter. Uh, J. J. J for jumper. Jumper. That's the first noun. Well done, sir. Thank you very much. What other nouns can you think of, sir? Um Jack. That's a pronoun, sir. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Um Ju Jupiter, good one. Oh, that's a pronoun, isn't it? It's the name is it? of a place, I think. We don't have names for this one. Right. <laughs> Jelly. Level no, Jupiter. Jupiter's a fun one, though, isn't it? Jelly. Jelly. Um, jewels. Jewels. Um, gen. Good. And <laughs> verbs. Verbs. Jump. Jump. Jog. Jog. Uh, joust. Joust. 
join. Join, lovely. And adverbs? Uh, joyfully, perhaps? Joyfully. Joyously. Uh, uh, jealously. Yeah, jealously. Oh, it's a G, isn't it? No, it's not. Yeah, it's a J. Jealously. Um, and adjectives. Uh, jiggly. Jiggly, yeah. Uh, <laughs> J was such a bad choice. J was a bad letter. I like it. Uh, um, jiggly. Um, justifiably. Uh, so the jumpers on the jewels jump whilst jogging joyfully. They jiggle. Jiggly. They jiggle. <laughs> jiggly. We did excellent. Back to the body circle. Okay. <laughs> I love the alliteration game. Oh my goodness. The poems we made this morning were fantastic. I can't wait to re watch those videos so that I can see the poems that we made. We were starting, we actually used the letter R. I think we managed to do an eight-lined poem, constantly using alliteration. Um, I would like also, we were gonna, we, well, I'm looking forward to some of this work coming in. I'm gonna go and check the work now, just whilst you're on with me, and have a little look and see if any work has come in. Because we also had a little bit of a challenge for any children who could make an acrostic poem using uh, the entire alphabet. So what happens is for each line, you go for a new letter. And I was quite excited to see if anybody was able to um, produce uh, go for Y3, a poem using all of those features. I'm speaking a little bit slowly as it loads. Let me see. Do we have, I've got division with remainders. I've got, um, thank you, Miss. Waiting for Mr. Jordan's creepy school tour. What have we got? We've got something that has been sent in to us. <gasps> Sir, yeah. someone made a banana bread no with you. This is from Tasha and Harris. How are we going to, do you know what? I'll go and print this out. There we go. Look at this. Wow. Oh my goodness. It should be fabulous. Let me print that and I'll show everybody here on the live. Uh, I'll go and grab that for you, sir. You go and grab that. It's even got initials in it. I think J and K for Jordan and Keeling. <laughs> oh my goodness. Which did you print it to, sir? Junior. Junior. Uh, let's have a little look. We've got people asking for key. Have I got, um, oh, this is absolutely fantastic. People doing their recycling posters. Do you know what? You guys are just brilliant. Um, so I'm really excited to share. And we're definitely going to have to show this because that is fantastic. Someone has actually made banana bread. They followed Mr. Keeling's instructions and they have actually created something, which is very, very exciting. So I'm really looking forward to uh, having a look at that in a second. Um, I'm also, excuse me, I'm also looking forward to working out what is gonna happen next. Can't wait to find out what that's gonna be. It's something that I'm gonna do, because uh, Mr. Keeling was talking for a long time there with stories. So uh, what should we do, what should we do, what should we do? I think we'll have a look at Islam and Christianity. Yeah, that sounds like a good one. We've gone through pretty much all of the body, um, which I enjoyed greatly. It was absolutely fantastic. We learned all sorts of things about the skin, about the brain, about Print the brain. Has not come through, sir. Printing has not come through, sir. Let's go and just double check that I... Oh, it's because it's on this computer. I need to send it from mine. I haven't actually plugged my computer up to the printer. Oh, no, yeah, I'll load it on there. Yeah. Can you go to the year three mailbox? Yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah. No worries, sir. Um, and we've obviously looked at the digestive system, the circulatory system. We've looked at all sorts of fantastic things. Okay, I cleared off the board. That took me longer than I thought it was going to take. Right. So let's have a look. And religion. We were looking at our RE lesson earlier, and the two main Apologies, religions, sir. I do not have permission to access that mailbox. Uh, just next door, in the equivalent position, uh, my computer is all set up and ready to go. Um, we are looking at RE. We are going to look at the two. Well, not the, well. Yes, I guess in the world, these are two 
biggest religions. Not in Britain. Christianity is by far the biggest religion in Britain. And then the second uh, biggest belief system is actually no religion, which takes up you know, around 50%, especially among young people, actually. In young people, no religion is a real big proportion. So most young people in Britain don't associate with any kind of religion whatsoever. They don't consider themselves to be Christian or Muslim or Hindu or anything. They just get on with their life because uh, they don't believe in any religion. You don't have to have a religion, of course, if you don't want to, but you can if you choose to. You don't have to follow what your parents do. If you are, uh, you know, if your parents are doctors, you don't, you don't have to be a doctor. If you want to be an astronaut, you can go and be an astronaut. And so, what shall we start with? Well, let's start with Islam. So, we're going to have a little start look at Islam as a religion. And I'm just going to pop over here because I wrote down uh, a couple of things to help me along my way. Because, well, we know the main things with Islam. We know about the holy book being the Quran. We know about the God. They have one God called Allah. We know that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the messenger of God. Muhammad, who is the messenger of God, was raised in what is now modern day Saudi Arabia by Bedouin women. He is said to have not had um, an education and he uh, went to the mountains where the angel Jibril, who in the Christian and Jew the Jewish books is known as the angel Gabriel, came down to him and uh, he, uh, Muhammad had the word of God spoken through him and he was able to write the book, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Of course, Muhammad then became a, a great ruler and conquered and destroyed many lands um, and all sorts of things were written after the Quran known as the Hadiths. But let's have a little look at the five core tenets of Islam. Islam is built uh, upon these things we call the five pillars of Islam. Here it is. We've got this one, two, three, four, five pillars of Islam. And those five pillars, making sure that I don't want to misspell any of them. We've got um, Shahara. We've got uh, Salah. We've got... Uh, Zakat, we've got Ramadan, and we've got uh, Hajj. So, what all are all of these five pillars, these five core tenets of the religion? What is the fundamentals of Islam? Well, let's start with um, the Shahada. I'm just going to grab my uh, little piece of paper over here as well. Got all sorts of uh, pieces of paper with me. I'm going to just make sure because a little bit of me makes me worry that I've misspelt it. Um, I'm going to go and have a little look at it. Did you find it, sir? Just whilst I'm getting the right spelling. I did find it. Isn't this fantastic, everyone? Look at that. It's even got initials in the banana bread. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. It is 25 to 4. I can't remember what this is, but I know I know, I really like it. So thank you, Tasha and Harris, and thank you so much for your lovely message that yeah. came along with the email. It really, really is nice to receive those messages from, from parents, from people in our community, from staff. And while we're at it, something else that's very nice. At the moment, we have raised, drum roll, sir. <laughs> Four thousand two hundred and forty. Oh, four thousand two hundred and forty-six pound. That is at the start of this campaign. That was beyond our wildest dreams. You know, it is. It's an incredible amount of money. You know, with that, I think we can help almost all the parents that need our help in this in this community. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's really exciting. It's very exciting. <laughs> yeah. It's very good. Well done to you guys who have managed this. After you finish this, do you want to try the drama game, sir? Oh, yeah, please. And then I'm going to do a boring hour or so reading mental maths tests. That is so cool. Yeah. Can't wait for that. 
Okay, so we are on the five pillars of Islam. Okay, what have we got? We've got Shahada. I did miss an A. I was worried that I'd missed something and I had missed an A. Of course, as we all know, that Shahada is the declaration of faith. Okay, belief in one God. Okay, the declaration of faith that there is one God and his prophet is Muhammad, peace be upon him. To be a Muslim, this is one of the fundamental beliefs that you must have. It is a faith. Okay, faith is an important word because faith is when you believe in something that you cannot verifiably prove to be true. It is not possible to prove there is a God. You can't be done. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. You can't see it. There's no real evidence for it. So it's something that you have to feel and believe yourself. And we call this faith. Faith is when you can't prove it, but you still believe it. Okay? It is an opinion that people hold to be true. Okay? Not a definite verifiable fact. It's not like saying this is black. Yes, I can prove this is black. That makes that a fact. But it is a faith. It is an opinion of belief. And to be a true Muslim, you must have that faith that there is one God. His name is Allah. And you, there is uh, only one uh, prophet who is Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay. There are many uh, other prophets, sorry, but Muhammad is a direct prophet of God, peace be upon him, because there are prophets, there's prophet Isa, there's lots of different prophets um, all through the religion. Um, we're at our lowest uh, peak here, so uh, belief in one God. Okay, so we've got Shahada, belief in one God. Four. Four. Yeah. People are finally sleeping. Yeah, it's finally happening. Uh, so we've got that. Now we're down to um, Salah, which is the second of the pillars. Perfect for the uh, long mental massacre, really, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Which is uh, prayer. And in Islam, uh, prayer is a little bit different to what it might be in, in Christianity or another religion where it's up to you to choose to when to want to do it. But five times a day, okay? Prayer five times a day. Now, there are all sorts of uh, methods for prayer and, and psalm, and there is the cleaning, the washing, washing behind the ears, all parts of the body taking off of the shoes before prayer. Muslims pray on a prayer mat. The prayer mat is going to be facing towards the east. It is facing towards Mecca, which is the holy city. And all mosques are built facing towards Mecca. Um, there are There is the uh, where the imam would be standing, talking to you. Everybody would be facing towards Mecca. So prayer five times a day, very important thing. This can be the mosque, uh, of course, a uh, building that would look a bit like this. That would be a large minaret um, outside the mosque. And in here, the call to prayer would be sounded and people would praise and say, there is one God, Allah, and they would say that God is great. And um, so this is the second of our fundamental pillars of Islam. Let's move on to our next one. I like this one. It's a good one. Uh, it's a little bit like what you guys have all been doing recently, which is, what, how do I spell obligatory? Oblig obligatory. 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 Obligatory charity. Okay. I pop the word obligatory in there because it is something you must do to be a good Muslim. It is one of the five fundamental pillars of Islam. Okay. Zakat is so important. Giving a share of your wealth to go and help those who are in need. Everyone must protect the poor on the earth, must protect all of Allah's children. Um, and that is why Zakat is so important. We need to protect one another. We shouldn't just uh, be greedy with our wealth and save it all up for ourselves. We need to go around and share what little we can. And that is exactly what this community has been doing in just overwhelming numbers. We are so proud of you. There have been donations coming in all through the night. It is absolutely incredible. If I just gave you a little statistic of how much Zakat has been going on in a way, although obviously this is not the obligatory, this is just your charitable choice, um, then even within the last, 
I don't know how long. Let me just pop it up. I saw something that happened just quite recently. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. In the last 32 minutes, uh, another £45 has been donated by families in this school. And that is just in the last 32 minutes. Okay. Today, you can see a constantly updating list. That's from uh, a child who was in your class last year, Isa. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Musa was with me last year. So fantastic. Thank you so much, guys, for that donation. It really does make a big difference, and we really are grateful for it. So that is one of our other pillars. Then we have got, uh, and this is another one uh, that I like the reasons for, Ramadan, which is the fasting period, okay? There is a month in, in the year in which a true Muslim would fast, the reasons for this are multiple. Well, one of the reasons, and of course the fasting is only during uh, daylight hours, you can eat before when it's dark and you can eat after when it's dark, so it's not a, a full uh, fast, but it is a fast for a long day. I have done Ramadan for quite a, a few days and it is very hard. Nothing should pass your lips, okay? Not even drinking water through the day. It is a challenge, I can guarantee you that. It was not easy. Um, and it is about a few things. One, of course, is your dedication. It's showing focus. It's showing commitment that you can do such a thing to Allah. It's also um, showing a, a, a sense of understanding with those who are suffering, those who are poor, those who um, don't get to eat all the time. If you can go through this small little sacrifice, you might make yourself closer to those who are struggling on a daily basis. Um, so Ramadan, a really important part of any Muslim's life, and it really is a great way of connecting not only with the poor, but also of understanding your own self-discipline. Ramadan. Uh, what have we got next? We have got Hajj, or Hajj, uh, depending on how you pronounce it. And Hajj, or Hajj, is a pilgrimage. No idea if I spot that right. It's a pilgrimage. And what a pilgrimage is, is a religious journey, I guess, in many ways. It is when you go on a religious journey to a spiritual place. Now, many religions have forms of pilgrimages. In fact, not just religions have forms of pilgrimages, but people who follow all sorts of things. So, for example, if you are a fan of comic books, you might go to Comic Con um, every year, if you could do, going to Comic-Con is a bit like a pilgrimage. You set off on a great journey. You may have to pay all sorts of things. You may wear special costumes as you go off to Comic-Con. You get there and you are amongst your people, learning about your things, reading the scriptures, or the comics, and then you return back to your home. In many regards, that is like a pilgrimage of sorts. Well, Hajj is much the same. It is something that all good Muslims should do at one point in their life, obviously um, for illness and other reasons, then there are excuses. But Hajj is an absolute fantastic money maker for Saudi Arabia, that's for sure. But they bring, uh, they come into Mecca in Saudi Arabia um, and people will go and walk around the Kaaba. They will go and walk around. Uh, there is a very holy uh, rock in Mecca and people will circle this, they will go on a journey between Mecca and Medina, they will throw stones um, at uh, pillars. There are all sorts of uh, traditions and cultures that are associated with the uh, Hajj. Uh, people will wear white linen, um, like I say, a big money maker for Saudi Arabia, but also a very spiritual event and journey. Um, and one, uh to be made <laughs> sorry sorry serious um good that's the five pillars of islam um would you like me to do christianity now sir or would you well, like to do something else break, we do some drama together. should we do some drama together <laughs> oh that's great can i i'm gonna get a drink i'm a little bit thirsty fabulous i am gonna get up the drama so children yes children children children, children. While I get up the drama, uh, sir, do you want to set up the laptop in a position where we can both kind of be seated? I think this is kind of a, a, a seated, seated thing, thing where we can kind of act together, two chairs facing one. 
One another. Two cats facing one another. I'm sure there's a song in there somewhere. No, not all. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure it's not a... No, is it Sinatra, maybe? Sir, it's not a... Two songs. No? All right, I need to... Oh, she knows you have to put this on here. What are you? I don't have my general knowledge, Chris, yeah. Oh, I love a general knowledge, Chris. Am I getting involved in that? I do that. It's a Right, let's pop this down here. Um, I'm still a bit thirsty. Oops, you're just getting a shot of my uh, trousers there, which is not ideal. I'm going to let Mr. Keeling have the comfy chair. I think he <coughs> needs it more than me. Um, I think so. Well, this is exciting. It sure is. So, the, uh, the main thing that we're going to be doing in drama today is something called improv or improvisation. Basically, uh, <laughs> we are not going to have a script. Oh, uh, and we're going to play some games where we do some acting where we don't have a script. Now, the acting may be awful. The uh, dialogue may be awful as well. Uh, but like I say, it is, you know, 10 to 4 in the morning. Uh, we're both getting a little bit tired. So we'll just see what we can come up with. Uh, these games, we'll just demonstrate them so that you can kind of play them at home. They're a little bit of fun. You can play with your siblings, with your family. Um, so we'll go through them and we'll show you how to play. I'm going to get the first game up and I'll explain the rules. I'm excited. I'm very excited. Ooh, a game. About the time we have a game, something to keep so, the ticked over. game one is for questions only. It's just a door get close the door in case anyone hears this, right? Yeah, yeah, we don't want, to, don't want anyone to hear this. <laughs> Game one is called questions only. One person will start with a question. The next person has to act to that question with a question. You can only ask questions. It's complete improv. I will make up a question. Mr. Jordan will have to respond. You've got a link. Yeah, yeah, it has to, it has right. to kind of go together. Let's we'll see how this goes. Then. We'll see how it goes. Here we go. What are you doing here? What's it got to do with you? You know this is my home. Right? You know that I've been living here for a long time, right? How long? How long is long? How long is a piece of string? What is string? I think you know what string is, don't you? Are you trying to be facetious? Are you trying to present me with words that are too complex for my understanding, sir? You need to take a breath. Do you need to back off a little bit? Um, do you think these look nice on me? Okay, that's far too often. <laughs> <awesome. laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so Mr. Jordan lost that one. Okay, one. Mr. Jordan, do you want to start with your question? Oh, again, right. Mm. Um, what time is it? Uh, how would I know? Um, I, aren't you the person who taught the time lesson? Uh, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm a teacher at this school, who are you? I'm a teacher at this school, who are you? Aren't you repeating your questions now? Well, aren't you repeating your questions now? I would like to make a question by asking you what you're talking about. Do I know? What I'm talking about? <laughs> I pose to you that is a good question. Now I lost it again. Yeah, you lost it again. Lost you, it lose, again. you lose. You lose. 2-0. You lose. 2-0. All right, I'll start the question. <laughs> I don't know if I like this game. No, it's not that <laughs> fun, is it? <laughs> <laughs> How long, long did you expect? Doesn't, 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 doesn't have a long duration. No, it doesn't. It. It. The next game is even it's worse. It's really hard to extract humour from it. Yeah, the right. next game is worse. Great. Right. <clears throat> Where did all the cheese go? Have you eaten all of it again? I don't know. I'm pretty sleepy. That's not bad. <laughs> ah, yes! Oh, Finally! 2-1. Oh, no. Oh, no. Ah, I got a point. <laughs> you get that point. <laughs> they got one. Two one. All right, Two, your one. question. Um, how does this game really work? Uh, 
Well, you were the one who looked it up, weren't you? Um, I think you were the one who suggested it, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Seem to be getting pretty close to how I'm asking questions, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? I wasn't really laughing at anything, but you were, weren't you? Um, I'm not the one wearing orange shoes, am I? Uh, I wouldn't say they're orange, w would I? I... would you? I don't know, maybe I can ask you, are these orange... Uh, this isn't even drama, is it? <laughs> no, how is this drama? It's just, I mean, if it is creating questions, then yeah, it's all right. It's, it's all right for creating, creating questions. questions. Yeah. And then questions see question marks, yeah. don't they? And we could have written all these questions down. I'm going to skip game two. <laughs> game two, <laughs> What's game two? Come on. It was just, oh, it was just getting taller and smaller, and then you fall. <laughs> you, you make shapes. <laughs> I saw this one. You said it to me. I didn't understand it then. And I hadn't I've been awake. It's kind of like an essay. Right. We, we did so it when I was in well. secondary school. So you kind of make an S with your body. You go down, right, pause, up, and Wherever you say pause, yeah, you have to take on that character. So right. here, I would be. Oh, oh. Oh, I like it. I'll bend this up a little bit so I can see all the rest of it. This, I reckon we can stretch two minutes. Out. <laughs> two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Right. Two minutes. Start making the S, and I'll say I'll say pause at some point. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. Pause. <laughs> Look at this guy. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in terrible pain. Oh, no, no, no. no. I'm a house. Right, so good questions only. Well, I'm with that. That was a great question. <laughs> No, no, well, you're not sticking with that game. Right, this one is probably the most difficult to make. <laughs> that's a game you and your mates used to play in second. That's it, yeah. That's what you used to do. That's it, yeah. Wow. I think there was more meaning to it right then. <laughs> oh, great. I really enjoyed that. Good. <laughs> I don't know what's better, this or you doing letters. <laughs> Sounds. Sounds right, right? Yeah, okay. Right. right. This last game. We take it in turns to read a line. We have to make up the line. Yep. And each line has to follow on from the last. It has to make sense together. And it has to follow the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> it's not... Sorry. When you were stretching. <laughs> Getting ready to go back to this. Okay. So we're going to go through the alphabet A to Z. We're going to try to get right to Z. Right. Uh, building sentences. Easy. Okay. So I'll start. Okay. <laughs> Apricots are actually quite delicious because they're fruits. Of course they are. Everybody knows that. <laughs> D uh, comes out to I missed the letter, didn't you I? Did. Didn't you? Do you want to start off with A? Okay. Okay. We've got to get to Z, sir. Um, Ants crawl peculiarly slowly, don't they? But I <laughs> never really observed ants. Chance would be a fine thing. Definitely, I agree. Um, but at the same time, I'm not really that interested. Eating them doesn't help, <laughs> just to be clear. For what reason? Would I ever find myself consuming ants? Gosh, I can think of quite a lot of situations where you might eat an ant. Ha ha! I don't know what you're laughing at. Joyful as ever, mad desire. Kicking the can down the road, I think, would be a more realistic explanation. Let me regale you with the one thing that I do know about ants. My auntie tells me you know nothing about ants. Nothing! 
You say nothing, sir. I know one thing of Ant. Okay, okay. Didn't require a shout, did it? Probably not. You're right. Questioning these things is important. Right. Let's move on, shall we? Shall we? Sure. Totally. I agree with you there. Unbelievable how you acted cool just then. Uh, volume. It's all about volume. You lower the volume, it will go with you. Why is that? Xylophones are also a good way of grabbing people's attention. <laughs> yes, I know. Zebras are better. Let's talk about that in the events. Wow. Wow. We made it to the end. Was, I mean, I'm quite enjoying it. I would do that again. I would do that. I would do that again. Are we doing that again? I think we should do that, <laughs> that again. Again. Great. All right. Shall I start? Yeah. Start? yeah. <laughs> enjoy it. Oh, enjoy your time. It's almost four o'clock. That's five hours left. Five hours left. That's a lot of yeah, time. Hours. How long have we stretched it? I don't know. Five hours. <laughs> We do this for five hours. I think we could do some of this for some time. Some time to come. Right. Okay. Let's do it one more time. And then... Um, It'd be a nice thing to do at home with your parents, wouldn't it? Or with the carers or brother or sister. Yeah. <laughs> sister. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it challenges you to, you know, start. Why did you do <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> It you know it uh, it challenges you to start your sentences in different ways. <laughs> it does well with different letters, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good game. <laughs> right. Let's okay. Go. I think we've hit the wall yet. Oh no, no. no. Is that coming? Is that coming? Okay. Right. Um. A. Apples. No, I always start with fruit. Let's go with something else. A man of the world, I have travelled to many places. Birmingham seems to be the only place you've been. Uh, consider yourself proven wrong, sir. Here is a photograph of being in San Francisco. Dangerous. What you were doing there? Elegantly, I strolled down the uh, boardwalk. I took in the museums, the art, the air. And then I went along the Golden Gate Bridge where I spotted a solitary dove flying down from the sky, landing to peck, peck, peck at some castaway birds. Fancy boy. Were we on it? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. Goodness. <laughs> peck, I really don't believe your story. I wouldn't lie to such a good personal friend. Jealousy is not befitting of you. Kindly tell me, fine sir, why would I be jealous of thou? Lamenting the wonderful experience I had in Brighton, maybe the reason. Mm. No, no, no. Mind you, <laughs> Brighton is a fair city. Now, they do call it the San Francisco of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> It's all right. Uh, what were we at? Oh, 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 oh my. <laughs> Perhaps, Perhaps uh, a journey to Blackpool is in order. Queen lives there, right? Really, I'm not sure it's quite her cup of tea. Super. <laughs> totally. Uh, see you. <laughs> Umbrellas, probably best to take with us. Very, very wet over on the coast. Mm. Windy too. Exceedingly. No? Um, X-ray is needed if the night becomes too windy. You're probably right there. 
zealous gusts blew me away. Last time you were there? Last time I was there. You often frequent. I do often frequent Blackpool. 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 Okay. I'm not sure if that was there. Uh, what happened there? I don't I don't think that was anything. <laughs> no, I don't think that was anything. We just started talking to each other. Right. What's next? That's it. it was that it? That was it. <laughs> <laughs> That was drama, drama corner. Uh, that was fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just going to go to the metal mat test. <laughs> that was happening. That's what's happening. Yeah. That was metal test. Oh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how long it takes for one, and then times it by five. <laughs> okay, let's get an angle where I can sit here by the board. You can go through. No, 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 no. Don't leave. Don't leave the live stream. I know what have I done? What have you done? Cancel, cancel, cancel. Ah, we're still live. We're good. We're good. We're good. I didn't break it. Almost broke it. Didn't break it. Almost broke it. Yeah, almost broke it. Where did I put it? Imagine that. Nope. Oh, that's good. Ah, let's have a little look at the board. So exciting now. This is the moment we've all been waiting for after our little drama corner over there which was great um is we are doing the mental maths test oh yes it doesn't not just one not just one not just two not just two not just three not just three not four not just four not five. Not just five. Oh, yeah, five. five mental maths tests ranging from the lower two stage one all the way up to the year seven here we go Right, we'll sit this down here so we get an angle of the board like that. Okay, and here we go. Let's take that, something to wipe the board with. So we'll need that for some of the answers, just a bit of space to go through them. Yeah. Okay, so. As Mr. Jordan said, these mental maths tests, we're going to run them one after another. We might have a break in the middle, we'll see how we do. We're going to go one at a time, mental maths, and um, I'll give you a certain time in between each question to answer it, and then I will go through the answers at the end. So you'll need a pen and paper, or a pencil and paper. This one, designed for key stage one, can have a go, maybe year three. Um, Start with this one. This one's the easiest one, and just keep going until they don't, uh, until they're, they're they're too difficult. You're not you're not really getting any of them. So let's go through. These first questions I'll repeat twice. You'll have five seconds to answer. Thereabouts. I'm not going to time exactly. Number one. What is three added to one? What is three added to one? Number two, what is the number before 27? What is the number before 27? Number three, what is 10? Take away 10. What is 10? Take away 10. Number four, could you write the number 403? Write the number 403. Number five, what is 56 add nine? What is 56? Add nine. Okay, number six, what is the next number in this sequence? 26, 24, 22, 20. Mm, what comes next? 26, 24, 22, 20. Mm, what comes next? Number seven, find the difference between 17 and 10.
finding the difference between 17 and 10. Number eight, add 40 and 47. Add 40 and 47. Number nine, what number is missing? 81, 80, 78, 77. Number 10. What is the next even number after 40? What is the next even number after 40? Okay, we are going to go on to the 10 second questions now. I'm going to give you a little bit longer to work these ones out. Okay, I want you to look at this graph for me, please. Look at this graph. These children walk to school. These children arrive at school in the car. What I would like to know is how many more children walk to school than take a lift in a car? How many more children walk to school? Number 12, there are 12 biscuits on a plate the children eat five, how many are left? There are 12 biscuits on a plate, the children eat five, how many are left? Number 13. Name a seven-sided shape. Name a seven-sided shape. Number 14. Write two numbers that add together to make 41. Write two numbers that add together to make 41. Number 15. How much is four lots of 99p? How much is four lots of 99p? Having fun over there, sir. No, <laughs> really boring. Yeah. yeah. Number sixteen. <laughs> We've dipped to three viewers. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Number sixteen. What is the nearest ten to forty-six? What is the nearest 10 to 46? Number 17. Right, half past eight on the digital clock. Right, half past eight on the digital clock. What, to the computer? Yeah. yeah. You want to? Okay. No, I didn't. Number 18. Uh, 
Choose two of the coins that make 30p. Choose two of the coins that make 30p. Number 19. What is 500, add 60, add 7? What is 500, add 60, add 7? And finally, divide that shape into half. Okay, lots of fun there. We are going to go through the answers now. So, first one, I might use the board if I need to. Number one, what is three added to one? The answer was four. What is the number before 27? That was question two. The answer, 26. What is 10? Take away 10. Well, you're taking away everything, so you're left with nothing. The next one. It wanted you to write the number 403, so that should have been 403. What is 56 add 9? I'd do 56 add 10 and then take one away around and adjust. 56 add 9 is 65. What is the next number in this sequence? 26, 24, 22, 20. It's counting down in twos. So the next one is 18. 18 was the answer there. Find the difference between 17 and 10. Well, a find the difference question is a takeaway question. So you use 17, starting number, take away 10, the difference is seven. The answer to number seven was seven. Number eight, I asked you to add 40 and 47. 40 add 40 is 80, add seven is 87. Then I asked you what number was missing. I said 81, I said 80, I said 78, and I said 77. The number that I missed out that I didn't say was 79. What is the next even number after 40? Well, even numbers are in the two times table, so I just count two more. 40, 42 is the next even number. I told you to look at this graph. I want to know how many more children walked than drove in the car. 14 children walked, six went in the car. Find the difference. I take the six away from the 14, giving me eight. Eight children more, more children, eight more children. I said that there were 12 biscuits on a plate, five are eaten, that is 12, take away five, which leaves you with seven. Number 13, name a seven-sided shape. You should have gone with heptagon, although I would have accepted septagon. Right, two numbers that add together to make 41. Really, there isn't, uh, I mean, this, this could have been quite a lot of them, really. It could have been one and 40. It could have been 0 and 41, it could have been 2 and 39, it could have been 3 and 38, it could have been 4 and 37, and so on. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, how much is 4 lots of 99p? Well, I would add 4 pounds and take 4 pence away, giving me 3 pounds and 96 pence. 3 dot 96, 3 pound 96. What is the nearest 10 to 46? 6 is Closer to the next 10 up than the 10 below, so I'm rounding up. 46 becomes 50. 50 is the next 10. Is that me, sir? Yes. How's it, how's it going? Is it going great? Yeah. Swell. Uh, right, half past eight on the digital clock. Wonderful question. Uh, that should look <clears throat> like this. Thank you. 
or this. Either would be fine. Tick two coins that make 30p. Well, we have 20 and we have 10. 20 at 10, 30. Number 19, what is 500? Add 60, add seven. We just write it together, 567. That's the number, that's the answer. Finally, divide this shape into halves. You could go across here, across here, diagonally, diagonally. Either way, you are splitting it into two equal pieces. Well done if you got all those right. That is the first mental maths test. What do you think, sir? Are we going on to a second mental Not maths? With a story. Ten, but, I mean, there's five of them. Do you want to do a story in between each test? I mean, yeah. Okay. Let's do it. We'll take it like that then. Yeah. What's going to be the first story in between the tests? No, I didn't. The big ugly monster. Is it good? I don't know, sir. Oh, we're about to find out, aren't we? There we are then. New story. I'm going to start with a short one. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Right. I like this story. I think it is fantastic. And you know what? I'm not just going to read it. I'm actually going to be, I'm going to do this with each of these books, I think. I'm going to be like a bit like a teacher. And what I'm going to ask is, for those of you watching it back, I'm going to ask you to pause at certain points and to think about things. I might not do it so much with this one, but as we go through the other books, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just keep pausing occasionally, asking you uh, little questions about what is going on. So this book is called This is not my hat by John Classen. And one of the first things we like to do when we get a book is we look at the front cover and we start to make little predictions about it. Now, what sort of things can I see on here? Well, we've got a fish with a hat. The title is called This Is Not My Hat. I'm thinking already with my predicting head, I'm thinking, well, this is gonna be some sort of underwater um, adventure because we've got a fish here. So it's not going to be with humans. Um, this is not my hat. Mm, what am I thinking? Well, he's wearing a hat, but it's not his. So whoa, did he mistakenly pick it up? Um, does he not know where it's come from? All sorts of questions that I'm thinking to myself. We've got this here. What is this? The Library of Information Processing uh, Chapters Institute. So this doesn't look like it's relevant to the story. And I don't think this is, this is to do with the people who've made the book. So. Not a lot I can get from this. This is not my hat. Hmm, not quite sure. There's also this on the back of the book, which is, of course, the blurb. Now, on a blurb, it tells you a little bit about the book. And it's, it's a good idea to have a little read of the blurb before you pick up a book. Um, and it says, a fish has stolen a hat. Ah, that is why it's not his hat. It is something that he has thieved. And he'll probably get away with it. Probably. Hmm, interesting. That word probably is making me think that there is going to be some kind of dilemma. Something is going to go wrong in the story. There's also lots of little quotes on the back. It's nice to see quotes. It tells you how uh, people have reacted to, excuse me, to the story. And it seems like people like it. It lends itself to many retellings. The Irish Times, uh, glorious illustrations, the Daily Mail. And as funny as the minimalist as its predecessor, I want my hat back. I want my hat back. It's about there. I think. I think I've read it. So, first page. We are in the thick undergrowth. No words yet. All of these little things are little clues, and they are important. This hat is not mine. I just stole it. Ooh. What are we thinking about this fish? This is a fish who dares to steal hats. What are we? What is it telling me about him? I'm thinking he's not a very good fish. He's a naughty fish. These are the first things that are going through my head. I'm also immediately wondering to myself, where on earth has he stolen this hat from? I stole it from a big fish. He was asleep when I did it. Oh, no. 
I'm a bit worried because this fish does look really big compared to him. He looks like a tiny little fish in the sea. And that looks like one monster fish. Oh, I think our guy is going to be in a lot of trouble. And he probably won't wake up for a long time. Uh-oh. He seems to have woken up, doesn't he? And uh, even if he does wake up, <laughs> he probably won't notice that it's gone. Oh dear, our thieving naughty little fish is quite wrong about both of these things, isn't he? He thinks he's going to get away with this, doesn't he? But it looks to me like the fish, not only has he woken up, but he's realised straight away that the hat is missing. And even if he does notice that he's gone, he probably not know that it was me who took it. Uh-oh. Those eyes tell me that this fish is on a mission. He thinks he knows that something is going on, so he is focused, laser focused, on what he needs to do. And even if he does guess it was me, he won't know where I'm going. Uh-oh. There seems to be determination in this fish. But I will tell you where I am going. I am going where the plants grow big and tall and close together. It's very hard to see in there. Nobody will ever find me. There is somebody who has seen me, but he said he wouldn't tell anyone. He wouldn't tell anyone which way I went, would he? No. Yeah, this is a trusting fish. And he's a bit of a foolish fish, isn't he? Definitely a very foolish fish. So I am not worried about that. Oh dear. Doesn't seem that the friend that he met along the way is much of a friend after all, does it? Look, I, I know it's wrong to steal a hat, and I know it does not belong to me, but I'm going to keep it. I mean, it fits me just right, and it was way too small for him anyway. What a cheeky little fish this guy is, thinking that something that doesn't belong to him he can just keep. And look, ah, I made it where the plants are big and tall and close together. Uh, phew, I'm starting to think that actually maybe he's going to be okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to make it. Uh oh Nobody will find me here. I wonder what's happened because that is almost the end of our story. What do you think might have happened? Not a lot of words, but the pictures tell so much, don't they? The cheeky little fish doesn't know what trouble he has got himself into. And uh, things do not go the way he's planned them. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. Little story from me. Little mask quiz from Mr. Keeley. Are you ready yeah, for the next one? I'm ready. Ready for the next one. The slightly harder one. More year three, year four level. 
We'll go through these mental maths tests and these stories in between to break them up a little bit. And then I've got a little art lesson that we're going to do together afterwards. Uh, courtesy, actually, the idea from Mr. Singh, who, uh, when I was in with the key work children, showed me this art lesson. I'm going to do it in a slightly different way, um, but we'll have a look at that after. So we're going to go into this mental maths test. Get ready. The first 10 questions, again, you will have five seconds on. The second set of questions you will have 10 seconds on. Let me just make sure I've got a pen. It works, kind of. Okay. Right. Number one. What is one less than 17? What is one less than 17? Question two. How much is 10 pence and 50 pence? How much is 10 pence and 50 pence? Number three, what is double six? What is double six? Number four, there are 34 children in a class. Seven are away. How many are present? Number five, how many pounds equal 2,000 pence? How many pounds equal 2,000 pence? Number six. If one lorry has eight wheels, how many wheels do five lorries have altogether? Number seven. A boy is 106 centimeters tall. How tall is he in meters? A boy is 106 centimeters tall. How tall is he in meters? Number eight, write the next odd number after 201. Write the next odd number after 201. Number nine, what is the nearest 10 to 99? What is the nearest 10 to 99? And number 10, what is the next number in this pattern, please? 101, 202, 303, mm. 101, 202, 303, mm. <clears throat> Number 11. These are the 10 second questions. How many groups of six make 48? How many groups of six make 48? Number 12, how many halves equal three and a half? How many halves make three and a half? Number 13, there are 31 children in a class. If 14 are boys, how many are girls? Number 14, could you please draw two parallel lines? Please draw two parallel lines. Number 15, Joan has one pound, Ken has one pound 15. How much more does Ken have than Joan? How much more does Ken have than Joan? Number 16, what time does the clock say? Think about your time from earlier. Ooh. 
what time does the clock say? Number 17, how many do I add to 29 to make 66? How many do I add to 29 to make 66? Number 18, 643 is added to a number. The answer is 749. What is the original number? 643 is added to a number. The answer is 749. What was the original number? Number 19. If one egg weighs 50 grams, how much will 16 eggs weigh? If one egg weighs 50 grams, how much will 16 eggs weigh? And number 20. What is the perimeter of that shape? Okay, let's go through some answers. What is one less than 17? The answer is 16. How much is 10 pence and 50 pence? 50 add 10, 60. What is double six? Six add six, 12. There are 34 children in a class, seven are away. So that is 34, take away seven. There are 27 children present. How many pounds equal 2,000 pence? Well, every 100 pence is a pound. So the answer is 20 pounds. If one lorry has eight wheels, how many wheels do five lorries have altogether? That is five times eight, which is 40, 40 wheels. A boy is 106 centimeters tall. How tall is he in meters? That should be written as 1.06 meters. 1.06 meters. Write the next odd number after 201. The next odd number, two more outside of the two times table would be 203. 203 is the next odd number. Number nine, what is the nearest 10 to 99? Well, nine is very close to the next 10 up. You round up, it is 100. What's the next number in this pattern? 101, 202, 303. The next number would have been 404. Number 11, how many groups of six make 48? What do you have to multiply six by? To get 48, you have to multiply it by 8. 48 divided by 6, 8. How many halves equal 3 and a half? Half, 1, 1 and a half, 2, 2 and a half, 3, 3 and a half. You would need 7 halves to equal 3 and a half. There are 31 children in the class. If 14 are boys, how many are girls? 31, take away 14 you get 17 girls. I ask you to draw parallel lines. You draw me two lines with an equal gap between them, running in the same direction and never meeting. Joan has one pound, Ken has one pound 15. The difference there is obvious, it's the 15p, 15p. What time does the clock say? Let's count around 5, 10, 15, 20, 20 minutes. It is on the past side. The hour hand has gone past eight. So the time, 20 minutes past eight. How many do I add to 29 to make 66? Take 66. 
Take away 29, you're left with 37. 643 is added to a number, the answer is 749. What's the original number? We'll use the partitioning method, take the three away from the nine, you've got six, take the four away from the four, you've got zero, take the six away from the seven, you've got one, you've got 106, 106. If one egg weighs 50 grams, how much will 16 eggs weigh? 50 times 16, two fifties are 100, half of 16, eight, 800 grams. <laughs> Finally, perimeter, I asked you for the perimeter of this shape. These two opposite parallel sides are equal, so that would have been two, that would have been four, four add four, eight, two add two, four, four add eight, 12 centimeters. The perimeter of that shape is 12 centimeters. I'm gonna ask, hand you back over to Mr. Jordan for the next story. Story time. And for our next story, it is the Incredible Book Eating Boy. Written by Oliver Jeffers. Now, again, I might do a little bit of talking in between reading these books, not only for you to think about stuff, but any parents who are watching at home, maybe a system that they could uh, present. And we always start with the front cover, looking at it, okay? There is so much to be discussed in a front cover of any book. All these predictions, the incredible book eating boy. I wonder what it's about. Well, I guess a big clue is that it's probably about a boy who likes to eat books, I'm thinking, or whether, I don't know if he likes to eat books, but he can eat books. Well, anyway. who wouldn't like to eat books? Um, I've tried them, have you tried them? They're a bit wordy. Yes, book and chips. Well, yeah, book and chips does go quite nice, I've got to say. Book, chips and egg. And gravy. Book and gravy. Book and gravy is nice. Do you know most things are nice with gravy though? Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, so, it's probably about a boy eating books, and as Mr. Keeling says, who wouldn't want to eat a book, especially if you've got some gravy with it? Um, I, what was he in the picture? He does seem happy, he seems excited. I'll have a look at the blurb on the back. Disclaimer, do not eat this book at home. Now, this is an interesting blurb. It doesn't tell me a lot about it, does it? I quite like that. It gives me, it's quite exciting. It's a brave thing to do as well for a book, to not tell too much on the blurb, which makes me think that the author is confident of what they have produced, and I quite like it, I like it. It's an interesting way to do it. Oliver Jeffers. Let's a little look on the inside of the book cover. It's published by HarperCollins. Henry loved books, but not like you and I love books. No, not quite. I think we can predict what's gonna happen here. Henry loved to eat books. It all began quite by mistake. One afternoon when he wasn't paying attention, he wasn't sure at first, and well, he tried eating a single word. You know, just a test. Well, next uh, he tried a whole sentence and then it was a whole page and well, yes, Henry definitely liked them. By Wednesday he'd eaten a whole book. You know what it's like when you get the taste of something. You know what it's like, so don't you? A little bit of patience. I like books, yes, I like eating books. What? Pies. Oh, pies. We were talking about pies. Right. Pastry, before you know it, you've eaten a crumb, oh, and then you've just yeah, filled your face. You follow those crumbs to a book. The book has a picture of a pie on it. You eat the pie book, and then you're ravenous for more pie books. <laughs> yes, do. Yeah, it's true. That is basically Mr. Killing's weekend. Wow, here we are. It's the pie. You love pie. He loves pie. Here Happy we pie. Yeah, do you want to name a few more pies? Cream, uh, meat, steak, uh, kidney. What else? Uh, pie flavor. Good. Here we are at the theatre. <laughs> Here we are at the theatre, the incredible book, Eating Boy. It looks like this has been quite a success for him. 
And by the end of the month, he could eat a whole book in one go. Mr. King could do that with a plan. Henry loved eating all sorts of books. Storybooks, dictionaries, atlases, joke books, books of facts, even maths books. But red ones were his favourite. And he was going through them at a ferocious rate. Not stopping, is he, when it comes to eating books? But here is the best bit. The more he ate, the smarter he got. Information goes to brain, brain getting bigger, book goes in, belly gets full. My goodness, it seems that the books he is eating, he is absorbing the, the knowledge into his brain. He ate a book about the goldfish, and then he knew how to feed ginger. Before long, he could do his father's crosswords in the newspaper, and was even smarter than his teacher at school. But there he is doing a bit of a uh, rocket science. Henry loved being smart. He thought that if he kept going, he might even become the smartest person on earth. Wow, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? You okay, sir? Yes. So he kept eating books and he kept getting smarter and smarter and smarter. He went from eating books whole to eating them three or four at a time, books about everything. Henry wasn't fussy. He wanted to know it all. But then things started going not quite so well. I'm going to eat you. In fact, they started going very, very, very wrong. Henry was eating too many books and too quickly at that. Bite, chew, 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 gulp, green, greener, greenest. Blah! He was beginning to feel a little ill. But here's the worst bit. Everything he was learning was getting all mixed up in the old brain. He didn't have time to digest it properly. It became quite embarrassing for him to speak. <laughs> Suddenly, Henry didn't feel very smart at all. Miss, miss, I know, I know, I know, miss, 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 miss. Your head and belly can't cope. No more books for you. Besides, it means no one else could enjoy them. You owe a total of... More than one person told him he should stop eating books. So, Henry gave up eating books and sat sadly for a long time. What was he to do? Then, after a while, and almost by accident, Henry picked up a half-eaten book from the floor. But instead of putting it in his mouth, Henry opened it and began to read. And it was so good. Oh. Henry discovered that he loved to read and he thought that if he read enough, he might still become the smartest person on earth. It would just take a little bit longer. Now Henry reads all the time. Although every now and again, ugh, he's taking a bite out of our own book. Fantastic. What a lovely little book. The boy eating books initially to get absorb all the information, but after a while he ate too many books, he got greedy, and no longer could absorb the information through eating the books, so he had to start reading them instead. I'm sure there's some moral in there, I just don't know what it is. That's good. Okay, you, sir. bye. Time for some maths.
Hello and welcome back to the third mental math test. This one is aimed more at your four, your five kind of level. So I'm going to go through it. I'll read the questions twice and then I'll go through the answers. Here we go. What is the nearest 10 to 24? What is the nearest 10 to 24? Number two. What are two lots of nine? What are two lots of nine? Number three. How many 20 pence coins make two pounds. How many 20 pence coins makes two pounds? Number four, what is six multiplied by eight? What is six multiplied by eight? Number five, what is 276 to the nearest 100? Number six, add together nine, nine, and 16. Add together nine, nine, and 16. Number seven, round 18, Point six three to the nearest whole number. Number eight, what is 80 multiplied by 100? What is 80 multiplied by 100? Okay, this next set of questions you'll have slightly longer on. Number nine. A TV program starts at 6.45 and lasts for one and a half hours duration. At what time does it finish? A TV program starts at 6.45 and lasts for one and a half hours. At what time does it finish? Number 10. <clears throat> what number comes halfway between 172 and 188? What number comes halfway between 172 and 188? Number 11. I face north and turn 270 degrees clockwise. Which direction do I now face? I face north and turn 270 degrees clockwise. Which direction do I now face? Number 12. What is one quarter of 800? What is one quarter of 800? Number 13. What is 9,008 take away 3,992? What is 9,008 take away 3,992? Number 14. Add the vertices of a cuboid, triangular prism, and square-based pyramid. Add the vertices of a cuboid, a triangular prism, and a square-based pyramid. Number 15. What symbol could I insert 
in between those two equations, that would be true. What symbol could I insert between those two equations to make it true? Sam collects 20p coins. He has 400 coins. How much are they worth? Number 17, what is the mean of these three numbers? 50, 40, and 60. What is the mean of these three numbers? 50, 40, and 60. Number 18, if the ratio of girls, of boys to girls is two to one, and there are 16 girls, how many boys are there? If the ratio of boys to girls is two to one, and there are 16 girls, how many boys are there? Number 19. Look at the data. How much cooler was Wednesday than Monday? And number 20, if there are 200 green snooker balls, 100 yellow snooker balls, and 100 blue snooker balls in a bag. What is the probability of choosing blue? Okay, let's go through some answers. What is the nearest 10 to 24? The nearest 10 is 24 is closer to, uh, 24 is closer to 20 than it is to 30. What are two lots of nine? Two times nine is 18. How many 20 pence coins make two pound? 10 times 20p coins, you would have 10 20ps. What is six multiplied by eight? Six times eight is 48. What is 276 to the nearest 100? It's over 250, so you round up, it is 300. Add nine and nine and 16, the answer would be 34. Round 18.63 to the nearest whole number. Well, 0.63 is over 0.5. You would round up and the next whole number is 19. What is 80 multiplied by 100? Add two zeros, you get the answer 8,000. A TV program starts at 6.45 and lasts for an hour and a half. It finishes at 8.15. What number comes halfway between 172 and 188? The answer is 180. If I face north and I turn 270 degrees or three quarter turns, I would be north, east, south, west. I would be facing west. What is one quarter of 800? So I half it, for, uh, 400, I half it again, 200. What is 9,008? Take away 3,992. I would take away 4,000 and then add eight back on, giving me 5,016. Add the vertices of a cuboid, that's eight. The vertices of a triangular prism, six. And the vertices of a square-based pyramid, 
5, 8, add 6, 14, add 5, 19. The symbol missing from this equation to make it true is that that is greater slightly than that. Sam collects 20p coins. He has 400 coins. How much are they worth? It's 80 pound, 40 divided by the 20. Sorry, no, that's incorrect. Each one, each, each five coins make one pound. So you divide the four hundred coins by five giving you 80. What is the mean of these three numbers? So you add them together, 40, add 60, 100, add 50, 150, divided by how many numbers there are. There are three, that would give you 50. The mean is 50. If the ratio of boys is two to one, and there are 16 girls, how many boys? Two to one, you double it, double 16, 32 boys. Look at the chart, how much cooler is Wednesday than Monday? Find the difference, 18 take away 10, the difference is eight degrees Celsius. Eight degrees C. Finally, there are 200 green balls, 100 yellow balls, and 100 blue balls in a bag. That's 400 balls. So if you've got 400 balls, what is the chance of you pulling out a blue ball? Well, that's 100 out of 400. Or if we break that down to the simplest fraction, you've got a chance one in four. One in four of Paul pulling out one of those blue balls. That is the third mental maths test. Sir, do you have a third book that you, sir, you no, are looking very tired. How are you doing? I struggle. Should we have a little catch up? I'm gonna, yeah, let's have a little, I'll get a bean back here. I'm gonna just sit here for a second because I struggled through that, I'm not gonna lie. I found that, I found that, not that you, you were great. Um, uh, you were great. That was great. <laughs> great. I don't feel like I was great. It's very hard sitting doing nothing. Yeah. I'm Talking not feeling great. Right. I'm not feeling You're great. not feeling great. I'm not feeling like, I can see like our faces look different. Yeah. Since this morning, those lines have got more prominent. Yeah. You've got my more face is red. Bags. My yeah. eyes are red. Yeah. I find it hard just keeping my eyes open at the moment. I think, you know, children, if you're watching this at a later point, the key takeaway is, yes, we've done a fantastic thing, but do not stay up 24 hours. Stay up 24 hours. Also, we had 60 thumbs up earlier. Well, how has it gone down? It's gone before? down. We, we let the, we've let the teachers well, we slide. That happen? We were 60. We, 60, 62, it's gone down to 54. I didn't know people could take thumbs away. Yeah. But what's they've been given to us? They've just taken them away from us. That's... Because we've just we've just we've slumped, we've hit the wall. This is the wall. The wall has maybe come. Yeah, this is the wall. I got another. I got a. I got a good lesson on no any account in my bank. Okay, I'm gonna do art before that. You wanna do art before that? So we're gonna finish. We will finish this. I've got two more tests to do. You've got your books to read. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk seriously. What's gonna happen between seven and nine? Seven and nine. Yeah. Well, let's talk about now. Okay. This is probably going to take us till about half past five. Yeah. Once we've done this, I'm going to do a art lesson, which will be about 15 minutes. So I want to get involved long. with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can talk with that. Can I do an art lesson where I would draw a face? Okay. So you can do a follow on art. Yeah. That'll take us up to about six o'clock, maybe mm -hmm. just go. And then you said you've got a really good lesson on. I was thinking I'm going to just save that until later on, because what we're going to do in the last couple of hours. Well, I was going to do my quiz and my money lesson, and then we were oh, going to do the Ask lesson. Me Anything. I'll do the Christianity thing after that. So we'll do a bit of Christianity. Um, then we'll do the Ask Me Anything. And then what, when you, after, yeah. What time is your the radio thing? 6.30. 6.30, yeah. Are you taking that or am I taking that? Well, I'll take it, but then I think I'll want to speak to you as well, so we'll kind of have to We'll go into swap through, fine. Okay, cool. Cool. So around seven, I'll do my Nora and Yakan. Okay. Try and stretch that as long as possible. Yeah. And then we, um, well, we'll see what happens while we... All right. Well, I'll do my money lesson after that. Lesson. And the money, I'm excited about that. Um, and then we'll do the Ask Me Anything. Yeah. Um, I might do my quiz before that then, before the seven o'clock coin. Yeah. Okay, sir. It's time. It's time. You do your story. Yep. Two more mental maths, yep. two more stories. Brilliant. Art, art, two arts. Wow. Uh, then a bit of Christianity. Yep. Quiz. Yep. 
and then just whatever happens at seven o'clock. Have we done 20 hours? We've done 20 hours. Yeah, 20 hours, four hours. One, two, three, four hours to go. Okay. Wowzers. Wow. Okay. Um, this story is by Neil Gaiman. It's called Crazy Hair. And you know what? I'm going to have to do just one thing quickly. Okay. So it's called Crazy Hair by Neil Gaiman. And this is, um, we, we've seen him somewhere else, Wolf in the Walls, I think. Fantastic uh, author, really exciting stories. Now we have a single, looks like a raven of some sort. Crazy Hair. This is Bonnie. This is me. We were standing silently, she said. I don't mean to stare, mister. You've just got crazy hair. Crazy hair, oh me, oh my, crazy hair, I thought I'd die. I said, miss, how do you dare talk about my crazy hair? This hair, you know, is all my own. Since I was two, my hair was grown. Birds fly down from everywhere, nesting in my crazy hair. Butterflies and cockatoos, reds and yellows, greens and blues, make me look beyond compare, walking with my crazy hair. In my hair, gorillas leap, tigers stalk, and ground sloths sleep. Prides of lions make their lair somewhere in my crazy hair. Hunters send in expeditions, radio back their positions. Still, we've lost a dozen there, lost inside my crazy hair. You hear music, dancers too? I can hear them. Well, can you? They play tunes beyond compare, dancing through my crazy hair. Huge balloons come down to land. People wave, it's very grand. They take off from everywhere, drift across my crazy hair. There are pools and water slides, carousels and pony rides. All the fun of any fair waits inside my crazy hair. <laughs> Twisting, tangling, trails and loops, treasure chest and pirate sloops. These await the ones who dare navigate my crazy hair. Here's my comb, young Bonnie said. Run it now across your head. That's what I do with great care when I have such crazy hair. Child, are you mad? I cried. Combs and brushes have been tried. One was eaten by a bear prowling through my crazy hair. Bonnie said, you bend down here. I will comb it, is that clear? I said, miss, just be aware. This is really crazy hair. I bent down and Bonnie swiped, combed and curried, rubbed and wiped. Now, she said, you look, but there, came a rumbling from my hair. One huge growling head peered out, said, what is this all about? One huge arm reached out of there, pulled her into my crazy hair. Bonnie has the finest time teaching lions how to rhyme, riding slides and great balloons, finding hunters losing moons. 
Playing with the pretty birds, teaching parrots naughty words, sewing up the pirate's vest, digging buried treasure chests. Hibernating with the bear, dancing with the dancers there, happy as a millionaire, safe inside my crazy hair. Okay. A lovely story, another Neil Gaiman story. I do like them. I love them. I think they're fantastic. I don't I don't even know why I like them. Yeah, it's, it's adult stories as well. Like, I think it's Norse mythology. Yeah, really good. good. Yeah. American Gods, was that him as well? There's American Gods here. I think so. Wow. Wow. I love it. And he also wrote Good Omens. You know the one with... Uh, yeah. Uh, he did it with Terry Pratchett, I think. Right, mental maths test four, which is one less than the number of viewers that we have right now. <laughs> I do apologize. We will make it up in the last couple of hours. Right, uh, number one. Number one, this is aimed more for year six level. Um, write the next odd number after 63. Write the next odd number after 63. Number two. What is 70, take away 60. What is 70, take away 60. Uh, level, uh, year six, this one is. Yeah, but these are five seconds questions. There are 29 children in a class. Two are absent. How many are present? There are 29 children in a class. Two are absent. How many are present? Number four, what is double 46? What is double 46? Number five, what is the square root of 49? What is the square root of 49? Number six, what is 0 0.6 multiplied by 10? What is 0 0.6 multiplied by 10? Number seven, eight people share 24 pounds equally. How much do they each get? Number eight, what is 28 divided by seven? What is 28 divided by seven? Okay, going on to slightly longer questions now. The shop has a half price sale. Address was 125 pounds. How much does it cost now? The shop has a half price sale. Address was 125 pounds. How much does it cost now? Number 10, one eighth of a number is seven. What is the number? One eighth of a number is seven. What is the number? Number 11, which two numbers total 24? 19, six, eight, 14, 15. Which two numbers total 24? 19, 6, 8, 14, 5. Number 12, a TV program starts at 10 to 10. It lasts for 25 minutes. When does it finish? A TV program starts at 10 to 10. It lasts for 25 minutes. When does it finish? Number 13. Multiply 17 by 10 and then add 20. Multiply 17 by 10 and then add 20. Number 14, divide 100 by 10 and then add 28. Divide 100 by 10 and then add 28. Number 15, a bag of potatoes cost £1.50. How many bags can you buy with 10 pounds? Okay, slightly longer on these next few questions. What is the mode of these six numbers? 17, 27, 41, 41, 26, and 18. What is the mode of those numbers? 
Number 17, oh sorry, I'll give you just a bit longer. I'm not giving you enough time. Number 17, which two numbers are multiples of nine? 90, 66, 45, 82, and 73. 90, 66, 45, 82, and 73. Number 18, if Stuart saves £1.25 a week and he needs 11 99 to buy a shirt, how many weeks does he need to save for? If Stuart saves £1.25 a week and he needs £11.99 to buy a shirt, how many weeks does he need to save for? And number 19 is the last one on this test. Number 19, what number is exactly halfway between... 14.6 and 14.9. Right, let's do some answers. Number one, what is the next odd number after 63? Count two more, that is 65. What is 70 take away 60? You're left with 10. Seven tens take away six tens. There are 29 children in a class, two are away. How many are there? 29 take away two, you've got 27. Number four, what is double 46? 40 had 40, 80, six had six is 12. Add them together, you've got 92. Number five, what is the square root of 49? Well, seven times seven is 49, so the square root of 49 would be seven. What is 0 0.6 multiplied by 10? You just move them along one column, so you get six. Six is the answer. Eight people share four pounds, uh, eight people share 24 pounds equally. How much do they each get? They each get three pounds. Number eight, what is 28 divided by seven? The answer, four. <laughs> well, that's awfully nice of him, but I think, I think we're okay. At the, I'm okay at the moment. Number nine, a shop has a half price sale. A dress was £125. How much does it cost now? £62.50. Well done if you got that one, £62.50. Number 10, one eighth of a number is seven. What is the number? Reverse it, times it by eight, you get 56. Which two numbers? Total 24. That would have been 19 and five, total 24. <laughs> Number 12, a TV program starts at 10 to 10. It lasts for 25 minutes. When does it finish? It finishes at 10.15. Number 13, multiply 17 by 10 and then add 20. 17, multiply by 10, 170. Add 20, 890 is the answer. Divide 100 by 10 and then add 28. So I'll divide 100 by 10. I'll get 10. I'll add 28, 38. There we go. A bag of potatoes costs £1.50. How many bags can I buy? £1.50 out of £1.50. £3, £6, £9. I don't have enough for any more. I can buy six bags. What is the mode of these six numbers? The mode means the one that occurs the most. 17, 27, 41, 41, 26, and 18. So the answer is 41 because that occurs twice. Everything else occurs once. Number 17, which two numbers are multiples of nine? That would be 90, and that would be 45, which is half of 90. Number 18, if Stuart saves £1.25 a week and he needs 11 99 to buy a shirt, how many weeks does he need to save for? He needs to save for 10 weeks to have enough. And finally, number 19, what number is exactly halfway between 14.6 and 14.9? The answer there, 14.75. We have one more mental math test to do, and then we'll do some more. All right. It's time for Fright Club. And Mr. Keeling to go to the men's room. Oh, exciting. So, first story here by Ethan Long called Fright Club, published by Bloomsbury. What a story. Boing, 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 boing. 
It was the night before Halloween when Vladimir called one last Friday club meeting to go over Operation Kitty Scare. Quiet, everyone! Quiet! We have a lot to do! The three traits of highly successful monsters. One, ghoulish faces. Two, scary moves. Three, three, chilling sounds. Suddenly there was a <coughs> at the door. <sighs> Vladimir peered out of the peephole. Oh, look, an adorable little bunny. The bunny had no time for small talk. May I join the Fright Club? You? In Fright Club? That is such a cute idea. But I am afraid Flight Club is for monsters only. Now shoo! And the bunny hopped away. Vladimir got back to business. Now, where were we? Oh, yes. So who's been practicing their ghoulish faces? Oh, oh, me, 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 me. Uh, blah, 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 said Virginia. <laughs> said Sandy. Wowza, 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 said Fran. Vladimir just shook his head. <sighs> Those faces wouldn't scare a daddy long legs. Why haven't you been practicing? Uh, I've been practicing. Everyone gathered around in Mumford. One. A two, three, boop, boop, Then there was another at the door. What do you want? Uh, my name is Francis Fox, lawyer. My client states that you denied her inclusion into your so-called Fright Club. Yes, that is because Fright Club is for monsters only. Why? Because only monsters can be frightening? Of course! That is exactly why! Goodbye! <laughs> Slam. Hmm. Vladimir tried to refocus. Does anybody have any scary moves? The monsters definitely had some scary moves, but not in the way Vladimir had hoped. And the door. His man, boo, we can scare too. His man, boo, we can scare too. His man, boo, we can scare too. It seemed to be a mob that has appeared outside the door. Vladimir slammed the door behind him. Ooh, what are we going to do? Nothing. If you ignore cute little critters, they eventually go away. But the critters did not go away. <laughs> now, may I join uh, the Fry Club? Yeah, and me, me too, me, I want to join. Uh, yes. Turns out, not only monsters make ghoulish faces. Grr, grr, woo, scary moves. Woo, and chilling sounds. <laughs> and when it comes to scary. The more, the merrier. So, 
When Halloween arrived, Fright Club was ready. Vladimir was sure that Operation Kitty Scare wouldn't be just good. I can see, look now, planning and preparing. Oh, look at all this. I wonder what exciting things are going to happen. It would be scarily good. Woo! That was a book. I think I preferred the Neil Gaiman book, but that was all right. Not bad. Sir? I was working in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. For my monster from his lab began to rise, and suddenly, to my surprise, he did the mash. He did the monster mash. He did the mash. It was a graveyard smash. He did a bash. It caught on in a flash. He did a bash. He did the monster mash. From my laboratory in the castle east. To the master bedroom where the vampires feast. The ghouls all came from their humble abode. To catch a jolt from my electrode. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. He did the mash. It was a graveyard smash. It did a mash. It caught on in a flash. It did a mash. The mash. The monster mash. It did a mash. All right, we're going to do our last. We are going to do our last mental math test. This one uh, is a year seven one. But I thought, you know, give it a go anyway. Give it a go if you can. Uh, what is number one? What is the next prime number? after seven. What is the next prime number after seven? Number two, write one-fifth as a percentage. Write one-fifth as a percentage. Number three, what is three quarters as a percentage? What is three quarters as a percentage? Number four, Write the number 9,700,006. Write the number 9,700,006. Brilliant. I had a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, number five. What is 25 multiplied by 20? What is 25 multiplied by 20? Number six. If n is a number, write the expression for n times n. If x plus 7 equals 9, what is x? That's number 7. If x plus 7 equals 9, what is x? Number 8. Which two given numbers add together to make 3? 0 0.59, 1.68, 2.14, and 2.41. 2 which two given numbers add together to make three? 0 0.59, 1 0.68, 2.14, Number nine, add 23, 25, 26, 27, 24. Add 23, 25, 26, 27, and 24. Number 10, what is the product of 34 and 10. What is the product of 34 and 10? Right, number 11, uh, a little bit longer on these ones. 2.2 pounds make one kilogram. How many pounds are there in seven kilograms? So, sorry, 17 kilograms. 2.2 pounds make one kilogram. How many pounds are there in 17 kilograms? Number 12, give a positive number and a negative number with a difference of five. Give a positive and a negative number with a difference of five. Number 13, what time on the 12 hour clock is 21.41? What time on the 12 hour clock is 21.41? Number
Number 14, circle two given numbers that are multiples of three. 831, 726, 242, 487. Circle two numbers that are multiples of three. 831, 726, 242, 487. <laughs> Number 15, what is 890 milliliters in liters? What is 890 milliliters in liters? Number 16, if I think of a number and divide this number by two, then add 17 and finally take away five, the answer is 22. What is the number that I first thought of? If I think of a number and divide this number by two, then add 17 and finally take away five, the answer is 22. What is the number that I first thought of? Number 17, what is the mean of 4.3, 5.2, 5.7 and 5.2? Number 18, in a test, Gill scored 32 out of 50. What is this as a percentage? 32 out of 50, what is this as a percentage? Number 19, what is the total of 5.6, 7.5, negative 3.2, negative 3.9? And number 20, I eat 14 apples out of a possible 20. What percentage did I eat? Okay, let's go through some answers then. The next prime number, only divisible by itself, and one uh, after seven is 11. Uh, one fifth as a percentage is 20% and three quarters as a percentage is 75%. Write the number, have I got the pen, have I got the pen? Write the number 9,700,006, That is the number you should have written. If n is a number, write the expression for n times n, that is n squared. If x plus 7 is 9, what is x? Take away the 7 from the 9, you're left with 2. 2. x is 2. Which two given numbers add together to make 3? That is 0 0.59 and 2.41. Add 23, 25, 26, 27 and 24, you get 125. What is the product of 34 and 10, or product multiplication? 34 times 10, 340 is the product. 2.2 pounds makes one kilogram. How many pounds are there in 17? 17 times 2.2, you get 37.4. Give a positive and a negative number with a difference of five. So you could have had minus one and four, you could have a minus two and three, minus three and two, minus four and one. Uh, what time on the 12 hour clock is 2141? That would be 941 p.m. Circle two given numbers that are multiples of three, you should have, you should have written 831 and 726. What is 890 milliliters in liters? It's 0 0.89 liters. If I think of a number and divide this number by two, then add 17 and finally take away five, the answer is 22. Reverse that, 22, add five is 27. Take away the 17, gives you 10 times by two, gives you 20, the starting number was 20. What is the mean of 4.3, add 5.2, add 5.7, add 5. 
two, add them all together, divide them by four, you get the answer 5.1. Uh, in a test, Gil scored 32 out of 50. What is this as a percentage? Well, just double it up. Double 50, that's 100. Double 32, that's 64. 64%. What is the total of 5.6 at 7.5? First, you'd add those. Then you'd take away the negative numbers, 3.2 and 3.9, and it would leave you with 6. Finally, if I eat 14 apples out of a possible 20, what percentage did I eat? You ate 70% of those apples, 70%. Right, Mr. Jordan is going to read you one final book, and then we're gonna do a little bit of art, a little bit of art, a little bit of art. Right, well, for our final uh, story, before, uh, art lesson, which I'm very excited about, by the way. This is the face of pure excitement. We are going to read... Are we going to read A Way Back Home, or are we going to read The Big Ugly Monster? Let's have a go with The Big Ugly Monster. It's quite a big book. The Big Ugly Monster and The Little Stone Rabbit. Of course, there's all sorts of things to talk about from the front that I'm going to just... Crack on with this one. Once in a cave, there lived a big, ugly monster. Perhaps the ugliest monster in the whole wide world. This is the cave. And in this picture, the monster is just about to come out. So be careful when you turn the page, okay? Oh, there he is. Pretty ugly, eh? I mean, just look at those nostril hairs. Of course, this is only a picture, so you're not getting the whole effect. I mean, you're not getting the ugliness at full strength. It was pretty powerful. He was so ugly, right, that all the animals and birds ran and flew away as soon as they saw him. He was so ugly, yeah, that all the flowers dropped their petals and the trees shed their leaves. And even the grass turned brown and withered and died. It's not good, is it? Get this, he was so ugly, right? That if he looked up at the blue sky on a sunny day, it would most likely turn gray and pour with rain or even snow. He was so ugly that if he stepped into the pond for a swim, it would instantly dry up with a hiss of steam. That is how ugly he was. Yeah, getting it. All around the monster's cave, there was not a single living thing. It was such a sad and desolate place. And you know, the monster was sad and desolate too. I mean, for though he was horrible and ugly, and don't get me wrong, he was, on the outside, he wasn't on the inside. On the inside, he was lonely. He just wanted someone to talk to. But there was no one. And so he talked to the rocks. And one day, he had an idea. They began to make stone animals from the rocks. They made a fox and a badger and a deer and a bear and a tortoise and a rabbit. They weren't very good. I mean, at least the heads weren't very good. The monster had never seen much of a real animal's head. <laughs> the back ends were better. That was the bit he usually saw as the animals ran away. When he had finished, the monster was pleased with all of his stone animals and uh, he smiled. Unfortunately, the monster was so ugly that when he smiled, the stone animals cracked and shattered and he was left with a pile of rubble. All except for one animal, that is. The stone rabbit did not crack. Perhaps the rock was stronger, I, I don't know why, but you know, the stone rabbit did not crack. The rabbit. Even when the monster gave in an extra big smile, just to sort of test it out, the stone rabbit did not crack. So the monster talked to the stone rabbit and uh, though the rabbit didn't have much to say, <laughs> he's made of stone, uh, the monster was happy. Look at him. 
The monster sang to the stone rabbit, and when he sang, rocks would shatter and split for miles around, as you can imagine. And though the rabbit never joined in, not even for the chorus, still, the monster was happy. Look at him. Sometimes, on nights when the moon was full, the monster danced, and when he danced, the ground shook like an earthquake, and great cracks split the land, and the moon dashed away and hid behind the clouds. <laughs> and though the rabbit never joined in, not even to tap his foot, the monster was happy nonetheless. Sometimes the monster did tricks. Well, you see, what he'd do is he'd stand on one hand and juggled and did cartwheels and somersaults. And when he did his tricks, lightning flashed, thunder cracked and wind howled. I mean, like a tornado. And then the rain lashed down. And though the rabbit never joined in, unless you count playing statues, then, well, the monster was happy, nevertheless. Years and years passed by. And the monster talked and sang and danced and did his tricks, but sometimes they both just sat and watched the storms roll by. And though the monster got older and older and uglier and uglier and his hair turned grey and his teeth fell out, the stone rabbit never changed at all. A time came when the monster was so old he could no longer sing or dance or do tricks. He could still play drafts, however, and uh, though the stone rabbit was a poor player, even when the monster suggested some very clever moves, he was happy, nonetheless. But one day, well, you see, the monster, he never came out of his cave, and the stone rabbit, well, he sat alone. That very day, the sun came out, the green grass began to grow. Soon the flowers bloomed and the vines scrambled over the rocks. Well, they hung down over the mouth of the cave. Trees grew up straight and tall and all the animals and birds came back. It was a beautiful place now, to be honest. Perhaps the most beautiful place in the whole world. People would go there for picnics and admire the views and though they never took much notice of the stone rabbit, they sometimes wondered how he got there. Oh, that's quite a nice one. Poignant. Poignant. I liked that one. That was maybe my favourite. I didn't even know what that was going to be about. So should we do some art? It's our time! Okay, bring the laptop to this table Ooh. and see what angle we can get on this art. What will Very look exciting. The best. What will look the best? Let's go. What are we doing? Wrangling like this, are we? Uh, yeah, so we can see. Uh, no, no, it needs to be on the table oh. so I can see the art. Oh.